Chapter One of the Mayor of Casterbridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. Chapter One. One evening of late summer, before the nineteenth century had reached one third of its span, a young man and woman, the latter carrying a child, were approaching the large village of Waden Priors in Upper Wessex on foot. They were plainly but not ill-clad, though the thick hoar of dust which had accumulated on their shoes and garments from an obviously long journey lent a disadvantageous shabbiness to their appearance just now. The man was of fine figure, swarthy and stern in aspect and he showed in profile a facial angle so slightly inclined as to be almost perpendicular. He wore a short jacket of brown corduroy, newer than the remainder of his suit, which was a fustian waistcoat with white horn buttons, breeches of the same, tanned leggings, and a straw hat overlaid with black glazed canvas. At his back he carried by a looped strap a rush basket, from which protruded at one end the crutch of a hay-knife, a wimble for hay-bonds being also visible in the aperture. His measured springless walk was the walk of the skilled countryman as distinct from the desultory shamble of the general labourer, while in the turn and plant of each foot there was, further, a dogged and cynical indifference personal to himself showing its presence even in the regularly interchanging fustian folds now in the left leg now in the right as he paced along what was really peculiar however in this couple's progress and would have attracted the attention of any casual observer otherwise disposed to overlook them was the perfect silence they preserved they walked side by side in such a way as to suggest afar off the low easy confidential chat of people full of reciprocity but on closer view it could be discerned that the man was reading or pretending to read a ballad sheet which he kept before his eyes with some difficulty by the hand that was passed through the basket strap whether this apparent cause were the real cause or whether it were an assumed one to escape an intercourse that would have been irksome to him nobody but himself could have said precisely but his taciturnity was unbroken and the woman enjoyed no society whatever from his presence virtually she walked the highway alone save for the child she bore sometimes the man's bent elbow almost touched her shoulder for she kept as close to his side as was possible without actual contact but she seemed to have no idea of taking his arm nor he of offering it and far from exhibiting surprise at his ignoring silence she appeared to receive it as a natural thing if any word at all were uttered by the little group it was an occasional whisper of the woman to the child a tiny girl in short clothes and blue boots of knitted yarn and the murmured babble of the child in reply the chief almost the only attraction of the young woman's face was its mobility when she looked down sideways to the girl she became pretty and even handsome particularly that in the action her features caught slantwise the rays of the strongly colored sun which made transparencies of her eyelids and nostrils and set fire on her lips when she plodded on in the shade of the hedge silently thinking she had the hard half apathetic expression of one who deems anything possible at the hands of time and chance except perhaps fair play the first phase was the work of nature the second probably of civilization that the man and woman were husband and wife and the parents of the girl in arms there could be little doubt no other than such relationship would have accounted for the atmosphere of stale familiarity which the trio carried along with them like a nimbus as they moved down the road the wife mostly kept her eyes fixed ahead though with little interest 
the scene for that matter being one that might have been matched at almost any spot in any county in england at this time of the year a road neither straight nor crooked neither level nor hilly bordered by hedges trees and other vegetation which had entered the blackened green stage of colour that the doomed leaves pass through on their way to dingy and yellow and red the grassy margin of the bank and the nearest hedgerow boughs were powdered by the dust that had been stirred over them by hasty vehicles the same dust as it lay on the road deadening their footfalls like a carpet and this with the aforesaid total absence of conversation allowed every extraneous sound to be heard for a long time there was none beyond the voice of a weak bird singing a trite old evening song that might doubtless have been heard on the hill at the same hour and with the self-same trills quavers and breves at any sunset of that season for centuries untold but as they approached the village sundry distant shouts and rattles reached their ears from some elevated spot in that direction as yet screened from view by foliage when the outlying houses of waden priors could just be described the family group was met by a turnip hoer with his hoe on his shoulder and his dinner bag suspended from it the reader promptly glanced up any trade doing here he asked phlegmatically designating the village in his van by a wave of the broadsheet and thinking the laborer did not understand him he added anything in the hay trussing line the turnip hoer had already begun shaking his head why save the man what wisdom's in him that a come to wait in for a job of that sort this time of year then is there any house to let a little small new cottage just to build it or such like asked the other the pessimist still maintained a negative pullin down is more than nature a waden there were five houses cleared away last year and three this and the volk nowhere to go no not so much as a thatched hurdle that's the way a waden priors the hay trusser which he obviously was nodded with some superciliousness looking towards the village he continued there is something going on here however is there not ay tis fair day though what you hear now is little more than the clatter and scurry o getting away the money o children and fools for the real business is done earlier than this i've been workin within sound o it all day but i didn't go up not i twas no business o mine the trusser and his family proceeded on their way and soon entered the fair field which showed standing places and pens where many hundreds of horses and sheep had been exhibited and sold in the forenoon but were now in great part taken away at present as their informant had observed but little real business remained on hand the chief being the sale by auction of a few inferior animals that could not otherwise be disposed of and had been absolutely refused by the better class of traders who came and went early yet the crowd was denser now than during the morning hours the frivolous contingent of visitors including journeymen out for a holiday a stray soldier or two come on furlough village shopkeepers and the like having latterly flocked in persons whose activities found a congenial field among the peep shows toy stands waxworks inspired monsters disinterested medical men who travelled for the public good thimble riggers knick-knack vendors and readers of fate neither of our pedestrians had much heart for these things and they looked around for a refreshment tent among the many which dotted the town two which stood nearest to them in the ochreous haze of expiring sunlight seemed almost equally inviting one was formed of new milk-hued canvas and bore red flags on its summit it announced good home-brewed beer ale and cider the other was less new a little iron stove-pipe came out of it at the back and in front appeared the placard good firmity sold here the man mentally weighed the two inscriptions and inclined to the former tent no no the other one said the woman 
i always like firmity and so does elizabeth jane and so will you it is nourishing after a long hard day i've never tasted it said the man however he gave way to her representations and they entered the firmity booth forthwith a rather numerous company appeared within seated at the long narrow tables that ran down the tent on each side at the upper end stood a stove containing a charcoal fire over which hung a large three-legged crock sufficiently polished round the rim to show that it was made of bell metal a haggish creature of about fifty presided in a white apron which as it threw an air of respectability over her as far as it extended was made so wide as to reach nearly round her waist she slowly stirred the contents of the pot the dull scrape of her large spoon was audible throughout the tent as she thus kept from burning the mixture of corn in the grain flour milk raisins currants and what not that composed the antiquated slop in which she dealt vessels holding the separate ingredients stood on a white clothed table of boards and trestles close by the young man and woman ordered a basin each of the mixture steaming hot and sat down to consume it at leisure this was very well so far for firmity as the woman had said was nourishing and as proper a food as could be obtained within the four seas though to those not accustomed to it the grains of wheat swollen as large as lemon pips which floated on its surface might have a deterrent effect at first but there was more in that tent than met the cursory glance and the man with the instinct of a perverse character scented it quickly after a mincing attack on his bowl he watched the hag's proceedings from the corner of his eye and saw the game she played he winked to her and passed up his basin in reply to her nod when she took a bottle from under the table slyly measured out a quantity of its contents and tipped the same into the man's firmity the liquor poured in was rum the man as slyly sent back money in payment he found the concoction thus strongly laced much more to his satisfaction than it had been in its natural state his wife had observed the proceeding with much uneasiness but he persuaded her to have hers laced also and she agreed to a milder allowance after some misgiving the man finished his basin and called for another the rum being signalled for in yet stronger proportion the effect of it was soon apparent in his manner and his wife but too sadly perceived that in strenuously steering off the rocks of the licensed liquor tent she had only got into maelstrom depths here amongst the smugglers the child began to prattle impatiently and the wife more than once said to her husband michael how about our lodging you know we may have trouble in getting it if we don't go soon but he turned a deaf ear to those bird-like chirpings he talked loud to the company the child's black eyes after slow round ruminating gazes at the candles when they were lighted fell together then they opened then shut again and she slept at the end of the first basin the man had risen to serenity at the second he was jovial at the third argumentative at the fourth the quality signified by the shape of his face the occasional clench of his mouth and the fiery spark of his dark eye began to tell in his conduct he was overbearing even brilliantly quarrelsome the conversation took a high turn as it often does on such occasions the ruin of good men by bad wives and more particularly the frustration of many a promising youth's high aims and hopes and the extinction of his energies by an early imprudent marriage was the theme i did for myself that way thoroughly said the trusser with a contemplative bitterness that was well-nigh resentful i married at eighteen like the fool that i was and this is the consequence of it he pointed at himself and family with a wave of the hand 
intended to bring out the penuriousness of the exhibition the young woman his wife who seemed accustomed to such remarks acted as if she did not hear them and continued her intermittent private words of tender trifles to the sleeping and waking child who was just big enough to be placed for a moment on the bench beside her when she wished to ease her arms the man continued i haven't more than fifteen shillings in the world and yet i am a good experienced hand in my line i'd challenge england to beat me in the fodder business and if i were a free man again i'd be worth a thousand pound before i'd done it but a fellow never knows these little things till all chance of acting upon em is past the auctioneer selling the old horses in the field outside could be heard saying now this is the last lot now who'll take the last lot for a song shall i say forty shillings tis a very promising brood mare a trifle over five years old and nothing the matter with the hoss at all except that she's a little holler in the back and had her left eye knocked out by the kick of another her own sister coming along the road for my part i don't see why men who have got wives and don't want em shouldn't get rid of em as these gypsy fellows do their old horses said the man in the tent why shouldn't they put em up and sell em by auction to men who are in need of such articles hey why begad i'd sell mine this minute if anybody would buy her there's them that would do that some of the guests replied looking at the woman who was by no means ill-favoured true said a smoking gentleman whose coat had the fine polish about the collar elbows seams and shoulder blades that long-continued friction with grimy surfaces will produce and which is usually more desired on furniture than on clothes from his appearance he had possibly been in former time groom or coachman to some neighbouring county family i've had my breedings in as good circles i may say as any man he added and i know true cultivation or nobody do and i can declare she's got it in the bone mind ye i say as much as any female in the fair though it may want a little bringing out then crossing his legs he resumed his pipe with a nicely adjusted gaze at a point in the air the fuddled young husband stared for a few seconds at this unexpected praise of his wife half in doubt of the wisdom of his own attitude towards the possessor of such qualities but he speedily lapsed into his former conviction and said harshly well then now is your chance i am open to an offer for this gemma creation she turned to her husband and murmured michael you have talked this nonsense in public places before a joke is a joke but you may make it once too often mind i know i've said it before i meant it all i want is a buyer at the moment a swallow one among the last of the season which had by chance found its way through an opening into the upper part of the tent flew to and fro in quick curves above their heads causing all eyes to follow it absently in watching the bird till it made its escape the assembled company neglected to respond to the workman's offer and the subject dropped but a quarter of an hour later the man who had gone on lacing his firmity more and more heavily though he was either so strong-minded or such an intrepid toper that he still appeared fairly sober recurred to the old strain as in a musical fantasy the instrument fetches up the original theme here i am waiting to know about this offer of mine the woman is no good to me who will have her the company had by this time decidedly degenerated and the renewed inquiry was received with a laugh of appreciation the woman whispered she was imploring and anxious come come it is getting dark and this nonsense won't do if you don't come along i shall go without you come she waited and waited yet he did not move in ten minutes the man broke in upon the desultory conversation of the furmity drinkers with i asked this question and nobody answered to it will any jack rag or tom straw among ye buy my goods the woman's manner changed and her face assumed the grim shape and colour of which mention has been made mike mike she said this is getting serious oh too serious 
"'Will anybody buy her?' said the man. "'I wish somebody would,' said she firmly. "'Her present owner is not at all to her liking.' "'Nor you to mine,' said he. "'So we are agreed about that. "'Gentlemen, you hear? "'It's an agreement to part. "'She shall take the girl if she wants to and go her ways. "'I'll take my tools and go my ways. "'Tis simple as scripture history. "'Now then, stand up, Susan, and show yourself.' "'Don't, my child,' whispered a buxom stay-lace dealer in voluminous petticoats, who sat near the woman. "'Your good man don't know what he's saying.' The woman, however, did stand up. "'Now, who's auctioneer?' cried the hay-tresser. "'I be,' promptly answered a short man, with a nose resembling a copper knob, a damp voice, and eyes like buttonholes. "'Who'll make an offer for this lady?' The woman looked on the ground as if she maintained her position by a supreme effort of will. Five shillings,' said someone, at which there was a laugh. "'No insults,' said the husband. "'Who'll say a guinea?' Nobody answered, and the female dealer in stay-laces interposed. "'Behave yourself, moral good man, for heaven's love. Ah, what a cruelty is the poor soul married to!' Bed and board is dear at some figures, pawn my vation tis. Set it higher, auctioneer, said the trusser. Two guineas, said the auctioneer, and no one replied. If they don't take her for that, in ten seconds they'll have to give more, said the husband. Very well. Now, auctioneer, add another. Three guineas, going for three guineas, said the roomy man. No bid, said the husband. "'Good Lord, why, she's cost me fifty times the money, if a penny. Go on.' Four guineas,' cried the auctioneer. "'I'll tell you what, I won't sell her for less than five, said the husband, bringing down his fist so that the basins danced. "'I'll sell her for five guineas to any man that will pay me the money and treat her well, and he shall have her for ever, and never hear aught of me. But she shan't go for less. Now then, five guineas, and she's yours.' "'Susan, you agree?' She bowed her head with absolute indifference. Five guineas,' said the auctioneer, "'or she'll be withdrawn. "'Do anybody give it? "'The last time. "'Yes or no?' "'Yes,' said a loud voice from the doorway. All eyes were turned. Standing in the triangular opening which formed the door of the tent was a sailor, who, unobserved by the rest, had arrived there within the last two or three minutes. A dead silence followed his affirmation. "'You say you do?' asked the husband, staring at him. "'I say so,' replied the sailor. "'Saying is one thing, and paying is another. Where's the money?' The sailor hesitated a moment, looked anew at the woman, came in, unfolded five crisp pieces of paper and threw them down upon the tablecloth. They were Bank of England notes for five pounds. Upon the face of this he clinked down the shillings severally. One, two, three, four, five. The sight of real money in full amount, in answer to a challenge for the same, till then deemed slightly hypothetical, had a great effect upon the spectators. Their eyes became riveted upon the faces of the chief actors, and then upon the notes as they lay, weighted by the shillings, on the table. Up to this moment it could not positively have been asserted that the man, in spite of his tantalizing declaration, was really in earnest. The spectators had indeed taken the proceedings throughout as a piece of mirthful irony carried to extremes and had assumed that, being out of work, he was, as a consequence, out of temper with the world and society and his nearest kin. But, with the demand and response of real cash, the jovial frivolity of the scene departed. A lurid color seemed to fill the tent and change the aspect of all therein. The mirth wrinkles left the listeners' faces, and they waited with parting lips. Now, said the woman, breaking the silence so that her low, dry voice sounded quite loud, before you go further, Michael, listen to me. If you touch that money, I and this girl go with the man. Mind, it is a joke no longer. A joke? 
of course it is not a joke shouted her husband his resentment rising at her suggestion i take the money the sailor takes you that's plain enough it has been done elsewhere and why not here tis quite on the understanding that the young woman is willing said the sailor blandly i wouldn't hurt her feelings for the world faith nor i said her husband but she is willing provided she can have the child she said so only the other day when i talked of it that you swear said the sailor to her i do said she after glancing at her husband's face and seeing no repentance there very well she shall have the child and the bargain's complete said the trusser he took the sailor's notes and deliberately folded them and put them with the shillings in a high remote pocket with an air of finality the sailor looked at the woman and smiled come along he said kindly the little one too the more the merrier she paused for an instant with a close glance at him then dropping her eyes again and saying nothing she took up the child and followed him as he made towards the door on reaching it she turned and pulling off her wedding ring flung it across the booth in the hay trusser's face mike she said i've lived with thee a couple of years and had nothing but temper now i'm no more to ee i'll try my luck elsewhere twill be better for me and elizabeth jane both so good-bye seizing the sailor's arm with her right hand and mounting the little girl on her left she went out of the tent sobbing bitterly a stolid look of concern filled the husband's face as if after all he had not quite anticipated this ending and some of the guests laughed is she gone he said faith ay she's gone clean enough said some rustics near the door he rose and walked to the entrance with the careful tread of one conscious of his alcoholic load some others followed and they stood looking into the twilight the difference between the peacefulness of inferior nature and the wilful hostilities of mankind was very apparent at this place in contrast with the harshness of the act just ended within the tent was the sight of several horses crossing their necks and rubbing each other lovingly as they waited in patience to be harnessed for the homeward journey outside the fair in the valleys and woods all was quiet the sun had recently set and the west heaven was hung with rosy cloud which seemed permanent yet slowly changed to watch it was like looking at some grand feat of stagery from a darkened auditorium in presence of this scene after the other there was a natural instinct to abjure man as the blot on an otherwise kindly universe till it was remembered that all terrestrial conditions were intermittent and that mankind might some night be innocently sleeping when these quiet objects were raging loud where do the sailor live asked a spectator when they had vainly gazed around god knows that replied the man who had seen high life he's without doubt a stranger here he came in about five minutes ago said the furmity woman joining the rest with her hands on her hips and then he stepped back and then he looked in again i'm not a penny the better for him serves the husband well be right said the stale fender a comely respectable body like her what can a man want more i glory in the woman's spirit i'd ha done it myself Odd oh, send if i wouldn't if a husband had behaved so to me i'd go and he might call and call till his keycorn was raw but i'd never come back no not till the great trumpet would i well the woman will be better off said another of a more deliberative turn for seafaring natures be very good shelter for shorn lambs and the man do seem to have plenty of money which is what she's not been used to lately by all showings mark me i'll not go after her said the trusser returning doggedly to his seat let her go if she's up to such vagaries she must suffer for em she'd no business to take the maid tis my maid and if it were the doing again she wouldn't have her perhaps from some little sense of having countenanced an indefensible proceeding perhaps because it was late 
the customers thinned away from the tent shortly after this episode the man stretched his elbows forward on the table leant his face upon his arms and soon began to snore the furmity seller decided to close for the night and after seeing the rum bottles milk corn raisins etc that remained on hand loaded into the cart came to where the man reclined she shook him but could not wake him as the tent was not to be struck that night the fair continuing for two or three days she decided to let the sleeper who was obviously no tramp stay where he was and his basket with him extinguishing the last candle and lowering the flap of the tent she left it and drove away end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Two. The morning sun was streaming through the crevices of the canvas when the man awoke. A warm glow pervaded the whole atmosphere of the marquee, and a single big blue fly buzzed musically round and round it. Besides the buzz of the fly, there was not a sound. He looked about, at the benches, at the table supported by trestles, at his basket of tools, at the stove where the furmity had been boiled, at the empty basins, at some shed grains of wheat, at the corks which dotted the grassy floor. Among the odds and ends he discerned a little shining object and picked it up. It was his wife's ring. A confused picture of the events of the previous evening seemed to come back to him, and he thrust his hand into his breast pocket. A rustling revealed the sailor's banknotes thrust carelessly in. This second verification of his dim memories was enough. He knew now they were not dreams. He remained seated, looking on the ground for some time. I must get out of this as soon as I can, he said deliberately at last, with the air of one who could not catch his thoughts without pronouncing them. She's gone, to be sure she is, gone with that sailor who bought her and little Elizabeth Jane. We walked here, and I had the furmity and rum in it, and sold her. Yes, that's what happened, and here am I. Now, what am I to do? Am I sober enough to walk, I wonder? He stood up, found that he was in fairly good condition for progress, unencumbered. Next he shouldered his tool basket and found he could carry it. Then, lifting the tent door, he emerged into the open air. Here the man looked around with gloomy curiosity. The freshness of the September morning inspired and braced him as he stood. He and his family had been weary when they arrived the night before, and they had observed but little of the place, so that he now beheld it as a new thing. It exhibited itself as the top of an open down, bounded on one extreme by a plantation, and approached by a winding road. At the bottom stood the village which lent its name to the upland and the annual fair that was held thereon. The spot stretched downward into valleys and onward to other uplands, dotted with barrows and trenched with the remains of prehistoric forts. The whole scene lay under the rays of a newly risen sun, which had not as yet dried a single blade of the heavily dewed grass, whereon the shadows of the yellow and red vans were projected far away, those thrown by the fellow of each wheel being elongated in shape to the orbit of a comet. All the gypsies and showmen who had remained on the ground lay snug within their carts and tents, or wrapped in horse-cloths under them, and were silent and still as death, with the exception of an occasional snore that revealed their presence. But the seven sleepers had a dog, and dogs of the mysterious breeds that vagrants own that are as much like cats as dogs, and as much like foxes as cats, also lay about here. A little one started up under one of the carts, barked as a matter of principle, and quickly lay down again. 
he was the only positive spectator of the hay-trusser's exit from the waden fairfield this seemed to accord with his desire he went on in silent thought unheeding the yellow hammers which flitted about the hedges with straws in their bills the crowns of the mushrooms and the tinkling of local sheep bells whose wearer had had the good fortune not to be included in the fair when he reached a lane a good mile from the scene of the previous evening the man pitched his basket and leant upon a gate a difficult problem or two occupied his mind did i tell my name to anybody last night or didn't i tell my name he said to himself and at last concluded that he did not his general demeanour was enough to show how he was surprised and nettled that his wife had taken him so literally as much could be seen in his face and in the way he nibbled a straw which he pulled from the hedge he knew that she must have been somewhat excited to do this moreover she must have believed that there was some sort of binding force in the transaction on this latter point he felt almost certain knowing her freedom from levity of character and the extreme simplicity of her intellect there may too have been enough recklessness and resentment beneath her ordinary placidity to make her stifle any momentary doubts on a previous occasion when he had declared during a fuddle that he would dispose of her as he had done she had replied that she would not hear him say that many times more before it happened in the resigned tones of a fatalist yet she knows i am not in my senses when i do that he exclaimed well i must walk about till i find her seize her why didn't she know better than to bring me into this disgrace he roared out she wasn't queer if i was tis like susan to show such idiotic simplicity meek that meekness has done me more harm than the bitterest temper when he was calmer he turned to his original conviction that he must somehow find her and his little elizabeth jane and put up with the shame as best he could it was of his own making and he ought to bear it but first he resolved to register an oath a greater oath than he had ever sworn before and to do it properly he required a fit place and imagery for there was something fetishistic in this man's beliefs he shouldered his basket and moved on casting his eyes inquisitively round upon the landscape as he walked and at the distance of three or four miles perceived the roofs of a village and the tower of a church he instantly made towards the latter object the village was quite still it being that motionless hour of rustic daily life which fills the interval between the departure of the field labourers to their work and the rising of their wives and daughters to prepare the breakfast for their return hence he reached the church without observation and the door being only latched he entered the hay trusser deposited his basket by the font went up the nave till he reached the altar rails and opening the gate entered the sacrarium where he seemed to feel a sense of the strangeness for a moment then he knelt upon the footpace dropping his head upon the clamped book which lay on the communion table he said aloud i michael henchard on this morning of the sixteenth of september do take an oath before god here in this solemn place that i will avoid all strong liquors for the space of twenty-one years to come being a year for every year that i have lived and this i swear upon the book before me and may i be struck dumb blind and helpless if i break this my oath when he had said it and kissed the big book the hay trusser arose and seemed relieved at having made a start in a new direction while standing in the porch a moment he saw a thick jet of wood smoke suddenly start up from the red chimney of a cottage near and knew that the occupant had just lit her fire he went round to the door and the housewife agreed to prepare him some breakfast for a trifling payment which was done then he started on the search for his wife and child the perplexing nature of the undertaking became apparent soon enough 
though he examined and inquired and walked hither and thither day after day no such characters as those he described had anywhere been seen since the evening of the fair to add to the difficulty he could gain no sound of the sailor's name as money was short with him he decided after some hesitation to spend the sailor's money in the prosecution of this search but it was equally in vain the truth was that a certain shyness of revealing his conduct prevented michael henchard from following up the investigation with the loud hue and cry such a pursuit demanded to render it effectual and it was probably for this reason that he obtained no clue though everything was done by him that did not involve an explanation of the circumstances under which he had lost her weeks counted up to months and still he searched on maintaining himself by small jobs of work in the intervals by this time he had arrived at a seaport and there he derived intelligence that persons answering somewhat to his description had emigrated a little time before then he said he would search no longer and that he would go and settle in the district which he had had for some time in his mind next day he started journeying southwestward and did not pause except for night's lodgings till he reached the town of casterbridge in a far distant part of wessex end of chapter two chapter three of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter three the high road into the village of waden priors was again carpeted with dust the trees had put on as of yore their aspect of dingy green and where the henchard family of three had once walked along two persons not unconnected with the family walked now the scene in its broad aspect had so much of its previous character even to the voices and rattle from the neighboring village down that it might for that matter have been the afternoon following the previously recorded episode change was only to be observed in details but here it was obvious that a long procession of years had passed by one of the two who walked to the road was she who had figured as the young wife of henchard on the previous occasion now her face had lost much of its rotundity her skin had undergone a textural change and though her hair had not lost color it was considerably thinner than heretofore she was dressed in the mourning clothes of a widow her companion also in black appeared as a well-formed young woman about eighteen completely possessed of that ephemeral precious essence youth which is itself beauty irrespective of complexion or contour a glance was sufficient to inform the eye that this was susan henchard's grown-up daughter while life's middle summer had set its hardening mark on the mother's face her former spring-like specialities were transferred so dexterously by time to the second figure her child that the absence of certain facts within her mother's knowledge from the girl's mind would have seemed for the moment to one reflecting on those facts to be a curious imperfection in nature's powers of continuity they walked with joined hands and it could be perceived that this was the act of simple affection the daughter carried in her outer hand a withy basket of old-fashioned make the mother a blue bundle which contrasted oddly with her black stuff gown reaching the outskirts of the village they pursued the same track as formerly and ascended to the fair here too it was evident that the years had told certain mechanical improvements might have been noticed in the roundabouts and high flyers machines for testing rustic strength and weight and in the erections devoted to shooting for nuts but the real business of the fair had considerably dwindled the new periodical great markets of neighboring towns were beginning to interfere seriously with the trade carried on here for centuries the pens for sheep the tie-ropes for horses were about half as long as they had been 
the stalls of tailors hosiers coopers linen drapers and other such trades had almost disappeared and the vehicles were far less numerous the mother and daughter threaded the crowd for some little distance and then stood still why did we hinder our time by coming in here i thought you wished to get onward said the maiden yes my dear elizabeth jane explained the other but i had a fancy for looking up here why it was here i first met with newson on such a day as this first met with father here yes you have told me so before and now he's drowned and gone from us as she spoke the girl drew a card from her pocket and looked at it with a sigh it was edged with black and inscribed within a design resembling a mural tablet were the words in affectionate memory of richard newson mariner who was unfortunately lost at sea in the month of november eighteen forty blank aged forty one years and it was here continued her mother with more hesitation that i last saw the relation we are going to look for mr michael henchard what is his exact kin to us mother i have never clearly had it told me he is or was for he may be dead a connection by marriage said her mother deliberately that's exactly what you have said a score of times before replied the young woman looking about her inattentively he's not a near relation i suppose not by any means he was a hay-trusser wasn't he when you last heard of him he was i suppose he never knew me the girl innocently continued mrs henchard paused for a moment and answered uneasily of course not elizabeth jane but come this way she moved on to another part of the field it is not much use inquiring here for anybody i should think the daughter observed as she gazed round about people at fairs change like the leaves of trees and i dare say you are the only one here to-day who was here all those years ago i am not so sure of that said mrs newson as she now called herself keenly eyeing something under a green bank a little way off see there the daughter looked in the direction signified the object pointed out was a tripod of sticks stuck into the earth from which hung a three-legged crock kept hot by a smouldering wood fire beneath over the pot stooped an old woman haggard wrinkled and almost in rags she stirred the contents of the pot with a large spoon and occasionally croaked in a broken voice good fermity sold here it was indeed the former mistress of the fermity tent once thriving cleanly white-aproned and chinking with money now tentless dirty owning no tables or benches and having scarce any customers except two small whitey brown boys who came up and asked for a hayperth please good measure which she served in a couple of chipped yellow basins of commonest clay she was here at that time resumed mrs newson making a step as if to draw nearer don't speak to her it isn't respectable urged the other i will just say a word you elizabeth jane can stay here the girl was not loath and turned to some stalls of colored prints while her mother went forward the old woman begged for the latter's custom as soon as she saw her and responded to mrs henchard newson's request for a pennyworth with more alacrity than she had shown in selling six pennyworths in her younger days when the soi-disant widow had taken the basin of thin poor slop that stood for the rich concoction of the former time the hag opened a little basket behind the fire and looking up slyly whispered just a thought o rum in it smuggled you know say two penn'orth twill make it slip down like cordial her customer smiled bitterly at this survival of the old trick and shook her head with a meaning the old woman was far from translating she pretended to eat a little of the fermity with the leaden spoon offered and as she did so said blandly to the hag you've seen better days ah ma'am well may ye say it responded the old woman opening the sluices of her heart forthwith 
I've stood in this fair ground, maid, wife, and widow, these nine and thirty years, and in that time have known what it was to do business with the richest stomachs in the land. Ma'am, you'd hardly believe that I was once the owner of a great pavilion tent that was the attraction of the fair. Nobody could come, nobody could go, without having a dish of Mrs. Goodenough's firmity. I knew the clergy's taste, the dandy gent's taste, I knew the town's taste, the country's taste. I even knowed the taste of the coarse, shameless females. But, lords, my life, the world's no memory. Straightforward dealings don't bring profit. Tis the sly and the underhand that get on in these times. Mrs. Newson glanced round. Her daughter was still bending over the distant stalls. Can you call to mind, she said cautiously to the old woman, the sale of a wife by her husband in your tent eighteen years ago to-day the hag reflected and half shook her head if it had been a big thing i should have minded it in a moment she said i can mind every serious fight of married parties every murder every manslaughter even every pocket-picking leastwise large ones that it has been my lot to witness but a selling was it done quiet-like well yes i think so the furmity woman half shook her head again and yet she said i do at any rate i can mind a man doing something of the sort a man in a cord jacket with a basket of tools but lord bless ye we don't gay at headroom we don't such as that the only reason why i can mind the man is that he came back here to the next year's fair and told me quite private like that if a woman ever asked for him, I was to say he had gone to, where? Casterbridge, yes, to Casterbridge, said he. But, Lord's my life, I shouldn't have thought of it again. Mrs. Newson would have rewarded the old woman as far as her small means afforded, had she not discreetly borne in mind that it was by that unscrupulous person's liquor her husband had been degraded. She briefly thanked her informant, and rejoined Elizabeth, who greeted her with, "'Mother, do let's get on. It was hardly respectable for you to buy refreshments there. I see none but the lowest do.' "'I have learned what I wanted, however,' said her mother quietly. "'The last time our relative visited this fair, he said he was living at Casterbridge. It is a long, long way from here, and it was many years ago that he said it. But there I think we'll go.' With this they descended out of the fair, and went onward to the village, where they obtained a night's lodging. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 4 henchard's wife acted for the best but she had involved herself in difficulties a hundred times she had been upon the point of telling her daughter elizabeth jane the true story of her life the tragical crisis of which had been the transaction at waden fair when she was not much older than the girl now beside her but she had refrained an innocent maiden had thus grown up in the belief that the relations between the genial sailor and her mother were the ordinary ones that they had always appeared to be. The risk of endangering a child's strong affection by disturbing ideas which had grown with her growth was to Mrs. Henchard too fearful a thing to contemplate. It had seemed indeed folly to think of making Elizabeth Jane wise. But Susan Henchard's fear of losing her dearly loved daughter's heart by a revelation had little to do with any sense of wrongdoing on her own part. Her simplicity, the original ground of Henchard's contempt for her, had allowed her to live on in the conviction that Newson had acquired a morally real and justifiable right to her by his purchase, though the exact bearings and legal limits of that right were vague. It may seem strange to sophisticated minds that a sane young matron could believe in the seriousness of such a transfer, and were there not numerous other instances of the same belief the thing might scarcely be credited. 
but she was by no means the first or last peasant woman who had religiously adhered to her purchaser as too many rural records show the history of susan henchard's adventures in the interim can be told in two or three sentences absolutely helpless she had been taken off to canada where they had lived several years without any great worldly success though she worked as hard as any woman could to keep their cottage cheerful and well provided when elizabeth jane was about twelve years old the three returned to england and settled at falmouth where newson made a living for a few years as boatman and general handy shoreman he then engaged in the newfoundland trade and it was during this period that susan had an awakening a friend to whom she confided her history ridiculed her grave acceptance of her position and all was over with her peace of mind when newson came home at the end of one winter he saw that the delusion he had so carefully sustained had vanished forever there was then a time of sadness in which she told him her doubts if she could live with him longer newson left home again on the newfoundland trade when the season came round the vague news of his loss at sea a little later on solved a problem which had become torture to her meek conscience she saw him no more of henchard they heard nothing to the liege subjects of labor the england of those days was a continent and a mile a geographical degree elizabeth jane developed early into womanliness one day a month or so after receiving intelligence of newson's death off the bank of newfoundland when the girl was about eighteen she was sitting on a willow chair in the cottage they still occupied working twine nets for the fishermen her mother was in a back corner of the same room engaged in the same labor and dropping the heavy wood needle she was filling she surveyed her daughter thoughtfully the sun shone in at the door upon the young woman's head and hair which was worn loose so that the rays streamed into its depths as into a hazel copse her face though somewhat wan and incomplete possessed the raw materials of beauty in a promising degree there was an under handsomeness in it struggling to reveal itself through the provisional curves of immaturity and the casual disfigurements that resulted from the straitened circumstances of their lives she was handsome in the bone hardly as yet handsome in the flesh she possibly might never be fully handsome unless the carking accidents of her daily existence could be evaded before the mobile parts of her countenance had settled to their final mould the sight of the girl made her mother sad not vaguely but by logical inference they both were still in that strait waistcoat of poverty from which she had tried so many times to be delivered for the girl's sake the woman had long perceived how zealously and constantly the young mind of her companion was struggling for enlargement and yet now in her eighteenth year it still remained but little unfolded the desire sober and repressed of elizabeth jane's heart was indeed to see to hear and to understand how could she become a woman of wider knowledge higher repute better as she termed it this was her constant inquiry of her mother she sought further into things than other girls in her position ever did and her mother groaned as she felt she could not aid in the search the sailor drowned or no was probably now lost to them and susan's staunch religious adherence to him as her husband in principle till her views had been disturbed by enlightenment was demanded no more she asked herself whether the present moment now that she was a free woman again were not as opportune a one as she would find in a world where everything had been so inopportune for making a desperate effort to advance elizabeth to pocket her pride and search for the first husband seemed wisely or not the best initiatory step he had possibly drunk himself into his tomb but he might on the other hand have had too much sense to do so for in her time with him 
he had been given to bouts only and was not a habitual drunkard at any rate the propriety of returning to him if he lived was unquestionable the awkwardness of searching for him lay in enlightening elizabeth a proceeding which her mother could not endure to contemplate she finally resolved to undertake the search without confiding to the girl her former relations with henchard leaving it to him if they found him to take what steps he might choose to that end this will account for their conversation at the fair and the half-informed state at which elizabeth was led onward in this attitude they proceeded on their journey trusting solely to the dim light afforded of henchard's whereabouts by the fermity woman the strictest economy was indispensable sometimes they might have been seen on foot sometimes on farmers wagons sometimes in carriers vans and thus they drew near to casterbridge elizabeth jane discovered to her alarm that her mother's health was not what it once had been and there was ever and anon in her talk that renunciatory tone which showed that but for the girl she would not be very sorry to quit a life she was growing thoroughly weary of it was on a friday evening near the middle of september and just before dusk that they reached the summit of a hill within a mile of the place they sought there were high banked hedges to the coach road here and they mounted upon the green turf within and sat down the spot commanded a full view of the town and its environs what an old-fashioned place it seems to be said elizabeth jane while her silent mother mused on other things than topography it is huddled all together and it is shut in by a square wall of trees like a plot of garden ground by a box edging its squareness was indeed the characteristic which most struck the eye in this antiquated borough the borough of casterbridge at that time recent as it was untouched by the faintest sprinkle of modernism it was compact as a box of dominoes it had no suburbs in the ordinary sense country and town met at a mathematical line to birds of the more soaring kind casterbridge must have appeared on this fine evening as a mosaic work of subdued reds browns grays and crystals held together by a rectangular frame of deep green to the level eye of humanity it stood as an indistinct mass behind a dense stockade of limes and chestnuts set in the midst of miles of rotund down and concave field the mass became gradually dissected by the vision into towers gables chimneys and casements the highest glazings shining bleared and bloodshot with the coppery fire they caught from the belt of sunlit cloud in the west from the centre of each side of this tree-bound square ran avenues east west and south into the wide expanse of cornland and coombe to the distance of a mile or so it was by one of these avenues that the pedestrians were about to enter before they had risen to proceed two men passed outside the hedge engaged in argumentative conversation why surely said elizabeth as they receded those men mentioned the name of henchard in their talk the name of our relative i thought so too said mrs newson that seems a hint to us that he is still here yes shall i run after them and ask them about him no 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 not for the world just yet he may be in the workhouse or in the stocks for all we know dear me why should you think that mother twas just something to say that's all but we must make private inquiries having sufficiently rested they proceeded on their way at evenfall the dense trees of the avenue rendered the road dark as a tunnel though the open land on each side was still under a faint daylight in other words they passed down a midnight between two gloamings the features of the town had a keen interest for elizabeth's mother now that the human side came to the fore as soon as they had wandered about they could see that the stockade of gnarled trees which framed in casterbridge was itself an avenue standing on a low green bank or escarpment with a ditch yet visible without 
within the avenue and bank was a wall more or less discontinuous and within the wall were packed the abodes of the burghers though the two women did not know it these external features were but the ancient defences of the town planted as a promenade the lamplights now glimmered through the engirdling trees conveying a sense of great smugness and comfort inside and rendering at the same time the unlighted country without strangely solitary and vacant in aspect considering its nearness to life the difference between burg and champagne was increased too by sounds which now reached them above others the notes of a brass band the travellers returned into the high street where there were timber houses with overhanging stories whose small-paned lattices were screened by dimity curtains on a drawing string and under whose barge boards old cobwebs waved in the breeze there were houses of brick nogging which derived their chief support from those adjoining there were slate roofs patched with tiles and tile roofs patched with slate with occasionally a roof of thatch the agricultural and pastoral character of the people upon whom the town depended for its existence was shown by the class of objects displayed in the shop windows scythes reap-hooks sheep-shears bill-hooks spades mattocks and hoes at the ironmongers beehives butter-firkins churns milking-stools and pails hay-rakes field-flagons and seed-lips at the coopers cart-ropes and plough-harness at the saddlers carts wheelbarrows and mill-gear at the wheelwrights and machinists horse embrocations at the chemists at the glovers and leather cutters hedging gloves thatchers kneecaps ploughmen's leggings villagers pattens and clogs they came to a grizzled church whose massive square tower rose unbroken into the darkening sky the lower parts being illuminated by the nearest lamps sufficiently to show how completely the mortar from the joints of the stonework had been nibbled out by time and weather which had planted in the crevices thus made little tufts of stone crop and grass almost as far up as the very battlements from this tower the clock struck eight and thereupon a bell began to toll with a peremptory clang the curfew was still rung in casterbridge and it was utilized by the inhabitants as a signal for shutting their shops no sooner did the deep notes of the bell throb between the house fronts than a clatter of shutters arose through the whole length of the high street in a few minutes business at casterbridge was ended for the day other clocks struck eight from time to time one gloomily from the jail another from the gable of an almshouse with a preparative creak of machinery more audible than the note of the bell a row of tall varnished case clocks from the interior of a clockmaker's shop joined in one after another just as the shutters were enclosing them like a row of actors delivering their final speeches before the fall of the curtain then chimes were heard stammering out the sicilian mariner's hymn so that chronologists of the advanced school were appreciably on their way to the next hour before the whole business of the old one was satisfactorily wound up in an open space before the church walked a woman with her gown sleeves rolled up so high that the edge of her under linen was visible and her skirt tucked up through her pocket hole she carried a load under her arm from which she was pulling pieces of bread and handing them to some other women who walked with her which pieces they nibbled critically the sight reminded mrs henchard newson and her daughter that they had an appetite and they inquired of the woman for the nearest baker's ye may as well look for manna food as good bread in casterbridge just now she said after directing them they can blare their trumpets and thump their drums and have their roaring dinners waving her hand towards a point further along the street where the brass band could be seen standing in front of an illuminated building but we must needs be put to for want of a wholesome crust there's less good bread than good beer in casterbridge now and less good beer than swipes said a man with his hands in his pockets how does it happen there's no good bread asked mrs henchard oh tis the corn factor he's the man that our millers and bakers all deal with and he has sold em growed wheat 
which they didn't know was growed, so they say, till the dough ran all over the ovens like quicksilver, so that the loaves be as flat as toads and like suet puddin' inside. I've been a wife and I've been a mother, and I never see such unprincipled bread in Casterbridge as this before. But you must be a real stranger here not to know what's made all the poor folks' insides plim like blowed bladders this week. I am, said Elizabeth's mother shyly. Not wishing to be observed further till she knew more of her future in this place, she withdrew with her daughter from the speaker's side. Getting a couple of biscuits at the shop indicated, as a temporary substitute for a meal, they next bent their steps instinctively to where the music was playing. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 5 A few score yards brought them to the spot where the town band was now shaking the window panes with the strains of the roast beef of old England. The building before whose doors they had pitched their music stands was the chief hotel in Casterbridge, namely the King's Arms. A spacious bow window projected into the street over the main portico, and from the open sashes came the babble of voices, the jingle of glasses, and the drawing of corks. The blinds, moreover, being left unclosed, the whole interior of this room could be surveyed from the top of a flight of stone steps to the road wagon office opposite, for which reason a knot of idlers had gathered there. We might, perhaps, after all, make a few inquiries about our relation, Mr. Henchard, whispered Mrs. Newson, who, since her entry into Casterbridge, had seemed strangely weak and agitated. And this, I think, would be a good place for trying it, just to ask, you know, how he stands in the town, if he is here, as I think he must be. You, Elizabeth Jane, had better be the one to do it. I'm too worn out to do anything. Pull down your fall first. She sat down upon the lowest step, and Elizabeth Jane obeyed her directions and stood among the idlers. "'What's going on to-night?' asked the girl, after singling out an old man and standing by him long enough to acquire a neighborly right of converse. "'Well, ye must be a stranger, sure,' said the old man, without taking his eyes from the window. "'Why, tis a great public dinner of the gentle people and such like leading folk, with a mayor in the chair.' As we plainer fellows bain't invited, they leave the window shutters open that we may get just a sense o' it out here. If you mount the steps, you can see him. That's Mr. Henchard, the mayor, at the end of the table, a facing ye, and that's the councilmen, right and left. Ah, lots o' them when they begun life were no more than I be now. Henchard, said Elizabeth Jane, surprised but by no means suspecting the whole force of the revelation. She ascended to the top of the steps. Her mother, though her head was bowed, had already caught from the in-window tones that strangely riveted her attention before the old man's words, Mr. Henchard the mayor, reached her ears. She arose and stepped up to her daughter's side as soon as she could do so without showing exceptional eagerness. The interior of the hotel dining-room was spread out before her, with its tables and glass and plate and inmates. Facing the window, in the chair of dignity, sat a man about forty years of age, of heavy frame, large features, and commanding voice, his general build being rather coarse than compact. He had a rich complexion which verged on swarthiness, a flashing black eye, and dark, bushy brows and hair. When he indulged in an occasional loud laugh at some remark among the guests, his large mouth parted so far back as to show to the rays of the chandelier a full score or more of the two and thirty sound white teeth that he obviously still could boast of. That laugh was not encouraging to strangers, and hence it may have been well that it was rarely heard. Many theories might have been built upon it. It fell in well with conjectures of a temperament which would have no pity for weakness but would be ready to yield ungrudging admiration to greatness and strength. Its producer's personal goodness, if he had any, would be of a very fitful cast, 
an occasional almost oppressive generosity rather than a mild and constant kindness susan henchard's husband in law at least sat before them matured in shape stiffened in line exaggerated in traits disciplined thought marked in a word older elizabeth encumbered with no recollections as her mother was regarded him with nothing more than the keen curiosity and interest which the discovery of such unexpected social standing in the long-sought relative naturally begot he was dressed in an old-fashioned evening suit an expanse of frilled shirt showing on his broad breast jewelled studs and a heavy gold chain three glasses stood at his right hand but to his wife's surprise the two for wine were empty while the third a tumbler was half full of water when last she had seen him he was sitting in a corduroy jacket fustian waistcoat and breeches and tanned leather leggings with a basin of hot firmity before him time the magician had wrought much here watching him and thus thinking of past days she became so moved that she shrank back against the jamb of the wagon office doorway to which the steps gave access the shadow from it conveniently hiding her features she forgot her daughter till a touch from elizabeth jane aroused her have you seen him mother whispered the girl yes yes answered her companion hastily i have seen him and it is enough for me now i only want to go pass away die why oh what she drew closer and whispered in her mother's ear does he seem to you not likely to befriend us i thought he looked a generous man what a gentleman he is isn't he and how his diamond studs shine how strange that you should have said he might be in the stocks or in the workhouse or dead did ever anything go more by contraries why do you feel so afraid of him i am not at all i'll call upon him he can but say he don't own such remote kin i don't know at all i can't tell what to set about i feel so down don't be that mother now we have got here and all rest there where you be a little while i will look on and find out more about him i don't think i can ever meet mr henchard he is not how i thought he would be he overpowers me i don't wish to see him any more but wait a little time and consider elizabeth jane had never been so much interested in anything in her life as in their present position partly from the natural elation she felt at discovering herself akin to a coach and she gazed again at the scene the younger guests were talking and eating with animation their elders were searching for tidbits and sniffing and grunting over their plates like sows nuzzling for acorns three drinks seemed to be sacred to the company port sherry and rum outside which old established trinity few or no pallets ranged a row of ancient rummers with ground figures on their sides and each primed with a spoon was now placed down the table and these were promptly filled with grog at such high temperatures as to raise serious considerations for the articles exposed to its vapours but elizabeth jane noticed that though this filling went on with great promptness up and down the table nobody filled the mayor's glass who still drank large quantities of water from the tumbler behind the clump of crystal vessels intended for wine and spirits they don't fill mr henchard's wine glasses she ventured to say to her elbow acquaintance the old man ah no don't you know him to be the celebrated abstaining worthy of that name he scorns all tempting liquors never touches nothing oh yes he've strong qualities that way i have heard tell that he swear a gospel oath in bygone times and has bowed by it ever since so they don't press him knowing it would be unbecoming in the face of that for your gospel oath is a serious thing another elderly man hearing this discourse now joined in by inquiring how much longer have he got to suffer from it solomon longways another two year they say i don't know the why and the wherefore of his fixing such a time for he never has told anybody but tis exactly two calendar years longer they say a powerful mind to hold out so long true but there's great strength in hope 
knowing that in four and twenty months time you'll be out of your bondage and able to make up for all you've suffered by partaking without stint why it keeps a man up no doubt no doubt christopher coney no doubt and he must need such reflections a lonely widow man said longways when did he lose his wife asked elizabeth i never knowed her twas afore he came to casterbridge solomon longways replied with terminative emphasis as if the fact of his ignorance of mrs henchard were sufficient to deprive her history of all interest but i know that he's a banded teetotaler and that if any of his men be ever so little overtook by a drop he's down upon em as stern as the lord upon the jovial jews has he many men then said elizabeth jane many why my good maid he's the powerfullest member of the town council and quite a principal man in the country round besides never a big dealing in wheat barley oats hay roots and such like but henchard's got a hand in it ay and he'll go into other things too and that's where he makes his mistake he worked his way up from nothing when he came here and now he's a pillar of the town not but what he's been shaken a little to hear about this bad corn he has supplied in his contracts i've seen the sun rise over durnover moor these nine and sixty year and though mr henchard has never cussed me unfairly ever since i've worked for him seein i be but a little small man i must say that i have never before tasted such rough bread as has been made from henchard's wheat lately tis that growed out that ye could almost call it malt and there's a list at bottom of the loaf as thick as the sole of one's shoe the band now struck up another melody and by the time it was ended the dinner was over and speeches began to be made the evening being calm and the windows still open these orations could be distinctly heard henchard's voice arose above the rest he was telling a story of his hay-dealing experiences in which he had outwitted a sharper who had been bent upon outwitting him ha 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 responded his audience at the upshot of the story and hilarity was general till a new voice arose with this is all very well but how about the bad bread it came from the lower end of the table where there sat a group of minor tradesmen who although part of the company appeared to be a little below the social level of the others and who seemed to nourish a certain independence of opinion and carry on discussions not quite in harmony with those at the head just as the west end of a church is sometimes persistently found to sing out of time and tune with the leading spirits in the chancel this interruption about the bad bread afforded infinite satisfaction to the loungers outside several of whom were in the mood which finds its pleasure in others discomfiture and hence they echoed pretty freely hey how about the bad bread mr mayor moreover feeling none of the restraints of those who shared the feast they could afford to add you rather ought to tell the story of that sir the interruption was sufficient to compel the mayor to notice it well i admit that the wheat turned out badly he said but i was taken in in buying it as much as the bakers who bought it to me and the poor folk who had to eat it whether or no said the inharmonious man outside the window henchard's face darkened there was temper under the thin bland surface the temper which artificially intensified had banished a wife nearly a score of years before you must make allowances for the accidents of a large business he said you must bear in mind that the weather just at the harvest of that corn was worse than we have known it for years however i have mended my arrangements on account of it since i have found my business too large to be well looked after by myself alone i have advertised for a thorough good man as manager of the corn department when i've got him you will find these mistakes will no longer occur matters will be better looked into but what are you going to do to repay us for the past inquired the man who had spoken before and who seemed to be a baker or miller will you replace the grown flour we've still got by sound grain henchard's face had become still more stern at these interruptions and he drank from his tumbler of water as if to calm himself or gain time instead of vouchsafing a direct reply he stiffly observed 
If anybody will tell me how to turn grown wheat into wholesome wheat, I'll take it back with pleasure, but it can't be done. Henchard was not to be drawn again. Having said this, he sat down. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Six. Now the group outside the window had within the last few minutes been reinforced by new arrivals, some of them respectable shopkeepers and their assistants, who had come out for a whiff of air after putting up the shutters for the night, some of them of a lower class. Distinct from either there appeared a stranger, a young man of remarkably pleasant aspect, who carried in his hand a carpet-bag of the smart floral pattern prevalent in such articles at that time. He was ruddy and of a fair countenance, bright-eyed and slight in build. He might possibly have passed by without stopping at all, or at most for half a minute to glance in at the scene, had not his advent coincided with the discussion on corn and bread in which event this history had never been enacted. But the subject seemed to arrest him, and he whispered some inquiries of the other bystanders, and remained listening. When he heard Henchard's closing words, It can't be done, he smiled impulsively, drew out his pocket-book, and wrote down a few words by the aid of the light in the window. He tore out the leaf, folded and directed it, and seemed about to throw it in through the open sash upon the dining-table, but, on second thoughts, edged himself through the loiterers till he reached the door of the hotel, where one of the waiters who had been serving inside was now idly leaning against the doorpost. "'Give this to the mayor at once,' he said, handing in his hasty note. Elizabeth Jane had seen his movements and heard the words which attracted her both by their subject and by their accent, a strange one for those parts. It was quaint and northerly. The waiter took the note, while the young stranger continued, And can you tell me of a respectable hotel that's a little more moderate than this? The waiter glanced indifferently up and down the street. They say the Three Mariners, just below here, is a very good place, he languidly answered, but I have never stayed there myself. The Scotchman, as he seemed to be, thanked him and strolled on in the direction of the three mariners aforesaid, apparently more concerned about the question of an inn than about the fate of his note, now that the momentary impulse of writing it was over. While he was disappearing slowly down the street, the waiter left the door, and Elizabeth Jane saw, with some interest, the note brought into the dining-room and handed to the mayor. Henchard looked at it carelessly, unfolded it with one hand, and glanced it through. Thereupon it was curious to note an unexpected effect. The nettled, clouded aspect, which had held possession of his face since the subject of his corn-dealings had been broached, changed itself into one of arrested attention. He read the note slowly, and fell into thought, not moody but fitfully intense, as that of a man who has been captured by an idea. By this time toasts and speeches had given place to songs, the wheat subject being quite forgotten. Men were putting their heads together in twos and threes, telling good stories with pantomimic laughter, which reached convulsive grimace. Some were beginning to look as if they did not know how they had come there, what they had come for, or how they were going to get home again and provisionally sat on with a dazed smile. Square-built men showed a tendency to become hunchbacks. Men with a dignified presence lost it in a curious obliquity of figure, in which their features grew disarranged and one-sided, whilst the heads of a few who had dined with extreme thoroughness were somehow sinking into their shoulders, the corners of their mouth and eyes being bent upwards by the subsidence. Only Henchard did not conform to these flexuous changes. He remained stately and vertical, silently thinking. The clock struck nine. Elizabeth Jane turned to her companion. The evening is drawing on, mother, she said. What do you propose to do? 
she was surprised to find how irresolute her mother had become. We must get a place to lie down in, she murmured. I have seen Mr. Henchard, and that's all I wanted to do. That's enough for tonight, at any rate, Elizabeth Jane replied soothingly. We can think tomorrow what is best to do about him. The question now is, is it not, how shall we find a lodging? As her mother did not reply, Elizabeth Jane's mind reverted to the words of the waiter, that the three mariners was an inn of moderate charges. A recommendation good for one person was probably good for another. Let's go where the young man has gone to, she said. He is respectable. What do you say? Her mother assented, and down the street they went. In the meantime, the mayor's thoughtfulness, engendered by the note, as stated, continued to hold him in abstraction, till, whispering to his neighbor to take his place, he found opportunity to leave the chair. This was just after the departure of his wife and Elizabeth. Outside the door of the assembly room he saw the waiter, and beckoning to him asked, who had brought the note which had been handed in a quarter of an hour before? A young man, sir, a sort of traveller. He was a Scotchman, seemingly. Did he say how he had got it? He wrote it himself, sir, as he stood outside the window. Oh, wrote it himself. Is the young man in the hotel? No, sir, he went to the Three Mariners, I believe. The mayor walked up and down the vestibule of the hotel with his hands under his coat-tails, as if he were merely seeking a cooler atmosphere than that of the room he had quitted. But there could be no doubt that he was in reality still possessed to the full by the new idea, whatever that might be. At length he went back to the door of the dining-room, paused, and found that the songs, toasts, and conversation were proceeding quite satisfactorily without his presence. The corporation, private residents, and major and minor tradesmen had, in fact, gone in for comforting beverages to such an extent that they had quite forgotten not only the mayor, but all those vast political, religious, and social differences which they felt necessary to maintain in the daytime, and which separated them like iron grills. Seeing this, the mayor took his hat, and when the waiter had helped him on with a thin holland overcoat, went out and stood under the portico. Very few persons were now in the street, and his eyes, by a sort of attraction, turned and dwelt upon a spot about a hundred yards further down. It was the house to which the writer of the note had gone, the three mariners, whose two prominent Elizabethan gables, bow window, and passage light could be seen from where he stood. Having kept his eyes on it for a while, he strolled in that direction. This ancient house of accommodation for man and beast, now unfortunately pulled down, was built of mellow sandstone with mullioned windows of the same material, markedly out of perpendicular from the settlement of foundations. The bay window projecting into the street, whose interior was so popular among the frequenters of the inn, was closed with shutters, in each of which appeared a heart-shaped aperture somewhat more attenuated in the right and left ventricles than is seen in nature. Inside these illuminated holes, at a distance of about three inches, were ranged at this hour, as every passer knew, the ruddy poles of Billy Wills the glazier, Smart the shoemaker, Buzzford the general dealer, and others of a secondary set of worthies, of a grade somewhat below that of the diners at the King's Arms, each with his yard of clay. A four-centred Tudor arch was over the entrance, and over the arch the signboard, now visible in the rays of an opposite lamp. Hereon the mariners, who had been represented by the artist as persons of two dimensions only, in other words, flat as a shadow, were standing in a row in paralysed attitudes. Being on the sunny side of the street, the three comrades had suffered largely from warping, splitting, fading, and shrinkage so that they were but a half-invisible film upon the reality of the grain and knots and nails which composed the signboard. As a matter of fact, this state of things was not so much owing to Stanage, the landlord's neglect, as from the lack of a painter in Casterbridge who would undertake to reproduce the features of men so traditional. 
a long narrow dimly lit passage gave access to the inn within which passage the horses going to their stalls at the back and the coming and departing human guests rubbed shoulders indiscriminately the latter running no slight risk of having their toes trodden upon by the animals the good stabling and the good ale of the mariners though somewhat difficult to reach on account of their being but this narrow way to both were nevertheless perseveringly sought out by the sagacious old heads who knew what was what in casterbridge henchard stood without the inn for a few instants then lowering the dignity of his presence as much as possible by buttoning the brown holland coat over his shirt front and in other ways toning himself down to his ordinary everyday appearance he entered the inn door end of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Seven. Elizabeth Jane and her mother had arrived some twenty minutes earlier. Outside the house, they had stood and considered whether even this homely place, though recommended as moderate, might not be too serious in its prices for their light pockets finally however they had found courage to enter and duly met stanage the landlord a silent man who drew and carried frothing measures to this room and to that shoulder to shoulder with his waiting-maids a stately slowness however entering into his ministrations by contrast with theirs as became one whose service was somewhat optional it would have been altogether optional but for the orders of the landlady a person who sat in the bar corporeally motionless but with a flitting eye and quick ear with which she observed and heard through the open door and hatchway the pressing needs of customers whom her husband overlooked though close at hand elizabeth and her mother were passively accepted as sojourners and shown to a small bedroom under one of the gables where they sat down the principle of the inn seemed to be to compensate for the antique awkwardness crookedness and obscurity of the passages floors and windows by quantities of clean linen spread about everywhere and this had a dazzling effect upon the travellers tis too good for us we can't meet it said the elder woman looking round the apartment with misgiving as soon as they were left alone i fear it is too said elizabeth but we must be respectable we must pay our way even before we must be respectable replied her mother mr henchard is too high for us to make ourselves known to him i much fear so we've only our own pockets to depend on i know what i'll do said elizabeth jane after an interval of waiting during which their needs seemed quite forgotten under the press of business below and leaving the room she descended the stairs and penetrated to the bar if there was one good thing more than another which characterized this single-hearted girl it was a willingness to sacrifice her personal comfort and dignity to the common weal as you seem busy here to-night and mother's not well off might i take out part of our accommodation by helping she asked of the landlady the latter who remained as fixed in the armchair as if she had been melted into it when in a liquid state and could not now be unstuck looked the girl up and down inquiringly with her hands on the chair arms such arrangements as the one elizabeth proposed were not uncommon in country villages but though casterbridge was old-fashioned the custom was well-nigh obsolete here the mistress of the house however was an easy woman to strangers and she made no objection thereupon elizabeth being instructed by nods and motions from the taciturn landlord as to where she could find the different things trotted up and down stairs with materials for her own and her parents meal while she was doing this the wood partition in the centre of the house thrilled to its centre with the tugging of a bell pole upstairs a bell below tinkled a note that was feebler in sound than the twanging of wires and cranks that had produced it tis the scotch gentleman said the landlady omnisciently and turning her eyes to elizabeth now then can you go and see if his supper is on the tray if it is you can take it up to him the front room over this 
elizabeth jane though hungry willingly postponed serving herself a while and applied to the cook in the kitchen whence she brought forth the tray of supper viands and proceeded with it upstairs to the apartment indicated the accommodation of the three mariners was far from spacious despite the fair area of ground it covered the room demanded by intrusive beams and rafters partitions passages staircases disused ovens settles and four-posters left comparatively small quarters for human beings moreover this being at a time before home brewing was abandoned by the smaller victuallers and a house in which the twelve bushel strength was still religiously adhered to by the landlord in his ale the quality of the liquor was the chief attraction of the premises so that everything had to make way for utensils and operations in connection therewith thus elizabeth found that the scotchman was located in a room quite close to the small one that had been allotted to herself and her mother when she entered nobody was present but the young man himself the same whom she had seen lingering without the windows of the king's arms hotel he was now idly reading a copy of the local paper and was hardly conscious of her entry so that she looked at him quite coolly and saw how his forehead shone where the light caught it and how nicely his hair was cut and the sort of velvet pile or down that was on the skin at the back of his neck and how his cheek was so truly curved as to be part of a globe and how clearly drawn were the lids and lashes which hid his bent eyes she set down the tray spread his supper and went away without a word on her arrival below the landlady who was as kind as she was fat and lazy saw that elizabeth jane was rather tired though in her earnestness to be useful she was waiving her own needs altogether mrs stanage thereupon said with a considerate peremptoriness that she and her mother had better take their own suppers if they meant to have any elizabeth fetched their simple provisions as she had fetched the scotchman's and went up to the little chamber where she had left her mother noiselessly pushing open the door with the edge of the tray to her surprise her mother instead of being reclined on the bed where she had left her was in an erect position with lips parted at elizabeth's entry she lifted her finger the meaning of this was soon apparent the room allotted to the two women had at one time served as a dressing-room to the scotchman's chamber as was evidenced by signs of a door of communication between them now screwed up and pasted over with the wallpaper but as is frequently the case with hotels of far higher pretensions than the three mariners every word spoken in either of these rooms was distinctly audible in the other such sounds came through now thus silently conjured elizabeth deposited the tray and her mother whispered as she drew nearer tis he who said the girl the mayor the tremors in susan henchard's tone might have led any person but one so perfectly unsuspicious of the truth as the girl was to surmise some closer connection than the admitted simple kinship as a means of accounting for them two men were indeed talking in the adjoining chamber the young scotchman and henchard who having entered the inn while elizabeth jane was in the kitchen waiting for the supper had been deferentially conducted upstairs by host stanage himself the girl noiselessly laid out their little meal and beckoned to her mother to join her which mrs henchard mechanically did her attention being fixed on the conversation through the door i merely strolled in on my way home to ask you a question about something that has excited my curiosity said the mayor with careless geniality but i see you have not finished supper ay but i will be done in a little ye needn't go sir take a seat i've almost done and it makes no difference at all henchard seemed to take the seat offered and in a moment he resumed well first i should ask did you write this a rustling of paper followed yes i did said the scotchman then said henchard i am under the impression that we have met by accident while waiting for the morning to keep an appointment with each other my name is henchard hadn't you replied to an advertisement for a corn factor's manager that i put into the paper hadn't you come here to see me about it no said the scotchman with some surprise 
"'Surely you are the man,' went on Henchard insistingly, "'who arranged to come and see me. "'Joshua, Joshua, Jip, Jop, what was his name?' "'You're wrong,' said the young man. "'My name is Donald Farfray. "'It is true I am in the corn trade, "'but I have replied to no advertisement "'and arranged to see no one. "'I am on my way to Bristol, "'from there to the other side of the world, "'to try my fortune in the great wheat-growing districts of the West.' I have some inventions useful to the trade, and there is no scope for developing them here. To America. Well, well, said Henchard in a tone of disappointment, so strong as to make itself felt like a damp atmosphere. And yet I could have sworn you were the man. The Scotchman murmured another negative, and there was a silence, till Henchard resumed. Then I am truly and sincerely obliged to you for the few words you wrote on that paper. It was nothing, sir. Well, it has a great importance for me just now. This row about my grown wheat, which I declare to heaven I didn't know to be bad till the people came complaining, has put me to my wit's end. I've some hundreds of quarters of it on hand, and if your renovating process will make it wholesome, why, you can see what a quag would get me out of. I saw in a moment there might be truth in it, but I should like to have it proved, and of course you don't care to tell the steps of the process sufficiently for me to do that without my paying ye well for it first. The young man reflected a moment or two. I don't know that I have any objection, he said. I'm going to another country, and curing bad corn is not the line I'll take up there. Yes, I'll tell ye the whole of it. You'll make more out of it here than I will in a foreign country. Just look here a minute, sir. I can show ye by a sample in my carpet-bag. The click of a lock followed, and there was a shifting and rustling, then a discussion about so many ounces to the bushel and drying and refrigerating and so on. These few grains will be sufficient to show ye with, came in the young fellow's voice, and after a pause, during which some operation seemed to be intently watched by them both, he exclaimed, There, now, do you taste that? It's complete, quite restored, or, well, nearly. Quite enough restored to make good seconds out of it, said the Scotchman. To fetch it back entirely is impossible. Nature won't stand so much as that, but here you go a great way towards it. Well, sir, that's the process. I don't value it, for it can be but of little use in countries where the weather is more settled than in ours, and I'll be only too glad if it's of service to you. But hearken to me, pleaded Henchard. My business, you know, is in corn and in hay, but I was brought up as a hay trusser simply, and hay is what I understand best, though I now do more in corn than in the other. If you'll accept the place— you shall manage the corn branch entirely, and receive a commission in addition to salary. You're liberal, very liberal, but no, no, I cannot, the young man still replied with some distress in his accents. So be it, said Henchard conclusively. Now, to change the subject, one good turn deserves another. Don't stay to finish that miserable supper. Come to my house. I can find something better for ye than cold ham and ale. Donald Farfray was grateful, said he feared he must decline, that he wished to leave early next day. Very well, said Henchart quickly. Please yourself. But I tell you, young man, if this holds good for the bulk, as it has done for the sample, you have saved my credit, stranger though you be. What shall I pay you for this knowledge? Nothing at all, nothing at all. It may not prove necessary to ye to use it often, and I don't value it at all. I thought I might just as well let ye know as you were in a difficulty, and they were hard upon ye. Henchard paused. I shan't soon forget this, he said, and from a stranger. I couldn't believe you were not the man I had engaged. Says I to myself, he knows who I am and recommends himself by this stroke. And yet it turns out after all that you are not the man who answered my advertisement, but a stranger. Aye, aye, that's so, said the young man. Henchard again suspended his words, and then his voice came thoughtfully. Your forehead, Farfray, is something like my poor brother's, now dead and gone, and the nose, too, isn't unlike his. 
You must be, what, five foot nine, I reckon? I am six foot one and a half out of my shoes. But what of that? In my business tis true that strength and bustle build up a firm, but judgment and knowledge are what keep it established. Unluckily I am bad at science, Farfray, bad at figures, a rule-of-thumb sort of man. You are just the reverse, I can see that. I have been looking for such as you these two year, and yet you are not for me. Well, before I go, let me ask this. Though you are not the young man I thought you were, what's the difference? Can't ye stay just the same? Have you really made up your mind about this American notion? I won't mince matters. I feel you would be invaluable to me. That needn't be said. And if you will bide and be my manager, I will make it worth your while. My plans are fixed said the young man in negative tones. I have formed a scheme, and so we need not say any more about it. But will you not drink with me, sir? I find this Casterbridge ale warming to the stomach. No, no, I fain would, but I can't, said Henchard gravely, the scraping of his chair informing the listeners that he was rising to leave. When I was a young man I went in for that sort of thing too strong, far too strong, and was well-nigh ruined by it. I did a deed on account of it which I shall be ashamed of to my dying day. It made such an impression on me that I swore there and then that I'd drink nothing stronger than tea for as many years as I was old that day. I have kept my oath, and though, far fray, I am sometimes that dry in the dog days that I could drink a quarter barrel to the pitching, I think of my oath, and touch no strong drink at all. I'll no press ye, sir, I'll no press ye. I respect your vow. Well, I shall get a manager somewhere, no doubt, said Henchard, with strong feeling in his tones, but it will be long before I see one that would suit me so well. The young man appeared much moved by Henchard's warm convictions of his value. He was silent till they reached the door. "'I wish I could stay. Sincerely, I would like to,' he replied. "'But no, it cannot be, it cannot. I want to see the world.'" End of chapter 7「Eight of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 8 Thus they parted, and Elizabeth Jane and her mother remained each in her thoughts over their meal, the mother's face being strangely bright since Henchard's avowal of shame for a past action. The quivering of the partition to its core presently denoted that Donald Farfray had again rung his bell, no doubt to have his supper removed. For humming a tune and walking up and down, he seemed to be attracted by the lively bursts of conversation and melody from the general company below. He sauntered out upon the landing and descended the staircase. When Elizabeth Jane had carried down his supper tray, and also that used by her mother and herself, she found the bustle of serving to be at its height below, as it always was at this hour. The young woman shrank from having anything to do with the ground-floor serving, and crept silently about, observing the scene, so new to her, fresh from the seclusion of a seaside cottage. In the general sitting-room, which was large, she remarked the two or three dozen strong-backed chairs that stood round against the wall, each fitted with its genial occupant, the sanded floor, the black settle which, projecting endwise from the wall within the door, permitted Elizabeth to be a spectator of all that went on, without herself being particularly seen. The young Scotchman had just joined the guests. These, in addition to the respectable master tradesmen occupying the seats of privileges in the bow-window and its neighbourhood, included an inferior set at the unlighted end, whose seats were mere benches against the wall and who drank from cups instead of from glasses. Among the latter she noticed some of those personages who had stood outside the windows of the King's Arms. 
Behind their backs was a small window with a wheel ventilator in one of the panes, which would suddenly start off spinning with a jingling sound, as suddenly stop, and as suddenly start again. While thus furtively making her survey, the opening words of a song greeted her ears from the front of the settle, in a melody and accent of peculiar charm. There had been some singing before she came down, and now the Scotchman had made himself so soon at home that, at the request of some of the master tradesmen, he too was favouring the room with a ditty. Elizabeth Jane was fond of music. She could not help pausing to listen, and the longer she listened, the more she was enraptured. She had never heard any singing like this, and it was evident that the majority of the audience had not heard such frequently, for they were attentive to a much greater degree than usual. They neither whispered, nor drank, nor dipped their pipe-stems in their ale to moisten them, nor pushed the mug to their neighbors. The singer himself grew emotional till she could imagine a tear in his eye as the words went on. It's hame and it's hame, hame fain would I be, O oh, hame, 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 to my ain country. There's an eye that never weeps, and a fair face will be fain, as I pass through Annan water with my bonny bands again. When the flower is in the bud, and the leaf upon the tree, the lark shall sing me hame to my ain country. There was a burst of applause, and a deep silence, which was even more eloquent than the applause. It was of such a kind that the snapping of a pipe-stem too long for him by old Solomon Longways, who was one of those gathered at the shady end of the room, seemed a harsh and irreverent act. Then the ventilator in the window-pane spasmodically started off for a new spin, and the pathos of Donald's song was temporarily effaced. "'Twas not amiss, not at all amiss," muttered Christopher Coney, who was also present and removing his pipe a finger's breadth from his lips he said aloud draw on with the next verse young gentleman please yes let's have it again stranger said the glazier a stout bucket-headed man with a white apron rolled up round his waist folks don't lift up their hearts like that in this part of the world and turning aside he said in undertones who is the young man scotch do you say yes straight from the mountains of scotland i believe replied coney young farfrae repeated the last verse it was plain that nothing so pathetic had been heard at the three mariners for a considerable time the difference of accent the excitability of the singer the intense local feeling and the seriousness with which he worked himself up to a climax surprised this set of worthies who were only too prone to shut up their emotions with caustic words. "'Danged if our country down here is worth singing about like that,' continued the glazier, as the Scotchman again melodized with a dying fall, "'My ain country.' "'When you take away from among us the fools and the rogues and the lamigers and the wanton hussies and the slatterns and such like, there's cussed few left to ornament a song with in Casterbridge or the country round.' true said buzford the dealer looking at the grain of the table casterbridge is a old hoary place o wickedness by all account tis recorded in history that we rebelled against the king one or two hundred years ago in the time of the romans and that lots of us was hanged on gallows hill and quartered and our different giants sent about the country like butcher's meat and for my part i can well believe it what did ye come away from your own country for, young maister, if ye be so wounded about it? inquired Christopher Coney from the background, with the tone of a man who preferred the original subject. Faith, it wasn't worth your while in our account, for as Maister Billy Wills says, we be bruckle folk here, the best o' us hardly honest sometimes, what with hard winters and so many mouths to fill, and God Almighty sending his little taties so terrible small to fill em with. We don't think about flowers and fair faces, not we, except in the shape of collie flowers and pig's chaps. But no, said Donald Farfray, gazing round into their faces with earnest concern, the best of ye hardly honest? Not that, surely. None of ye has been stealing what didn't belong to him. Lord, no, no, said Solomon Longways, smiling grimly. That's only his random way of speaking. A was always such a man of underthoughts. 
and reprovingly towards Christopher, don't ye be so over-familiar with a gentleman that ye know nothing of, and that's travelled almost from the North Pole. Christopher Coney was silenced, and as he could get no public sympathy, he mumbled his feelings to himself. Be dazed if I loved my country half as well as the young feller do, I'd live by cleaning my neighbor's pigsties afore I'd go away. For my part, I've no more love for my country than I have for Botany Bay. Come, said Longways, let the young man draw onward with his ballot, or we shall be here all night. That's all of it, said the singer apologetically. Soul of my body, then we'll have another, said the general dealer. Can you turn a strain to the ladies, sir? inquired a fat woman with a figured purple apron, the waist-string of which was overhung so far by her sides as to be invisible. Let him breathe, let him breathe, Mother Cuxom. He ain't got his second wind yet, said the master glazier. Oh, yes, but I have, exclaimed the young man, and he at once rendered O oh, Nanny with faultless modulations, and another or two of the like sentiment, winding up at their earnest request with Auld Lang Syne. By this time he had completely taken possession of the hearts of the three mariners' inmates, including even old Coney. Notwithstanding an occasional odd gravity which awoke their sense of the ludicrous for the moment, they began to view him through a golden haze which the tone of his mind seemed to raise around him. Casterbridge had sentiment, Casterbridge had romance, but this stranger's sentiment was of differing quality. Or rather, perhaps, the difference was mainly superficial. He was to them like the poet of a new school, who takes his contemporaries by storm, who is not really new, but is the first to articulate what all his listeners have felt, though but dumbly, till then. The silent landlord came and leant over the settle while the young man sang, and even Mrs. Stanage managed to unstick herself from the framework of her chair in the bar and get as far as the doorpost, which movement she accomplished by rolling herself round as a cask is trundled on the sheen by a drayman without losing much of its perpendicular. "'And are you going to bide in Casterbridge, sir?' she asked. "'Ah, no,' said the Scotchman, with melancholy fatality in his voice. "'I'm only passing Thoreau. I am on my way to Bristol, and on fray there to foreign parts.' We be truly sorry to hear it, said Solomon Longways. We can ill afford to lose tuneful wine pipes like yours when they fall among us. And verily, to make acquaintance with a man a come from so far, from the land of perpetual snow, as we may say, where wolves and wild boars and other dangerous animalcules be as common as blackbirds hereabout, why, tis a thing we can't do every day, and there's good sound information for bided homes like we when such a man opens his mouth. Nay, but ye mistake my country, said the young man, looking round upon them with tragic fixity, till his eye lighted up and his cheek kindled with a sudden enthusiasm to right their errors. There are not perpetual snow and wolves at all in it, except snow in winter, and— well, a little in summer, just sometimes, and a gabberlunzie or two stalking about here and there, if you may call them dangerous. Eh, but you should take a summer journey to Edinburgh and Arthur's Seat and all around there, and then go on to the lochs and all the highland scenery in May and June, and you would never say tis the land of wolves and perpetual snow. Of course not, it stands to reason, said Buzford. "'Tis barren ignorance that leads to such words. "'He's a simple homespun man that never was fit for good company. "'Think nothing of him, sir.' "'And do ye carry your flock-bed and your quilt and your crock and your bit of chiny, "'or do ye go and bear bones, as I may say?' inquired Christopher Coney. "'I've sent on my luggage, though it isn't much, for the voyage is long.' "'Donald's eyes dropped into a remote gaze as he added, but I said to myself, never a one of the prizes of life will I come by unless I undertake it, and I decided to go. A general sense of regret, in which Elizabeth Jane shared not least, made itself apparent in the company. As she looked at Farfrae from the back of the settle, she decided that his statements showed him to be no less thoughtful than his fascinating melodies revealed him to be cordial and impassioned. 
she admired the serious light in which he looked at serious things he had seen no jest in ambiguities and roguery as the casterbridge tosspots had done and rightly not there was none she disliked those wretched humours of christopher coney and his tribe and he did not appreciate them he seemed to feel exactly as she felt about life and its surroundings that they were a tragical rather than a comical thing that though one could be gay on occasion moments of gaiety were interludes and no part of the actual drama it was extraordinary how similar their views were though it was still early the young scotchman expressed his wish to retire whereupon the landlady whispered to elizabeth to run upstairs and turn down his bed she took a candlestick and proceeded on her mission which was the act of a few moments only when candle in hand she reached the top of the stairs on her way down again mr farfrae was at the foot coming up she could not very well retreat they met and passed in the turn of the staircase she must have appeared interesting in some way notwithstanding her plain dress or rather possibly in consequence of it for she was a girl characterized by earnestness and soberness of mien with which simple drapery accorded well her face flushed too at the slight awkwardness of the meeting and she passed him with her eyes bent on the candle flame that she carried just below her nose thus it happened that when confronting her he smiled and then with the manner of a temporarily light-hearted man who has started himself on a flight of song whose momentum he cannot readily check he softly tuned an old ditty that she seemed to suggest as i came in by my bower door as day was waxen weary Wa came tripping down the stair but bonny peg my dearie elizabeth jane rather disconcerted hastened on and the scotchman's voice died away humming more of the same within the closed door of his room here the scene and sentiment ended for the present when soon after the girl rejoined her mother the latter was still in thought on quite another matter than a young man's song we've made a mistake she whispered that the scotchman might not overhear on no account ought ye to have helped serve here to-night not because of ourselves but for the sake of him if he should befriend us and take us up and then find out what you did when staying here twould grieve and wound his natural pride as mayor of the town elizabeth who would perhaps have been more alarmed at this than her mother had she known the real relationship was not much disturbed about it as things stood her he was another man than her poor mother's for myself she said i didn't at all mind waiting a little upon him he's so respectable and educated far above the rest of em in the inn they thought him very simple not to know their grim broad way of talking about themselves here but of course he didn't know he was too refined in his mind to know such things thus she earnestly pleaded meanwhile the he of her mother was not so far away as even they thought after leaving the three mariners he had sauntered up and down the empty high street passing and repassing the inn in his promenade when the scotchman sang his voice had reached henchard's ears through the heart-shaped holes in the window shutters and had led him to pause outside them a long while to be sure to be sure how that fellow does draw me he had said to himself i suppose tis because i'm so lonely i'd have given him a third share in the business to have stayed end of chapter eight chapter nine of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter nine when elizabeth jane opened the hinged casement next morning the mellow air brought in the feel of imminent autumn almost as distinctly as if she had been in the remotest hamlet casterbridge was the complement of the rural life around not its urban opposite bees and butterflies in the cornfields at the top of the town who desired to get to the meads at the bottom took no circuitous course but flew straight down high street without any apparent consciousness that they were traversing strange latitudes 
and in autumn airy spheres of thistledown floated into the same street lodged upon the shop fronts blew into drains and innumerable tawny and yellow leaves skimmed along the pavement and stole through people's doorways into their passages with a hesitating scratch on the floor like the skirts of timid visitors hearing voices one of which was close at hand she withdrew her head and glanced from behind the window curtains mr henchard now habited no longer as a great personage but as a thriving man of business was pausing on his way up the middle of the street and the scotchman was looking from the window adjoining her own henchard it appeared had gone a little way past the inn before he had noticed his acquaintance of the previous evening he came back a few steps donald farfrae opening the window further and you are off soon i suppose said henchard upwards yes almost this moment sir said the other maybe i'll walk on till the coach makes up on me which way the way ye are going then shall we walk together to the top of town if you'll wait a minute said the scotchman in a few minutes the latter emerged bag in hand henchard looked at the bag as at an enemy it showed there was no mistake about the young man's departure ah my lad he said you should have been a wise man and have stayed with me yes yes it might have been wiser said donald looking microscopically at the houses that were furthest off it is only telling ye the truth when i say my plans are vague they had by this time passed on from the precincts of the inn and elizabeth jane heard no more she saw that they continued in conversation henchard turning to the other occasionally and emphasizing some remark with a gesture thus they passed the king's arms hotel the market-house st peter's churchyard wall ascending to the upper end of the long street till they were small as two grains of corn when they bent suddenly to the right into the bristol road and were out of view he was a good man and he's gone she said to herself i was nothing to him and there was no reason why he should have wished me good-bye the simple thought with its latent sense of slight had moulded itself out of the following little fact when the scotchman came out at the door he had by accident glanced up at her and then he had looked away again without nodding or smiling or saying a word you are still thinking mother she said when she turned inwards yes i am thinking of mr henchard's sudden liking for that young man he was always so now surely if he takes so warmly to people who are not related to him at all may he not take as warmly to his own kin while they debated this question a procession of five large wagons went past laden with hay up to the bedroom windows they came in from the country and the steaming horses had probably been travelling a great part of the night to the shaft of each hung a little board on which was painted in white letters henchard corn factor and hay merchant the spectacle renewed his wife's conviction that for her daughter's sake she should strain a point to rejoin him the discussion was continued during breakfast and the end of it was that mrs henchard decided for good or for ill to send elizabeth jane with a message to henchard to the effect that his relative susan a sailor's widow was in the town leaving it to him to say whether or not he would recognize her what had brought her to this determination were chiefly two things he had been described as a lonely widower and he had expressed shame for a past transaction of his life there was promise in both if he says no she enjoined as elizabeth jane stood bonnet on ready to depart if he thinks it does not become the good position he has reached to in the town to own to let us call on him as his distant kinfolk say then sir we would rather not intrude we will leave casterbridge as quietly as we have come and go back to our own country i almost feel that i would rather he did say so as i have not seen him for so many years and we are so little allied to him and if he say yes inquired the more sanguine one in that case answered mrs henchard cautiously ask him to write me a note saying when and how he will see us or me elizabeth jane went a few steps towards the landing 
and tell him continued her mother that i fully know i have no claim upon him that i am glad to find he is thriving that i hope his life may be long and happy there go thus with a half-hearted willingness a smothered reluctance did the poor forgiving woman start her unconscious daughter on this errand it was about ten o'clock and market-day when elizabeth paced up the high street in no great hurry for to herself her position was only that of a poor relation deputed to hunt up a rich one the front doors of the private houses were mostly left open at this warm autumn time no thought of umbrella stealers disturbing the minds of the placid burgesses hence through the long straight entrance passages thus unclosed could be seen as through tunnels the mossy gardens at the back glowing with nasturtiums fuchsias scarlet geraniums bloody warriors snapdragons and dahlias this floral blaze being backed by crusted grey stonework remaining from a yet remoter casterbridge than the venerable one visible in the street the old-fashioned fronts of these houses which had older than old-fashioned backs rose sheer from the pavement into which the bow-windows protruded like bastions necessitating a pleasing chasse de chasse movement to the time-breast pedestrian at every few yards he was bound also to evolve other terpsichorean figures in respect of doorsteps scrapers cellar hatches church buttresses and the overhanging angles of walls which originally unobtrusive had become bow-legged and knock-kneed in addition to these fixed obstacles which spoke so cheerfully of individual unrestraint as to boundaries movables occupied the path and roadway to a perplexing extent first the vans of the carriers in and out of casterbridge who hailed from mellstock weatherbury the hintocks shirton abbas kingsbeer overcombe and many other towns and villages round their owners were numerous enough to be regarded as a tribe and had almost distinctiveness enough to be regarded as a race their vans had just arrived and were drawn up on each side of the street in close file so as to form at places a wall between the pavement and the roadway moreover every shop pitched out half its contents upon trestles and boxes on the curb extending the display each week a little further and further into the roadway despite the expostulations of the two feeble old constables until there remained but a tortuous defile for carriages down the centre of the street which afforded fine opportunities for skill with the reins over the pavement on the sunny side of the way hung shop blinds so constructed as to give the passenger's hat a smart buffet off his head as from the unseen hands of cranstown's goblin page celebrated in romantic lore horses for sale were tied in rows their forelegs on the pavement their hind legs in the street in which position they occasionally nipped little boys by the shoulder who were passing to school and any inviting recess in front of a house that had been modestly kept back from the general line was utilized by pig-dealers as a pen for their stock the yeomen farmers dairymen and townsfolk who came to transact business in these ancient streets spoke in other ways than by articulation not to hear the words of your interlocutor in metropolitan centres is to know nothing of his meaning here the face the arms the hat the stick the body throughout spoke equally with the tongue to express satisfaction the casterbridge market-man added to his utterance a broadening of the cheeks a crevicing of the eyes a throwing back of the shoulders which was intelligible from the other end of the street if he wondered though all henchard's carts and wagons were rattling past him you knew it from perceiving the inside of his crimson mouth and a target-like circling of his eyes deliberation caused sundry attacks on the moss of adjoining walls with the end of his stick a change of his hat from the horizontal to the less so a sense of tediousness announced itself in a lowering of the person by spreading the knees to a lozenge-shaped aperture and contorting the arms chicanery subterfuge had hardly a place in the streets of this honest borough to all appearance and it was said that the lawyers in the courthouse hard by occasionally threw in strong arguments for the other side out of pure generosity though apparently by mischance when advancing their own 
Thus Casterbridge was in most respects but the pole, focus, or nerve knot of the surrounding country life, differing from the many manufacturing towns which are as foreign bodies set down like boulders on a plain in a green world with which they have nothing in common. Casterbridge lived by agriculture at one remove further from the fountainhead than the adjoining villages, no more. The townsfolk understood every fluctuation in the rustic's condition, for it affected their receipts as much as the laborers. They entered into the troubles and joys which moved the aristocratic families ten miles around for the same reason, and even at the dinner parties of the professional families the subjects of discussion were corn, cattle disease, sowing and reaping, fencing and planting, while politics were viewed by them less from their own standpoint of burgesses with rights and privileges than from the standpoint of their country neighbors. All the venerable contrivances and confusions which delighted the eye by their quaintness, and in a measure reasonableness in this rare old market town, were metropolitan novelties to the unpractised eyes of Elizabeth Jane, fresh from netting fish seines in a seaside cottage. Very little inquiry was necessary to guide her footsteps. Henchard's house was one of the best, faced with dull red and grey old brick. The front door was open, and, as in other houses, she could see through the passage to the end of the garden, nearly a quarter of a mile off. Mr. Henchard was not in the house, but in the story-yard. She was conducted into the mossy garden, and through a door in the wall, which was studded with rusty nails, speaking of generations of fruit-trees that had been trained there. The door opened upon the yard, and here she was left to find him as she could. It was a place flanked by hay-barns, into which tons of fodder, all in trusses, were being packed from the wagons she had seen pass the inn that morning. On other sides of the yard were wooden granaries on stone staddles to which access was given by Flemish ladders and a storehouse several floors high. Wherever the doors of these places were open, a closely packed throng of bursting wheat sacks could be seen standing inside, with the air of awaiting a famine that would not come. She wandered about this place, uncomfortably conscious of the impending interview, till she was quite weary of searching. She ventured to inquire of a boy in what quarter Mr. Henchard could be found. He directed her to an office which she had not seen before, and knocking at the door she was answered by a cry of, Come in! Elizabeth turned the handle, and there stood before her, bending over some sample bags on a table, not the corn merchant, but the young Scotchman, Mr. Farfray, in the act of pouring some grains of wheat from one hand to the other. His hat hung on a peg behind him, and the roses of his carpet-bag glowed from the corner of the room. Having toned her feelings and arranged words on her lips for Mr. Henchard, and for him alone, she was for the moment confounded. "'Yes, what is it?' said the Scotchman, like a man who permanently ruled there. She said she wanted to see Mr. Henchard. "'Ah, yes, will you wait a minute? He is engaged just now.' said the young man, apparently not recognizing her as the girl at the inn. He handed her a chair, bade her sit down, and turned to his sample-bags again. While Elizabeth Jane sits waiting in great amaze at the young man's presence, we may briefly explain how he came there. When the two new acquaintances had passed out of sight that morning towards the Bath and Bristol Road, they went on silently, except for a few commonplaces, till they had gone down an avenue on the town walls called the Chalk Walk, leading to an angle where the north and west escarpments met. From this high corner of the square earthworks a vast extent of country could be seen. A footpath ran steeply down the green slope, conducting from the shady promenade on the walls to a road at the bottom of the scarp. It was by this path the Scotchman had to descend. "'Well, here's success to ye,' said Henchard, holding out his right hand and leaning with his left upon the wicket which protected the descent. In the act there was the inelegance of one whose feelings are nipped and wishes defeated. I shall often think of this time and of how you came at the very moment to throw a light upon my difficulty. Still holding the young man's hand, he paused, and then added deliberately, 
now i am not the man to let a cause be lost for want of a word and before ye are gone for ever i'll speak once more will ye stay there it is flat and plain you can see that it isn't all selfishness that makes me pressy for my business is not quite so scientific as to require an intellect entirely out of the common others would do for the place without doubt some selfishness perhaps there is but there is more it isn't for me to repeat what come bide with me and name your own terms i'll agree to him willingly and without a word of gainsaying for hang it farfrae i like thee well the young man's hand remained steady in henchard's for a moment or two he looked over the fertile country that stretched beneath them then backward along the shaded walk reaching to the top of the town his face flushed i never expected this i did not he said it's providence should any one go against it no i'll not go to america i'll stay and be your man his hand which had lain lifeless in henchard's returned the latter's grasp done said henchard done said donald farfrae the face of mr henchard beamed forth a satisfaction that was almost fierce in its strength now you are my friend he exclaimed come back to my house let's clinch it at once by clear terms so as to be comfortable in our minds farfrae caught up his bag and retraced the northwest avenue in henchard's company as he had come henchard was all confidence now i am the most distant fellow in the world when i don't care for a man he said but when a man takes my fancy he takes it strong now i am sure you can eat another breakfast you couldn't have eaten much so early even if they had anything at that place to give thee which they hadn't so come to my house and we will have a solid staunch tuck-in and settle terms in black and white if you like though my words my bond i can always make a good meal in the morning i've got a splendid cold pigeon pie going just now you can have some home-brewed if you want to you know it is too early in the morning for that said farfrae with a smile well of course i didn't know i don't drink it because of my oath but i am obliged to brew it for my workpeople thus talking they returned and entered henchard's premises by the back way or traffic entrance here the matter was settled over the breakfast at which henchard heaped the young scotchman's plate to a prodigal fullness he would not rest satisfied till farfrae had written for his luggage from bristol and dispatched the letter to the post office when it was done this man of strong impulses declared that his new friend should take up his abode in his house at least till some suitable lodgings could be found he then took farfrae around and showed him the place and the stores of grain and other stock and finally entered the offices where the younger of them has already been discovered by elizabeth end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Ten. While she still sat under the Scotchman's eyes, a man came up to the door, reaching it as Henshard opened the door of the inner office to admit Elizabeth. The newcomer stepped forward like the quicker cripple at Bethesda and entered in her stead. She could hear his words to Henshard joshua jopp sir by appointment the new manager the new manager he's in his office said henchard bluntly in his office said the man with a stultified air i mentioned thursday said henchard and as you did not keep your appointment i have engaged another manager at first i thought he must be you do you think i can wait when business is in question you said thursday or saturday sir said the newcomer pulling out a letter well you are too late said the corn factor i can say no more you as good as engaged me murmured the man subject to an interview said henchard i am sorry for you very sorry indeed but it can't be helped there was no more to be said and the man came out encountering elizabeth jane in his passage she could see that his mouth twitched with anger and that bitter disappointment was written in his face everywhere elizabeth jane now entered and stood before the master of the premises his dark pupils which always seemed to have a red spark of light in them though this could hardly be a physical fact 
turned indifferently round under his dark brows until they rested on her figure. "'Now, then, what is it, my young woman?' he said blandly. "'Can I speak to you not on business, sir?' said she. "'Yes, I suppose.' He looked at her more thoughtfully. "'I am sent to tell you, sir,' she innocently went on, "'that a distant relative of yours by marriage, Susan Newson, a sailor's widow, is in the town, and to ask whether you would wish to see her.' The rich rouge et noir of his countenance underwent a slight change. Oh, Susan is still alive, he asked with difficulty. Yes, sir. Are you her daughter? Yes, sir, her only daughter. What do you call yourself, your Christian name? Elizabeth Jane, sir. Newson? Elizabeth Jane Newson. This at once suggested to Henchard that the transaction of his early married life at Waden Fair was unrecorded in the family history. It was more than he could have expected. His wife had behaved kindly to him in return for his unkindness, and had never proclaimed her wrong to her child or to the world. "'I am a good deal interested in your news,' he said. "'And as this is not a matter of business, but pleasure,' suppose we go indoors it was with a gentle delicacy of manner surprising to elizabeth that he showed her out of the office and through the outer room where donald farfrae was overhauling bins and samples with the inquiring inspection of a beginner in charge henchard preceded her through the door in the wall to the suddenly changed scene of the garden and flowers and onward into the house the dining-room to which he introduced her still exhibited the remnants of the lavish breakfast laid for Farfray. It was furnished to profusion with heavy mahogany furniture of the deepest red Spanish hues, Pembroke tables, with leaves hanging so low that they well-nigh touched the floor, stood against the walls on legs and feet shaped like those of an elephant, and on one lay three huge folio volumes, a family Bible a josephus and a whole duty of man in the chimney corner was a fire grate with a fluted semicircular back having urns and festoons cast in relief thereon and the chairs were of the kind which since that day has cast lustre upon the names of chippendale and sheraton though in point of fact their patterns may have been such as those illustrious carpenters never saw or heard of sit down elizabeth jane sit down he said with a shake in his voice as he uttered her name and sitting down himself he allowed his hands to hang between his knees while he looked upon the carpet your mother then is quite well she is rather worn out sir with travelling a sailor's widow when did he die father was lost last spring henchard winced at the word father thus applied do you and she come from abroad, America or Australia? he asked. No, we have been in England some years. I was twelve when we came here from Canada. Ah, exactly. By such conversation he discovered the circumstances which had enveloped his wife and her child in such total obscurity that he had long ago believed them to be in their graves. These things being clear, he returned to the present. And where is your mother staying? At the Three Mariners. And you are her daughter, Elizabeth Jane, repeated Henchard. He arose, came close to her, and glanced in her face. I think, he said, suddenly turning away with a wet eye, you shall take a note from me to your mother. I should like to see her. She is not left very well off by her late husband. His eye fell on Elizabeth's clothes which, though a respectable suit of black and her very best, were decidedly old-fashioned even to Casterbridge eyes. Not very well, she said, glad that he had divined this without her being obliged to express it. He sat down at the table and wrote a few lines, next taking from his pocket-book a five-pound note, which he put in the envelope with the letter, adding to it, as by an afterthought, five shillings. 
sealing the hole up carefully he directed it to mrs newson three mariners inn and handed the packet to elizabeth deliver it to her personally please said henchard well i am glad to see you here elizabeth jane very glad we must have a long talk together but not just now he took her hand at parting and held it so warmly that she who had known so little friendship was much affected and tears rose to her aerial gray eyes the instant that she was gone henchard's state showed itself more distinctly having shut the door he sat in his dining-room stiffly erect gazing at the opposite wall as if he read his history there begad he suddenly exclaimed jumping up i didn't think of that perhaps these are impostors and susan and the child dead after all however a something in elizabeth jane soon assured him that as regarded her at least there could be little doubt and a few hours would settle the question of her mother's identity for he had arranged in his note to see her that evening it never rains but it pours said henchard his keenly excited interest in his new friend the scotchman was now eclipsed by this event and donald farfrae saw so little of him during the rest of the day that he wondered at the suddenness of his employer's moods in the meantime elizabeth had reached the inn her mother instead of taking the note with the curiosity of a poor woman expecting assistance was much moved at sight of it she did not read it at once asking elizabeth to describe her reception and the very words mr henchard used elizabeth's back was turned when her mother opened the letter it ran thus meet me at eight o'clock this evening if you can at the ring on the budmouth road the place is easy to find i can say no more now the news upsets me almost the girl seems to be in ignorance keep her so till i have seen you m h he said nothing about the enclosure of five guineas the amount was significant it may tacitly have said to her that he bought her back again she waited restlessly for the close of the day telling elizabeth jane that she was invited to see mr henchard that she would go alone but she said nothing to show that the place of meeting was not at his house nor did she hand the note to Elizabeth. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Bruce Peary。Chapter 11 The Ring at Casterbridge was merely the local name of one of the finest Roman amphitheatres, if not the very finest, remaining in Britain. Casterbridge announced Old Rome in every street, alley, and precinct. It looked Roman, bespoke the art of Rome, concealed dead men of Rome. It was impossible to dig more than a foot or two deep about the town fields and gardens, without coming upon some tall soldier or other of the empire, who had lain there in his silent unobtrusive rest for a space of fifteen hundred years. He was mostly found lying on his side, in an oval scoop in the chalk, like a chicken in its shell, his knees drawn up to his chest, sometimes with the remains of his spear against his arm, a fibula or brooch of bronze on his breast or forehead, an urn at his knees, a jar at his throat, a bottle at his mouth, and mystified conjecture pouring down upon him from the eyes of Casterbridge street boys and men, who had turned a moment to gaze at the familiar spectacle as they passed by. Imaginative inhabitants, who would have felt an unpleasantness at the discovery of a comparatively modern skeleton in their gardens, were quite unmoved by these hoary shapes. They had lived so long ago, their time was so unlike the present, their hopes and motives were so widely removed from ours, that between them and the living there seemed to stretch a gulf too wide for even a spirit to pass. The amphitheatre was a huge circular enclosure, with a notch at opposite extremities of its diameter north and south. 
from its sloping internal form it might have been called the spittoon of the jotuns it was to casterbridge what the ruined Colosseum is to modern rome and was nearly of the same magnitude the dusk of evening was the proper hour at which a true impression of this suggestive place could be received standing in the middle of the arena at that time there by degrees became apparent its real vastness which a cursory view from the summit at noonday was apt to obscure melancholy impressive lonely yet accessible from every part of the town the historic circle was the frequent spot for appointments of a furtive kind intrigues were arranged there tentative meetings were there experimented after divisions and feuds but one kind of appointment in itself the most common of any seldom had place in the amphitheatre that of happy lovers why seeing that it was pre-eminently an airy accessible and sequestered spot for interviews the cheerfullest form of those occurrences never took kindly to the soil of the ruin would be a curious inquiry perhaps it was because its associations had about them something sinister its history proved that apart from the sanguinary nature of the games originally played therein such incidents attached to its past as these that for scores of years the town gallows had stood at one corner that in seventeen o five a woman who had murdered her husband was half strangled and then burnt there in the presence of ten thousand spectators tradition reports that at a certain stage of the burning her heart burst and leapt out of her body to the terror of them all and that not one of those ten thousand people ever cared particularly for hot roast after that in addition to these old tragedies pugilistic encounters almost to the death had come off down to recent dates in that secluded arena entirely invisible to the outside world save by climbing to the top of the enclosure which few townspeople in the daily round of their lives ever took the trouble to do so that though close to the turnpike road crimes might be perpetrated there unseen at midday some boys had latterly tried to impart gaiety to the ruin by using the central arena as a cricket ground but the game usually languished for the aforesaid reason the dismal privacy which the earthen circle enforced shutting out every appreciative passer's vision every commendatory remark from outsiders everything except the sky and to play at games in such circumstances was like acting to an empty house possibly too the boys were timid for some old people said that at certain moments in the summer time in broad daylight persons sitting with a book or dozing in the arena had on lifting their eyes beheld the slopes lined with a gazing legion of hadrian's soldiery as if watching the gladiatorial combat and had heard the roar of their excited voices that the scene would remain but a moment like a lightning flash and then disappear it was related that there still remained under the south entrance excavated cells for the reception of the wild animals and athletes who took part in the games the arena was still smooth and circular as if used for its original purpose not so very long ago the sloping pathways by which spectators had ascended to their seats were pathways yet but the whole was grown over with grass which now at the end of summer was bearded with withered bents that formed waves under the brush of the wind returning to the attentive ear aeolian modulations and detaining for moments the flying globes of thistledown henchard had chosen this spot as being the safest from observation which he could think of for meeting his long-lost wife and at the same time as one easily to be found by a stranger after nightfall as mayor of the town with a reputation to keep up he could not invite her to come to his house till some definite course had been decided on just before eight he approached the deserted earthwork and entered by the south path which descended over the debris of the former dens in a few moments he could discern a female figure creeping in by the great north gap or public gateway they met in the middle of the arena neither spoke just at first there was no necessity for speech and the poor woman leant against henchard who supported her in his arms 
I don't drink, he said in a low, halting, apologetic voice. You hear, Susan? I don't drink now. I haven't since that night. Those were his first words. He felt her bow her head in acknowledgment that she understood. After a minute or two he again began. If I had known you were living, Susan, but there was every reason to suppose you and the child were dead and gone. I took every possible step to find you, travelled, advertised. My opinion at last was that you had started for some colony with that man and had been drowned on your voyage. Why did you keep silent like this? Oh, Michael, because of him! What other reason could there be? I thought I owed him faithfulness to the end of one of our lives. Foolishly I believed there was something solemn and binding in the bargain. I thought that even in honor I dared not desert him when he had paid so much for me in good faith. I meet you now only as his widow. I consider myself that, and that I have no claim upon you. Had he not died I should never have come. Never. Of that you may be sure. How could you be so simple? I don't know. Yet it would have been very wicked if I had not thought like that, said Susan, almost crying. Yes, yes, so it would. It is only that which makes me feel ye an innocent woman. But to lead me into this. What, Michael? she asked, alarmed. Why, this difficulty about our living together again, and Elizabeth Jane. She cannot be told all. She would so despise us both that— I could not bear it. That was why she was brought up in ignorance of you. I could not bear it either. Well, we must talk of a plan for keeping her in her present belief, and getting matters straight in spite of it. You have heard I am in a large way of business here, that I am mayor of the town and churchwarden and I don't know what all. Yes, she murmured. These things, as well as the dread of the girl discovering our disgrace, makes it necessary to act with extreme caution, so that I don't see how you two can return openly to my house as the wife and daughter I once treated badly and banished from me, and there's the rub of it. We'll go away at once. I only came to see— No, no, Susan, you are not to go. You mistake me, he said with kindly severity. I have thought of this plan that you and Elizabeth take a cottage in the town as the widow Mrs. Newson and her daughter, that I meet you, court you, and marry you, Elizabeth Jane coming to my house as my stepdaughter. The thing is so natural and easy that it is half done in thinking of it. This would leave my shady, headstrong, disgraceful life as a young man absolutely unopened. The secret would be yours and mine only. I should have the pleasure of seeing my own only child under my roof, as well as my wife. I am quite in your hands, Michael, she said meekly. I came here for the sake of Elizabeth. For myself, if you tell me to leave again tomorrow morning and never come near you more, I am content to go. Now, now, we don't want to hear that, said Henchard gently. Of course you won't leave again. Think over the plan I have proposed for a few hours, and if you can't hit upon a better one, we'll adopt it. I have to be away for a day or two on business, unfortunately, but during that time you can get lodgings. The only ones in the town fit for you are those over the china shop in High Street, and you can also look for a cottage. If the lodgings are in High Street, they are dear, I suppose. Never mind, you must start genteel if our plan is to be carried out. Look to me for money. Have you enough till I come back? Quite, said she. And are you comfortable at the inn? Oh, yes. And the girl is quite safe from learning the shame of her case and ours? That's what makes me most anxious of all. You would be surprised to find how unlikely she is to dream of the truth. How could she ever suppose such a thing? True. I like the idea of repeating our marriage, said Mrs. Henchard, after a pause. It seems the only right course after all this. Now I think I must go back to Elizabeth Jane and tell her that our kinsman, Mr. Henchard, kindly wishes us to stay in the town. Very well. Arrange that yourself. I'll go some way with you. No, no, don't run any risk, said his wife anxiously. I can find my way back. It is not late. Please let me go alone. Right, said Henchard, but 
just one word. Do you forgive me, Susan? She murmured something, but seemed to find it difficult to frame her answer. Never mind, all in good time, said he. Judge me by my future works. Goodbye. He retreated and stood at the upper side of the amphitheatre while his wife passed out through the lower way and descended under the trees to the town. Then Henchard himself went homeward, going so fast that by the time he reached his door he was almost upon the heels of the unconscious woman from whom he had just parted. He watched her up the street and turned into his house. End of chapter 11《ジャプト12》of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 12. On entering his own door after watching his wife out of sight, the mayor walked on through the tunnel-shaped passage into the garden, and thence by the back door towards the stores and granaries. A light shone from the office window, and there being no blind to screen the interior. Henchard could see Donald Farfrae still seated where he had left him, initiating himself into the managerial work of the house by overhauling the books. Henchard entered, merely observing, Don't let me interrupt you if you will stay so late. He stood behind Farfrae's chair, watching his dexterity in clearing up the numerical fogs which had been allowed to grow so thick in Henchard's books as almost to baffle even the Scotchman's perspicacity. The corn factor's mien was half admiring, and yet it was not without a dash of pity for the tastes of anyone who could care to give his mind to such finikin details. Henchard himself was mentally and physically unfit for grubbing subtleties from soiled paper. He had in a modern sense received the education of Achilles, and found penmanship a tantalizing art. "'You shall do no more to-night,' he said at length, spreading his great hand over the paper. "'There's time enough to-morrow. Come indoors with me and have some supper. Now you shall. I am determined on it.' he shut the account books with friendly force. Donald had wished to get to his lodgings, but he already saw that his friend and employer was a man who knew no moderation in his requests and impulses, and he yielded gracefully. He liked Henchard's warmth, even if it inconvenienced him, the great difference in their characters adding to the liking. They locked up the office, and the young man followed his companion through the private little door, which, admitting directly into Henchard's garden, permitted a passage from the utilitarian to the beautiful at one step. The garden was silent, dewy, and full of perfume. It extended a long way back from the house, first as lawn and flower beds, then as fruit garden, where the long-tied espaliers, as old as the old house itself, had grown so stout and cramped and gnarled that they had pulled their stakes out of the ground and stood distorted and writhing in vegetable agony, like leafy laocoans. The flowers which smelt so sweetly were not discernible, and they passed through them into the house. The hospitalities of the morning were repeated, and when they were over, Henchard said, Pull your chair round to the fireplace, my dear fellow and let's make a blaze. There's nothing I hate like a black grate, even in September. He applied a light to the laid-in fuel, and a cheerful radiance spread around. It is odd, said Henchard, that two men should meet as we have done on a purely business ground, and that at the end of the first day I should wish to speak to you on a family matter. But damn it all, I am a lonely man, Farfrae. I have nobody else to speak to, and why shouldn't I tell it to ye? I'll be glad to hear it if I can be of any service, said Donald, allowing his eyes to travel over the intricate wood carvings of the chimney piece, representing garlanded lyres, shields, and quivers, on either side of a draped ox skull, and flanked by heads of Apollo and Diana, in low relief. I've not been always what I am now, continued Henchard, his firm, deep voice being ever so little shaken. 
he was plainly under that strange influence which sometimes prompts men to confide to the new-found friend what they will not tell to the old i began life as a working hay trusser and when i was eighteen i married on the strength of my calling would you think me a married man i heard in the town that you were a widower ah yes you would naturally have heard that well i lost my wife nineteen years ago or so by my own fault this is how it came about one summer evening i was travelling for employment and she was walking at my side carrying the baby our only child we came to a booth in a country fair i was a drinking man at that time henchard paused a moment threw himself back so that his elbow rested on the table his forehead being shaded by his hand which however did not hide the marks of introspective inflexibility on his features as he narrated in fullest detail the incidents of the transaction with the sailor the tinge of indifference which had at first been visible in the scotchman now disappeared henchard went on to describe his attempts to find his wife the oath he swore the solitary life he led during the years which followed i have kept my oath for nineteen years he went on i have risen to what you see me now ay well no wife could i hear of in all that time and being by nature something of a woman-hater i have found it no hardship to keep mostly at a distance from the sex no wife could i hear of i say till this very day and now she has come back come back has she this morning this very morning and what's to be done can you no take her and live with her and make some amends that's what i've planned and proposed but far fray said henchart gloomily by doing right with susan i wrong another innocent woman you don't say that in the nature of things, Farfrae, it is almost impossible that a man of my sort should have the good fortune to tide through twenty years a life without making more blunders than one. It has been my custom for many years to run across to Jersey in the way of business, particularly in the potato and root season. I do a large trade with them in that line. Well, one autumn, when stopping there, I fell quite ill and in my illness i sank into one of those gloomy fits i sometimes suffer from on account of the loneliness of my domestic life when the world seems to have the blackness of hell and like job i could curse the day that gave me birth ah now i never feel like it said farfrae then pray to god that you never may young man while in this state i was taken pity on by a woman a young lady i should call her for she was of good family well-bred and well-educated the daughter of some harem scara military officer who had got into difficulties and had his pay sequestrated he was dead now and her mother too and she was as lonely as i this young creature was staying at the boarding-house where i happened to have my lodging and when i was pulled down she took upon herself to nurse me from that she got to have a foolish liking for me heaven knows why for i wasn't worth it but being together in the same house and her feeling warm we got naturally intimate i won't go into particulars of what our relations were it is enough to say that we honestly meant to marry there arose a scandal which did me no harm but was of course ruin to her though far fray between you and me as man and man I solemnly declare that philandering with womankind has neither been my vice nor my virtue. She was terribly careless of appearances, and I was perhaps more because of my dreary state. And it was through this that the scandal arose. At last I was well and came away. When I was gone she suffered much on my account, and didn't forget to tell me so in letters one after another till latterly i felt i owed her something and thought that as i had not heard of susan for so long i would make this other one the only return i could make and ask her if she would run the risk of susan being alive very slight as i believed and marry me such as i was she jumped for joy and we should no doubt soon have been married but behold susan appears 
Donald showed his deep concern at a complication so far beyond the degree of his simple experiences. Now see what injury a man may cause around him, even after that wrongdoing at the fair when I was young, if I had never been so selfish as to let this giddy girl devote herself to me over at Jersey, to the injury of her name, all might now be well. Yet, as it stands, I must bitterly disappoint one of these women, and it is the second. My first duty is to Susan, there's no doubt about that. They are both in a very melancholy position, and that's true, murmured Donald. They are. For myself I don't care. Twill all end one way, but these two. Henchard paused in reverie. I feel I should like to treat the second no less than the first, as kindly as a man can in such a case. Ah, oh, well, it cannot be helped, said the other with philosophic woefulness. You mun write to the young lady, and in your letter you must put it plain and honest that it turns out she cannot be your wife, the first having come back that she cannot see her more, and that ye wish her weel. That won't do. Odd sees it. I must do a little more than that. I must, though she did always brag about her rich uncle or rich aunt and her expectations from him, I must send a useful sum of money to her, I suppose, just as a little recompense, poor girl. Now, will you help me in this, and draw up an explanation to her of all I've told ye, breaking it as gently as you can? I'm so bad at letters. And I will. Now, I haven't told you quite all yet. My wife Susan has my daughter with her, the baby that was in her arms at the fair, and this girl knows nothing of me beyond that I am some sort of relation by marriage. She has grown up in the belief that the sailor to whom I made over her mother, and who is now dead, was her father, and her mother's husband. What her mother has always felt, she and I together feel now, that we can't proclaim our disgrace to the girl by letting her know the truth. Now, what would you do? I want your advice. I think I'd run the risk and tell her the truth. She'll forgive you both. Never, said Henchard. I am not going to let her know the truth. Her mother and I be going to marry again, and it will not only help us to keep our child's respect, but it will be more proper. Susan looks upon herself as the sailor's widow, and won't think of living with me as formerly without another religious ceremony, and she's right. Farfrae thereupon said no more. The letter to the young Jersey woman was carefully framed by him, and the interview ended. Henchard saying, as the Scotchman left, I feel it a great relief, Farfrae, to tell some friend of this. You see now that the mayor of Casterbridge is not so thriving in his mind as it seems he might be from the state of his pocket. I do, and I'm sorry for ye, said Farfrae. When he was gone, Henchard copied the letter, and, enclosing a check, took it to the post office, from which he walked back thoughtfully. Can it be that it will go off so easily, he said. Poor thing, God knows. Now then, to make amends to Susan. End of chapter 12recording by bruce peary chapter 13 the cottage which michael henchard hired for his wife susan under her name of newson in pursuance of their plan was in the upper or western part of the town near the roman wall and the avenue which overshadowed it the evening sun seemed to shine more yellowly there than anywhere else this autumn stretching its rays as the hours grew later under the lowest sycamore boughs, and steeping the ground floor of the dwelling with its green shutters in a substratum of radiance which the foliage screened from the upper parts. Beneath these sycamores on the town walls could be seen from the sitting-room the tumuli and earth forts of the distant uplands, making it altogether a pleasant spot, with the usual touch of melancholy that a past-marked prospect lends. 
as soon as the mother and daughter were comfortably installed with a white aproned servant and all complete henchard paid them a visit and remained to tea during the entertainment elizabeth was carefully hoodwinked by the very general tone of the conversation that prevailed a proceeding which seemed to afford some humor to henchard though his wife was not particularly happy in it the visit was repeated again and again with business-like determination by the mayor who seemed to have schooled himself into a course of strict mechanical rightness towards this woman of prior claim at any expense to the later one and to his own sentiments one afternoon the daughter was not indoors when henchard came and he said dryly this is a very good opportunity for me to ask you to name the happy day susan the poor woman smiled faintly she did not enjoy the pleasantries on a situation into which she had entered solely for the sake of her girl's reputation she liked them so little indeed that there was room for wonder why she had countenanced deception at all and had not bravely let the girl know her history but the flesh is weak and the true explanation came in due course oh michael she said i am afraid all this is taking up your time and giving trouble when i did not expect any such thing and she looked at him and at his dress as a man of affluence and at the furniture he had provided for the room ornate and lavish to her eyes not at all said henchard in rough benignity this is only a cottage it costs me next to nothing and as to taking up my time here his red and black visage kindled with satisfaction i've a splendid fellow to superintend my business now a man whose like i've never been able to lay hands on before i shall soon be able to leave everything to him and have more time to call my own than i've had for these last twenty years henchard's visits here grew so frequent and so regular that it soon became whispered and then openly discussed in casterbridge that the masterful coercive mayor of the town was raptured and enervated by the genteel widow mrs newson his well-known haughty indifference to the society of womankind his silent avoidance of converse with the sex contributed a piquancy to what would otherwise have been an unromantic matter enough that such a poor fragile woman should be his choice was inexplicable except on the ground that the engagement was a family affair in which sentimental passion had no place for it was known that they were related in some way mrs henchard was so pale that the boys called her the ghost sometimes henchard overheard this epithet when they passed together along the walks as the avenues on the walls were named at which his face would darken with an expression of destructiveness towards the speakers ominous to see but he said nothing he pressed on the preparations for his union or rather reunion with this pale creature in a dogged unflinching spirit which did credit to his conscientiousness nobody would have conceived from his outward demeanour that there was no amatory fire or pulse of romance acting as stimulant to the bustle going on in his gaunt great house nothing but three large resolves one to make amends to his neglected susan another to provide a comfortable home for elizabeth jane under his paternal eye and a third to castigate himself with the thorns which these restitutory acts brought in their train among them the lowering of his dignity in public opinion by marrying so comparatively humble a woman susan henchard entered a carriage for the first time in her life when she stepped into the plain brougham which drew up at the door on the wedding day to take her and elizabeth jane to church it was a windless morning of warm november rain which floated down like meal and lay in a powdery form on the nap of hats and coats few people had gathered round the church door though they were well packed within the scotchman who assisted as groomsman was of course the only one present beyond the chief actors who knew the true situation of the contracting parties 
he however was too inexperienced too thoughtful too judicial too strongly conscious of the serious side of the business to enter into the scene in its dramatic aspect that required the special genius of christopher coney solomon longways buzzford and their fellows but they knew nothing of the secret though as the time for coming out of church drew on they gathered on the pavement adjoining and expounded the subject according to their lights tis five and forty years since i had my settlement in this here town said coney but daze me if i ever see a man wait so long before to take so little there's a chance even for thee after this nance mockridge the remark was addressed to a woman who stood behind his shoulder the same who had exhibited henchard's bad bread in public when elizabeth and her mother entered casterbridge be cussed if i'd marry any such as he or thee either replied that lady as for thee christopher we know what ye be and the less said the better and as for he well there lowering her voice tis said a was a poor parish prentice i wouldn't say it for all the world but a was a poor parish prentice that began life with no more belonging to him than a carrion crow and now he's worth ever so much a minute murmured longways when a man is said to be worth so much a minute he's a man to be considered turning he saw a circular disc reticulated with creases and recognized the smiling countenance of the fat woman who had asked for another song at the three mariners well mother cuxom he said how's this here's mrs newson a mere skeleton has got another husband to keep her while a woman of your tonnage have not i have not nor another to beat me ah yes cuxom's gone and so shall leather breeches yes with the blessing of god leather breeches shall go tisn't worth my old while to think of another husband continued mrs cuxom and yet i'll lay my life i'm as respectable born as she true your mother was a very good woman i can mind her she were rewarded by the agricultural society for having begot the greatest number of healthy children without parish assistance and other virtuous marvels twas that that kept us so low upon ground that great hungry family ay where the pigs be many the wash runs thin and dost not mind how mother would sing christopher continued mrs cuxom kindling at the retrospection and how we went with her to the party at melstock do ye mind at old dame ledlow's farmer shinar's aunt do ye mind she we used to call toadskin because her face were so yaller and freckled do ye mind i do <laughs> i too said christopher coney and well do i for i was getting up husband high at that time one half girl and t'other half woman as one may say and canst mind she prodded solomon's shoulder with her finger-tip while her eyes twinkled between the crevices of their lids canst mind the sherry wine and the silver snuffers and how joan dummett was took bad when we were coming home and jack griggs was forced to carry her through the mud and how i let her fall in dairyman sweet apples cowbarton and we had to clean her gown with grass never such a mess as they were in ay that i do he <laughs> such doggery as there was in them ancient days to be sure ah the miles i used to walk then and now i can hardly step over a furrow their reminiscences were cut short by the appearance of the reunited pair henchard looking round upon the idlers with that ambiguous gaze of his which at one moment seemed to mean satisfaction and at another fiery disdain well there's a difference between em though he do call himself a teetotaler said nance mockridge she'll wish her cake dough afore she's done of him there's a blue beardy look about en and twill out in time stuff he's well enough some folk want their luck buttered if i had a choice as wide as the ocean sea i wouldn't wish for a better man a poor twanking woman like her tis a godsend for her and hardly a pair of jumps or night rail to her name the plain little brougham drove off in the mist and the idlers dispersed well we hardly know how to look at things in these times said solomon 
there was a man dropped down dead yesterday not so very many miles from here and what with that and this moist weather tis scarce worth one's while to begin any work of consequence to-day i'm in such a low key with drinking nothing but small table ninepenny this last week or two that i shall call and warm up at the mariners as i pass along i don't know but that i may as well go with ye solomon said christopher i'm as clammy as a cockle snail End of chapter 13 chapter 14 of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter 14 a martinmas summer of mrs henchard's life set in with her entry into her husband's large house and respectable social orbit and it was as bright as such summers well can be lest she should pine for deeper affection than he could give he made a point of showing some semblance of it in external action among other things he had the iron railings that had smiled sadly in dull rust for the last eighty years painted a bright green and the heavy-barred small-paned georgian sash windows enlivened with three coats of white he was as kind to her as a man mayor and churchwarden could possibly be the house was large the rooms lofty and the landings wide and the two unassuming women scarcely made a perceptible addition to its contents to elizabeth jane the time was a most triumphant one the freedom she experienced the indulgence with which she was treated went beyond her expectations the reposeful easy affluent life to which her mother's marriage had introduced her was in truth the beginning of a great change in elizabeth she found she could have nice personal possessions and ornaments for the asking and as the medieval saying puts it take have and keep are pleasant words with peace of mind came development and with development beauty knowledge the result of great natural insight she did not lack learning accomplishment those alas she had not but as the winter and spring passed by her thin face and figure filled out in rounder and softer curves the lines and contractions upon her young brow went away the muddiness of skin which she had looked upon as her lot by nature departed with a change to abundance of good things and a bloom came upon her cheek perhaps too her grey thoughtful eyes revealed an arch gaiety sometimes but this was infrequent the sort of wisdom which looked from their pupils did not readily keep company with these lighter moods like all people who have known rough times light-heartedness seemed to her too irrational and inconsequent to be indulged in except as a reckless dram now and then for she had been too early habituated to anxious reasoning to drop the habit suddenly she felt none of those ups and downs of spirit which beset so many people without cause never to paraphrase a recent poet never a gloom in elizabeth jane's soul but she well knew how it came there and her present cheerfulness was fairly proportionate to her solid guarantees for the same it might have been supposed that given a girl rapidly becoming good-looking comfortably circumstanced and for the first time in her life commanding ready money she would go and make a fool of herself by dress but no the reasonableness of almost everything that elizabeth did was nowhere more conspicuous than in this question of clothes to keep in the rear of opportunity in matters of indulgence is as valuable a habit as to keep abreast of opportunity in matters of enterprise this unsophisticated girl did it by an innate perceptiveness that was almost genius thus she refrained from bursting out like a water-flower that spring and clothing herself in puffings and knick-knacks as most of the casterbridge girls would have done in her circumstances her triumph was tempered by circumspection she had still that field-mouse fear of the coulter of destiny despite fair promise which is common among the thoughtful who have suffered early from poverty and oppression 
I won't be too gay on any account, she would say to herself. It would be tempting Providence to hurl mother and me down, and afflict us again as he used to do. We now see her in a black silk bonnet, velvet mantle or silk spencer, dark dress and carrying a sunshade. In this latter article she drew the line at fringe, and had it plain-edged, with a little ivory ring for keeping it closed. It was odd about the necessity for that sunshade. She discovered that with the clarification of her complexion and the birth of pink cheeks, her skin had grown more sensitive to the sun's rays. She protected those cheeks forthwith, deeming spotlessness part of womanliness. Henchard had become very fond of her, and she went out with him more frequently than with her mother now. Her appearance one day was so attractive that he looked at her critically. I happened to have the ribbon by me, so I made it up, she faltered, thinking him perhaps dissatisfied with some rather bright trimming she had donned for the first time. Aye, of course, to be sure, he replied in his leonine way. Do as you like, or rather as your mother advises ye. Odd send I've nothing to say to it. Indoors she appeared with her hair divided by a parting that arched like a white rainbow from ear to ear. All in front of this line was covered with a thick encampment of curls. All behind was dressed smoothly and drawn to a knob. The three members of the family were sitting at breakfast one day, and Henchard was looking silently, as he often did, at this head of hair, which in color was brown, rather light than dark. I thought Elizabeth Jane's hair— didn't you tell me that Elizabeth Jane's hair promised to be black when she was a baby? he said to his wife. She looked startled, jerked his foot warningly, and murmured, Did I? As soon as Elizabeth was gone to her own room, Henchard resumed. Begad, I nearly forgot myself just now. What I meant was that the girl's hair certainly looked as if it would be darker when she was a baby. It did, but they alter so, replied Susan. Their hair gets darker, I know, but I wasn't aware it lightened ever. Oh, yes. And the same uneasy expression came out on her face, to which the future held the key. It passed as Henchard went on. Well, so much the better. Now, Susan, I want to have her called Miss Henchard, not Miss Newson. Lots of people do it already in carelessness. It is her legal name, so it may as well be made her usual name. I don't like t'other name at all for my own flesh and blood. I'll advertise it in the Casterbridge paper. That's the way they do it. She won't object. No, oh no, but— Well, then, I shall do it, he said peremptorily. Surely, if she's willing, you must wish it as much as I. Oh, yes, if she agrees, let us do it by all means, she replied. Then Mrs. Henchard acted somewhat inconsistently. It might have been called falsely, but that her manner was emotional and full of the earnestness of one who wishes to do right at great hazard. She went to Elizabeth Jane, whom she found sewing in her own sitting-room upstairs, and told her what had been proposed about her surname. "'Can you agree? Is it not a slight upon Newson, now he's dead and gone?' Elizabeth reflected. "'I'll think of it, mother,' she answered. When, later in the day, she saw Henchard, she adverted to the matter at once, in a way which showed that the line of feeling started by her mother had been persevered in. "'Do you wish this change so very much, sir?' she asked. "'Wish it? Why, my blessed fathers, what an ado you women make about a trifle! I proposed it, that's all. Now, Elizabeth Jane, just please yourself. Curse me if I care what you do.' Now, you understand, don't he go agreeing to it to please me? Here the subject dropped, and nothing more was said, and nothing was done, and Elizabeth still passed as Miss Newson, and not by her legal name. Meanwhile, the great corn and hay traffic conducted by Henchard throve under the management of Donald Farfray, as it had never thriven before. It had formerly moved in jolts, now it went on oiled casters. The old crude vivivace system of Henchard, in which everything depended upon his memory, and bargains were made by the tongue alone, 
was swept away. Letters and ledgers took the place of I'll do it and you shall hae it. And as in all such cases of advance, the rugged picturesqueness of the old method disappeared with its inconveniences. The position of Elizabeth Jane's room, rather high in the house so that it commanded a view of the hay stores and granaries across the garden, afforded her opportunity for accurate observation of what went on there. She saw that Donald and Mr. Henchard were inseparables. When walking together Henchard would lay his arm familiarly on his manager's shoulder, as if Farfrae were a younger brother, bearing so heavily that his slight frame bent under the weight. Occasionally she would hear a perfect cannonade of laughter from Henchard, arising from something Donald had said, the latter looking quite innocent and not laughing at all. In Henchard's somewhat lonely life he evidently found the young man as desirable for comradeship as he was useful for consultations. Donald's brightness of intellect maintained in the corn factor the admiration it had won at the first hour of their meeting. The poor opinion, and but ill-concealed, that he entertained of the slim Farfrae's physical girth, strength, and dash, was more than counterbalanced by the immense respect he had for his brains. Her quiet eye discerned that Henchard's tigerish affection for the younger man, his constant liking to have Farfrae near him, now and then resulted in a tendency to domineer which, however, was checked in a moment when Donald exhibited marks of real offence. One day, looking down on their figures from on high, she heard the latter remark, as they stood in the doorway between the garden and yard, that their habit of walking and driving about together rather neutralized Farfrae's value as a second pair of eyes, which should be used in places where the principal was not. "'Ah, damn it!' cried Henchard. "'What's all the world?' I like a fellow to talk to. Now come along and hae some supper, and don't take too much thought about things, or you'll drive me crazy. When she walked with her mother, on the other hand, she often beheld the Scotchman looking at them with a curious interest. The fact that he had met her at the Three Mariners was insufficient to account for it, since on the occasions on which she had entered his room he had never raised his eyes. Besides, it was at her mother, more particularly than at herself, that he looked, to Elizabeth Jane's half-conscious, simple-minded, perhaps pardonable, disappointment. Thus she could not account for this interest by her own attractiveness, and she decided that it might be apparent only, a way of turning his eyes that Mr. Farfrae had. She did not divine the ample explanation of his manner without personal vanity that was afforded by the fact of Donald being the depositary of Henchard's confidence in respect of his past treatment of the pale, chastened mother who walked by her side. Her conjectures on that past never went further than faint ones based on things casually heard and seen, mere guesses that Henchard and her mother might have been lovers in their younger days who had quarrelled and parted. Casterbridge, as has been hinted, was a place deposited in the block upon a cornfield. There was no suburb in the modern sense, or transitional intermixture of town and down. It stood, with regard to the wide fertile land adjoining, clean-cut and distinct, like a chessboard on a green tablecloth. The farmer's boy could sit under his barley mow and pitch a stone into the office window of the town clerk. Reapers at work among the sheaves nodded to acquaintances standing on the pavement corner. The red-robed judge, when he condemned a sheep-stealer, pronounced sentence to the tune of bah that floated in at the window from the remainder of the flock browsing hard by and at executions the waiting crowd stood in a meadow immediately before the drop, out of which the cows had been temporarily driven to give the spectators room. The corn grown on the upland side of the borough was garnered by farmers who lived in an eastern purlieu called Durnover. Here wheat ricks overhung the old Roman street, and thrust their eaves against the church tower green-thatched barns, with doorways as high as the gates of Solomon's temple, opened directly upon the main thoroughfare. 
Barns, indeed, were so numerous as to alternate with every half-dozen houses along the way. Here lived burgesses who daily walked the fallow, shepherds in an intramural squeeze. A street of farmers' homesteads, a street ruled by a mayor and corporation, yet echoing with the thump of the flail, the flutter of the winnowing fan, and the purr of the milk into the pails, a street which had nothing urban in it whatever, this was the Durnover end of Casterbridge. Henchard, as was natural, dealt largely with this nursery or bed of small farmers close at hand, and his wagons were often down that way. One day, when arrangements were in progress for getting home corn from one of the aforesaid farms, Elizabeth Jane received a note by hand, asking her to oblige the writer by coming at once to a granary on Durnover Hill. As this was the granary whose contents Henchard was removing, she thought the request had something to do with his business, and proceeded thither as soon as she had put on her bonnet. The granary was just within the farmyard, and stood on stone staddles, high enough for persons to walk under. The gates were open, but nobody was within. However, she entered and waited. Presently she saw a figure approaching the gate, that of Donald Farfrae. He looked up at the church clock and came in. By some unaccountable shyness, some wish not to meet him there alone, she quickly ascended the step-ladder leading to the granary door, and entered it before he had seen her. Farfrae advanced, imagining himself in solitude, and, a few drops of rain beginning to fall, he moved and stood under the shelter where she had just been standing. Here he leant against one of the staddles, and gave himself up to patience. He, too, was plainly expecting someone. Could it be herself? If so, why? In a few minutes he looked at his watch, and then pulled out a note, a duplicate of the one she had herself received. This situation began to be very awkward, and the longer she waited the more awkward it became. To emerge from a door just above his head and descend the ladder and show she had been in hiding there would look so very foolish that she still waited on. A winnowing machine stood close beside her, and to relieve her suspense she gently moved the handle, whereupon a cloud of wheat husks flew out into her face and covered her clothes and bonnet and stuck into the fur of her victorine. He must have heard the slight movement, for he looked up and then ascended the steps. "'Ah, it's Miss Newson,' he said, as soon as he could see into the granary. "'I didn't know you were there. I have kept the appointment, and am at your service.' "'Oh, Mr. Farfrae,' she faltered. "'So have I. But I didn't know it was you who wished to see me. Otherwise I—' "'I wish to see you? Oh, no. At least, that is, I am afraid there may be a mistake.' "'Didn't you ask me to come here? Didn't you write this?' Elizabeth held out her note. "'No, indeed, at no hand would I have thought of it. And for you, didn't you ask me? This is not your writing?' And he held up his. "'By no means.' "'And is that really so? Then it's somebody wanting to see us both. Perhaps we would do well to wait a little longer.' Acting on this consideration, they lingered. Elizabeth Jane's face being arranged to an expression of preternatural composure, and the young Scot, at every footstep in the street without, looking from under the granary to see if the pastor were about to enter and declare himself their summoner. They watched individual drops of rain creeping down the thatch of the opposite rick, straw after straw, till they reached the bottom, but nobody came, and the granary roof began to drip. The person is not likely to be coming, said Farfrae. It's a trick, perhaps, and if so, it's a great pity to waste our time like this, and so much to be done. Tis a great liberty, said Elizabeth. It's true, Miss Newson. We'll hear news of this some day, depend on it, and who it was that did it. I wouldn't stand for it hindering myself, but you, Miss Newson. I don't mind. Much, she replied. Neither do I they lapsed again into silence. "'You are anxious to get back to Scotland, I suppose, Mr. Farfrae?' she inquired. "'Oh, no, Miss Newson. Why would I be?' 
i only supposed you might be from the song you sang at the three mariners about scotland and home i mean which you seemed to feel so deep down in your heart so that we all felt for you ay and i did sing there i did but miss newson and donald's voice musically undulated between two semitones as it always did when he became earnest it's well you feel a song for a few minutes and your eyes they get quite tearful but you finish it and for all you felt you don't mind it or think of it again for a long while oh no i don't want to go back yet i'll sing the song to you with pleasure whenever you like i could sing it now and not mind at all thank you indeed but i fear i must go rain or no Ay. then miss newson ye had better say nothing about this hoax and take no heed of it and if the person should say anything to you be civil to him or her as if you did not mind it so you'll take the clever person's laugh away in speaking his eyes became fixed upon her dress still sown with wheat husks there's husks and dust on you perhaps you don't know it he said in tones of extreme delicacy and it's very bad to let rain come upon clothes when there's chaff on them it washes in and spoils them let me help you blowing is the best as elizabeth neither assented nor dissented donald farfrae began blowing her back hair and her side hair and her neck and the crown of her bonnet and the fur of her victorine elizabeth saying oh thank you at every puff at last she was fairly clean though farfrae having got over his first concern at the situation seemed in no manner of hurry to be gone ah now i'll go and get ye an umbrella he said she declined the offer stepped out and was gone farfrae walked slowly after looking thoughtfully at her diminishing figure and whistling in undertones as i came down through canopy end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Fifteen. At first, Miss Newson's budding beauty was not regarded with much interest by anybody in Casterbridge. Donald Farfrae's gaze, it is true, was now attracted by the mayor's so-called stepdaughter, but he was only one the truth is that she was but a poor illustrative instance of the prophet baruch's sly definition the virgin that loveth to go gay when she walked abroad she seemed to be occupied with an inner chamber of ideas and to have slight need for visible objects she formed curious resolves on checking gay fancies in the matter of clothes because it was inconsistent with her past life to blossom gaudily the moment she had become possessed of money but nothing is more insidious than the evolution of wishes from mere fancies and of wants from mere wishes henchard gave elizabeth jane a box of delicately tinted gloves one spring day she wanted to wear them to show her appreciation of his kindness but she had no bonnet that would harmonize as an artistic indulgence she thought she would have such a bonnet when she had a bonnet that would go with the gloves she had no dress that would go with the bonnet it was now absolutely necessary to finish she ordered the requisite article and found that she had no sunshade to go with the dress in for a penny in for a pound she bought the sunshade and the whole structure was at last complete everybody was attracted and some said that her bygone simplicity was the art that conceals art the delicate imposition of rochefoucauld she had produced an effect a contrast and it had been done on purpose as a matter of fact this was not true but it had its result for as soon as casterbridge thought her artful it thought her worth notice it is the first time in my life that i have been so much admired she said to herself though perhaps it is by those whose admiration is not worth having but donald farfrae admired her too and altogether the time was an exciting one 
sex had never before asserted itself in her so strongly for in former days she had perhaps been too impersonally human to be distinctively feminine after an unprecedented success one day she came indoors went upstairs and leant upon her bed face downwards quite forgetting the possible creasing and damage good heaven she whispered can it be here am i setting up as the town beauty when she had thought it over her usual fear of exaggerating appearances engendered a deep sadness there is something wrong in all this she mused if they only knew what an unfinished girl i am that i can't talk italian or use globes or show any of the accomplishments they learn at boarding schools how they would despise me better sell all this finery and buy myself grammar books and dictionaries and a history of all the philosophies she looked from the window and saw henchard and farfrae in the hay-yard talking with that impetuous cordiality on the mayor's part and genial modesty on the younger man's that was now so generally observable in their intercourse friendship between man and man what a rugged strength there was in it as evinced by these two and yet the seed that was to lift the foundation of this friendship was at that moment taking root in a chink of its structure it was about six o'clock the men were dropping off homeward one by one the last to leave was a round-shouldered blinking young man of nineteen or twenty whose mouth fell ajar on the slightest provocation seemingly because there was no chin to support it henchard called aloud to him as he went out of the gate here abel whittle whittle turned and ran back a few steps yes sir he said in breathless deprecation as if he knew what was coming next once more be in time to-morrow morning you see what's to be done and you hear what i say and you know i'm not going to be trifled with any longer yes sir then abel whittle left and henchart and farfrae and elizabeth saw no more of them now there was good reason for this command on henchard's part poor abel as he was called had an inveterate habit of oversleeping himself and coming late to his work his anxious will was to be among the earliest but if his comrades omitted to pull the string that he always tied round his great toe and left hanging out the window for that purpose his will was as wind he did not arrive in time as he was often second-hand at the hay-weighing or at the crane which lifted the sacks or was one of those who had to accompany the wagons into the country to fetch away stacks that had been purchased this affliction of abel's was productive of much inconvenience for two mornings in the present week he had kept the others waiting nearly an hour hence henchard's threat it now remained to be seen what would happen to-morrow six o'clock struck and there was no whittle at half-past six henchard entered the yard the wagon was horsed that abel was to accompany and the other man had been waiting twenty minutes then henchard swore and whittle coming up breathless at that instant the corn factor turned on him and declared with an oath that this was the last time that if he were behind once more by god he would come and drag him out of bed there is summit wrong in my make your worshipful said abel especially in the inside whereas my poor dumb brain gets as dead as a clod afore i said my few scrags of prayers yes it came on as a stripling just afore i'd got man's wages whereas i never enjoy my bed at all for no sooner do i lie down than i be asleep and afore i be awake i be up i've fretted my gizzard green about it maister but what can i do now last night afore i went to bed i only had a scantling of cheese and i don't want to hear it roared henchard to-morrow the wagons must start at four and if you're not here stand clear i'll mortify thy flesh for thee but let me clear up my points your worshipful henchard turned away he asked me and he questioned me and then he wouldn't hear my points said abel to the yard in general now i shall twitch like a moment hand all night to night for fear o him the journey to be taken by the wagons next day was a long one into blackmoor vale and at four o'clock lanterns were moving about the yard but abel was missing 
before either of the other men could run to abel's and warn him henchard appeared in the garden doorway where's abel whiffle not come after all i've said now i'll carry out my word by my blessed fathers nothing else will do him any good i'm going up that way henchard went off entered abel's house a little cottage in back street the door of which was never locked because the inmates had nothing to lose reaching whittle's bedside the corn factor shouted a bass note so vigorously that abel started up instantly and beholding henchard standing over him was galvanized into spasmodic movements which had not much relation to getting on his clothes out of bed sir and off to the granary or you leave my employ to-day tis to teach ye a lesson march on never mind your breeches the unhappy whittle threw on his sleeve waistcoat and managed to get into his boots at the bottom of the stairs while henchard thrust his hat over his head whittle then trotted on down back street henchard walking sternly behind just at this time farfrae who had been to henchard's house to look for him came out of the back gate and saw something white fluttering in the morning gloom which he soon perceived to be part of abel's shirt that showed below his waistcoat for mercy's sake what object's this said farfrae following abel into the yard henchard being some way in the rear by this time ye see mr farfrae gibbered abel with a resigned smile of terror he said he'd mortify my flesh if so be i didn't get up sooner and now he's a doin on it ye see it can't be helped mr farfrae things do happen queer sometimes yes i'll go to blackmoor vale half naked as i be since he do command but i shall kill myself afterwards i can't outlive the disgrace for the women folk will be looking out of their windows at my mortification all the way along and laughing me to scorn as a man without breeches you know how i feel such things maister farfrae and how forlorn thoughts get hold upon me yes i shall do myself harm i feel it coming on get back home and slip on your breeches and come to work like a man if you go not you'll hear your death standing there i'm afeard i mustn't mr henchard said i don't care what mr henchard said nor anybody else tis simple foolishness to do this go and dress yourself instantly whittle hello hello said henchard coming up behind who's sending him back all the men looked towards farfrae i am said donald i say this joke has been carried far enough and i say it hasn't get up in the wagon whittle not if i am manager said farfrae he either goes home or i march out of this yard for good henchard looked at him with a face stern and red but he paused for a moment and their eyes met donald went up to him for he saw in henchard's look that he began to regret this come said donald quietly a man of your position should ken better sir it is tyrannical and no worthy of you tis not tyrannical murmured henchard like a sullen boy it is to make him remember he presently added in a tone of one bitterly hurt why did you speak to me before them like that farfrae you might have stopped till we were alone ah i know why i've told ye the secret of my life fool that i was to do it and you take advantage of me i had forgot it said farfrae simply henchard looked on the ground said nothing more and turned away during the day farfrae learnt from the men that henchard had kept abel's old mother in coals and snuff all the previous winter which made him less antagonistic to the corn factor but henchard continued moody and silent and when one of the men inquired of him if some oats should be hoisted to an upper floor or not he said shortly ask mr farfrae he's master here morally he was there could be no doubt of it henchard who had hitherto been the most admired man in his circle was the most admired no longer one day the daughters of a deceased farmer in durnover wanted an opinion of the value of their haystack and sent a messenger to ask mr farfrae to oblige them with one the messenger who was a child met in the yard not farfrae but henchard very well he said i'll come but please will mr farfrae come said the child i am going that way why mr farfrae said henchard with the fixed look of thought why do people always want mr farfrae i suppose because they like him so that's what they say oh i see that's what they say eh? 
They like him because he's cleverer than Mr. Henchard, and because he knows more. And, in short, Mr. Henchard can't hold a candle to him, eh? Yes, that's just it, sir, some of it. Oh, there's more. Of course there's more. What, besides? Come, here's a sixpence for a fairing. And he's better tempered, and Henchard's a fool to him, they say. And when some of the women were a-walking home, they said, He's a diamond, he's a chap o' wax, he's the best, he's the horse for my money, says they. And they said, He's the most understanding man of them, too, by long chocks. I wish he was the master instead of Henchard, they said. They'll talk any nonsense, Henchard replied with covered gloom. Well, you can go now. And I am coming to value the hay, do you hear? I. The boy departed, and Henchard murmured, Wish he were master here, do they? He went towards Durnover. On his way he overtook Farfrae. They walked on together, Henchard looking mostly on the ground. "'You know your cell the day?' Donald inquired. "'Yes, I'm very well,' said Henchard. "'But ye are a bit down. Surely ye are down. Why, there's nothing to be angry about. Tis splendid stuff that we've got from Blackmoor Vale. By the by, the people in Durnover want their hay valued.' "'Yes, I am going there.' "'I'll go with ye.' As Henchard did not reply, Donald practised a piece of music, sotto voce, till, getting near the bereaved people's door, he stopped himself with, Ah, as their father is dead, I won't go on with such as that. How could I forget? Do you care so very much about hurting folks' feelings? observed Henchard with a half-sneer. You do, I know, especially mine. I am sorry if I have hurt yours, sir replied Donald, standing still, with a second expression of the same sentiment in the regretfulness of his face. Why should you say it? Think it. The cloud lifted from Henchard's brow, and as Donald finished, the corn merchant turned to him, regarding his breast rather than his face. I have been hearing things that vexed me, he said. Twas that made me short in my manner, made me overlook what you really are. Now, I don't want to go in here about this hay. Farfrae, you can do it better than I. They sent for ye, too. I have to attend a meeting of the town council at eleven, and tis drawing on for it. They parted thus in renewed friendship, Donald forbearing to ask Henchard for meanings that were not very plain to him. On Henchard's part there was now, again, repose. And yet, whenever he thought of Farfrae, it was with a dim dread, and he often regretted that he had told the young man his whole heart and confided to him the secrets of his life. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 16 On this account Henchard's manner towards Farfrae insensibly became more reserved. He was courteous, too courteous, and Farfrae was quite surprised at the good breeding which now, for the first time, showed itself among the qualities of a man he had hitherto thought undisciplined, if warm and sincere. The corn factor seldom or never again put his arm upon the young man's shoulder so as to nearly weigh him down with the pressure of mechanized friendship. He left off coming to Donald's lodgings and shouting into the passage, Hoy, Farfrae, boy, come and have some dinner with us. Don't sit here in solitary confinement. But in the daily routine of their business there was little change. Thus their lives rolled on till a day of public rejoicing was suggested to the country at large in celebration of a national event that had recently taken place. For some time Casterbridge, by nature slow, made no response. Then one day Donald Farfrae broached the subject to Henchard by asking if he would have any objection to lend some rick cloths to himself and a few others who contemplated getting up an entertainment of some sort on the day named, and required a shelter for the same, to which they might charge admission at the rate of so much a head. "'Have as many cloths as you like,' Henchard replied. When his manager had gone about the business, Henchard was fired with emulation. 
It certainly had been very remiss of him, as mayor, he thought, to call no meeting ere this to discuss what should be done on this holiday. But Farfrae had been so cursed quick in his movements as to give old-fashioned people in authority no chance of the initiative. However, it was not too late, and on second thoughts he determined to take upon his own shoulders the responsibility of organizing some amusements, if the other councilmen would leave the matter in his hands. To this they quite readily agreed, the majority being fine old crusted characters who had a decided taste for living without worry. So Henchard set about his preparations for a really brilliant thing, such as should be worthy of the venerable town. As for Farfrae's little affair, Henchard nearly forgot it, except once now and then when, on it coming into his mind, he said to himself, Charge admission at so much a head, just like a Scotchman, who is going to pay anything a head? The diversions which the mayor intended to provide were to be entirely free. He had grown so dependent upon Donald that he could scarcely resist calling him in to consult. but by sheer self-coercion he refrained. No, he thought, Farfrae would be suggesting such improvements in his damned luminous way that in spite of himself he, Henchard, would sink to the position of second fiddle and only scrape harmonies to his manager's talents. Everybody applauded the mayor's proposed entertainment, especially when it became known that he meant to pay for it all himself. Close to the town was an elevated green spot surrounded by an ancient square earthwork. Earthworks, square and not square, were as common as blackberries hereabout, a spot whereon the Casterbridge people usually held any kind of merry-making, meeting, or sheep fair that required more space than the streets would afford. On one side it sloped to the river Froom, and from any point of view was obtained of the country round for many miles. This pleasant upland was to be the scene of Henchard's exploit. He advertised about the town, in long posters of a pink color, that games of all sorts would take place here, and set to work a little battalion of men under his own eye. They erected greasy poles for climbing with smoked hams and local cheeses at the top. They placed hurdles in rows for jumping over. Across the river they laid a slippery pole with a live pig of the neighborhood tied at the other end to become the property of the man who could walk over and get it. There were also provided wheelbarrows for racing, donkeys for the same, a stage for boxing, wrestling, and drawing blood generally, sacks for jumping in. Moreover, not forgetting his principles, Henchard provided a mammoth tea, of which everybody who lived in the borough was invited to partake without payment. The tables were laid parallel with the inner slope of the rampart, and awnings were stretched overhead. Passing to and fro, the mayor beheld the unattractive exterior of Farfrae's erection in the West Walk rick-cloths of different sizes and colors being hung up to the arching trees without any regard to appearance he was easy in his mind now for his own preparations far transcended these the morning came the sky which had been remarkably clear down to within a day or two was overcast and the weather threatening the wind having an unmistakable hint of water in it Henchard wished he had not been quite so sure about the continuance of a fair season, but it was too late to modify or postpone, and the proceedings went on. At twelve o'clock the rain began to fall, small and steady, commencing and increasing so insensibly that it was difficult to state exactly when dry weather ended or wet established itself. In the end, the slight moisture resolved itself into a monotonous smiting of earth by heaven in torrents to which no end could be prognosticated. A number of people had heroically gathered in the field, but by three o'clock Henchard discerned that his project was doomed to end in failure. The hams at the top of the poles dripped watered smoke in the form of a brown liquor, the pig shivered in the wind, 
the grain of the deal tables showed through the sticking tablecloths for the awning allowed the rain to drift under at its will and to enclose the sides at this hour seemed a useless undertaking the landscape over the river disappeared the wind played on the tent cords in aeolian improvisations and at length rose to such a pitch that the whole erection slanted to the ground those who had taken shelter within it having to crawl out on their hands and knees but towards six the storm abated and a drier breeze shook the moisture from the grass bents it seemed possible to carry out the programme after all the awning was set up again the band was called out from its shelter and ordered to begin and where the tables had stood a place was cleared for dancing but where are the folk said henchard after the lapse of half an hour during which time only two men and a woman had stood up to dance the shops are all shut why don't they come they are at farfrae's affair in the west walk answered a councilman who stood in the field with the mayor a few i suppose but where are the body of em all out of doors are there then the more fools they henchard walked away moodily one or two young fellows gallantly came to climb the poles to save the hams from being wasted but as there were no spectators and the whole scene presented the most melancholy appearance henchard gave orders that the proceedings were to be suspended and the entertainment closed the food to be distributed among the poor people of the town in a short time nothing was left in the field but a few hurdles the tents and the poles henchard returned to his house had tea with his wife and daughter and then walked out it was now dusk he soon saw that the tendency of all promenaders was towards a particular spot in the walks and eventually proceeded thither himself the notes of a stringed band came from the enclosure that farfrae had erected the pavilion as he called it and when the mayor reached it he perceived that a gigantic tent had been ingeniously constructed without poles or ropes the densest point of the avenue of sycamores had been selected where the boughs made a closely interlaced vault overhead to these boughs the canvas had been hung and a barrel roof was the result the end towards the wind was enclosed the other end was open henchard went round and saw the interior in form it was like the nave of a cathedral with one gable removed but the scene within was anything but devotional a reel or fling of some sort was in progress and the usually sedate farfrae was in the midst of the other dancers in the costume of a wild highlander flinging himself about and spinning to the tune for a moment henchard could not help laughing then he perceived the immense admiration for the scotchman that revealed itself in the women's faces and when this exhibition was over and a new dance proposed and donald had disappeared for a time to return in his natural garments he had an unlimited choice of partners every girl being in a coming-on disposition towards one who so thoroughly understood the poetry of motion as he all the town crowded to the walk such a delightful idea of a ballroom never having occurred to the inhabitants before among the rest of the onlookers were elizabeth and her mother the former thoughtful yet much interested her eyes beaming with a longing lingering light as if nature had been advised by correggio in their creation the dancing progressed with unabated spirit and henchard walked and waited till his wife should be disposed to go home he did not care to keep in the light and when he went into the dark it was worse for there he heard remarks of a kind which were becoming too frequent mr henchard's rejoicings couldn't say good morning to this said one a man must be a headstrong stunpole to think folk would go up to that bleak place to-day the other answered that people said it was not only in such things as those that the mayor was wanting where would his business be if it were not for this young fellow twas verily fortune sent him to henchard his accounts were like a bramble wood when mr farfrae came he used to reckon his sacks by chalk strokes all in a row like garden palings measure his ricks by stretching with his arms weigh his trusses by a lift 
judge his hay by a chaw and settle the price with a curse but now this accomplished young man does it all by ciphering and mensuration then the wheat that sometimes used to taste so strong a mice when made into bread that people could fairly tell the breed farfrae has a plan for purifying so that nobody would dream the smallest four-legged beast had walked over at once oh yes everybody is full of him and the care mr henchard has to keep him to be sure concluded this gentleman but he won't do it for long good now said the other no said henchard to himself behind the tree or if he do he'll be honeycombed clean out of all the character and standing that he's built up in these eighteen year he went back to the dancing pavilion farfrae was footing a quaint little dance with elizabeth jane an old country thing the only one she knew and though he considerately toned down his movements to suit her demurer gait the pattern of the shining little nails in the soles of his boots became familiar to the eyes of every bystander the tune had enticed her into it being a tune of a busy vaulting leaping sort some low notes on the silver string of each fiddle then a skipping on the small like running up and down ladders miss macleod of air was its name so mr farfrae had said and that it was very popular in his own country it was soon over and the girl looked at henchard for approval but he did not give it he seemed not to see her look here farfrae he said like one whose mind was elsewhere i'll go to port breedy great market to-morrow myself you can stay and put things right in your clothes box and recover strength to your knees after your vagaries he planted on donald an antagonistic glare that had begun as a smile some other townsmen came up and donald drew aside what's this henchard said alderman tubber applying his thumb to the corn factor like a cheese taster an opposition randy to yours eh jack's as good as his master eh cut ye out quite hasn't he you see mr henchard said the lawyer another good-natured friend where you made the mistake was in going so far afield you should have taken a leaf out of his book and have had your sports in a sheltered place like this but you didn't think of it you see and he did and that's where he's beat you he'll be top sawyer soon of you two and carry all afore him added jocular mr tubber no said henchard gloomily he won't be that because he's shortly going to leave me he looked towards donald who had come near mr farfrae's time as my manager is drawing to a close isn't it farfrae the young man who could now read the lines and folds of henchard's strongly traced face as if they were clear verbal inscriptions quietly assented and when people deplored the fact and asked why it was he simply replied that mr henchard no longer required his help henchard went home apparently satisfied but in the morning when his jealous temper had passed away his heart sank within him at what he had said and done he was the more disturbed when he found that this time farfrae was determined to take him at his word end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Seventeen. Elizabeth Jane had perceived from Henchard's manner that in assenting to dance she had made a mistake of some kind. In her simplicity, she did not know what it was till a hint from a nodding acquaintance enlightened her. As the mayor's stepdaughter, she learnt she had not been quite in her place in treading a measure amid such a mixed throng as filled the dancing pavilion thereupon her ears cheeks and chin glowed like live coals at the dawning of the idea that her tastes were not good enough for her position and would bring her into disgrace this made her very miserable and she looked about for her mother but mrs henchard who had less idea of conventionality than elizabeth herself had gone away leaving her daughter to return at her own pleasure 
the latter moved on into the dark dense old avenues or rather vaults of living woodwork which ran along the town boundary and stood reflecting a man followed in a few minutes and her face being towards the shine from the tent he recognized her it was farfrae just come from the dialogue with henchard which had signified his dismissal and it's you miss newson and i've been looking for ye everywhere he said overcoming a sadness imparted by the estrangement with the corn merchant may i walk on with you as far as your street corner she thought there might be something wrong in this but did not utter any objection so together they went on first down the west walk and then into the bowling walk till farfrae said it's like that i'm going to leave you soon she faltered why oh as a mere matter of business nothing more but we'll not concern ourselves about it it is for the best i hoped to have another dance with you she said she could not dance in any proper way nay but you do it's the feeling for it rather than the learning of steps that makes pleasant dancers i fear i offended your father by getting up this and now perhaps i'll have to go to another part of the world altogether this seemed such a melancholy prospect that elizabeth jane breathed a sigh letting it off in fragments that he might not hear her but darkness makes people truthful and the scotchman went on impulsively perhaps he had heard her after all i wish i was richer miss newson and your stepfather had not been offended i would ask you something in a short time yes i would ask you to-night but that's not for me what he would have asked her he did not say and instead of encouraging him she remained incompetently silent thus afraid one of another they continued their promenade along the walls till they got near the bottom of the bowling walk twenty steps further and the trees would end and the street corner and lamps appear in consciousness of this they stopped i never found out who it was that sent us to durnover granary on a fool's errand that day said donald in his undulating tones did ye ever know yourself miss newson never said she i wonder why they did it for fun perhaps perhaps it was not for fun it might have been that they thought they would like us to stay waiting there talking to one another ay well i hope you casterbridge folk will not forget me if i go that i'm sure we won't she said earnestly i wish you wouldn't go at all they had got into the lamplight now i'll think over that said donald farfrae and i'll not come up to your door but part from you here lest it make your father more angry still they parted farfrae returning into the dark bowling walk and elizabeth jane going up the street without any consciousness of what she was doing she started running with all her might till she reached her father's door oh dear me what am i at she thought as she pulled up breathless indoors she fell to conjecturing the meaning of farfrae's enigmatic words about not daring to ask her what he fain would elizabeth that silent observing woman had long noted how he was rising in favour among the townspeople and knowing henchard's nature now she had feared that farfrae's days as manager were numbered so that the announcement gave her little surprise would mr farfrae stay in casterbridge despite his words and her father's dismissal his occult breathings to her might be solvable by his course in that respect the next day was windy so windy that walking in the garden she picked up a portion of the draft of a letter on business in donald farfrae's writing which had flown over the wall from the office the useless scrap she took indoors and began to copy the calligraphy which she much admired the letter began dear sir and presently writing on a loose slip elizabeth jane she laid the latter over sir making the phrase dear elizabeth jane when she saw the effect a quick red ran up her face and warmed her through though nobody was there to see what she had done she quickly tore up the slip and threw it away after this she grew cool and laughed at herself walked about the room and laughed again not joyfully but distressfully rather 
It was quickly known in Casterbridge that Farfrae and Henchard had decided to dispense with each other. Elizabeth Jane's anxiety to know if Farfrae were going away from the town reached a pitch that disturbed her, for she could no longer conceal from herself the cause. At length the news reached her that he was not going to leave the place. A man following the same trade as Henchard, but on a very small scale, had sold his business to Farfrae, who was forthwith about to start as corn and hay merchant on his own account. Her heart fluttered when she heard of this step of Donald's, proving that he meant to remain, and yet would a man who cared one little bit for her have endangered his suit by setting up a business in opposition to Mr. Henchart's? Surely not, and it must have been a passing impulse only which had led him to address her so softly. To solve the problem, whether her appearance on the evening of the dance were such as to inspire a fleeting love at first sight, she dressed herself up exactly as she had dressed then, the muslin, the spencer, the sandals, the parasol, and looked in the mirror. The picture glassed back was, in her opinion, precisely of such a kind as to inspire that fleeting regard, and no more just enough to make him silly and not enough to keep him so she said luminously and elizabeth thought in a much lower key that by this time he had discovered how plain and homely was the informing spirit of that pretty outside hence when she felt her heart going out to him she would say to herself with a mock pleasantry that carried an ache with it no no elizabeth jane such dreams are not for you she tried to prevent herself from seeing him and thinking of him, succeeding fairly well in the former attempt, in the latter not so completely. Henchard, who had been hurt at finding that Farfrae did not mean to put up with his temper any longer, was incensed beyond measure when he learnt what the young man had done as an alternative. It was in the town hall, after a council meeting, that he first became aware of Farfrae's coup for establishing himself independently in the town, and his voice might have been heard as far as the town pump, expressing his feelings to his fellow councilmen. These tones showed that, though under a long reign of self-control he had become mayor and churchwarden and what not, there was still the same unruly volcanic stuff beneath the rind of Michael Henchard as when he had sold his wife at Waden Fair. Well, he's a friend of mine, and I'm a friend of his. Or if we are not, what are we? Odd send, if I've not been his friend, who has, I should like to know? Didn't he come here without a sound shoe to his foot? Didn't I keep him here? Help him to a living? Didn't I help him to money or whatever he wanted? I stuck out for no terms. I said, name your own price. I'd have shared my last crust with that young fellow at one time. I liked him so well. And now he's defied me. But damn him, I'll have a tussle with him now, at fair buying and selling, mind, at fair buying and selling. And if I can't overbid such a stripling as he, then I'm not worth a varden. We'll show that we know our business as well as one here and there. His friends of the corporation did not specially respond. Henchard was less popular now than he had been when nearly two years before they had voted him to the chief magistracy on account of his amazing energy. While they had collectively profited by this quality of the corn factors, they had been made to wince individually on more than one occasion, so he went out of the hall and down the street alone. Reaching home, he seemed to recollect something with a sour satisfaction. He called Elizabeth Jane. Seeing how he looked when she entered, she appeared alarmed. Nothing to find fault with, he said, observing her concern. Only I want to caution you, my dear. That man, Farfrae, it is about him. I've seen him talking to you two or three times. He danced with thee at the rejoicings and came home with thee. Now, now, no blame to you but just hearken. Have you made him any foolish promise? Gone the least bit beyond sniff and snaff at all? No, I have promised him nothing. Good. All's well that ends well. I particularly wish you not to see him again. Very well, sir. You promise? 
she hesitated for a moment and then said yes if you much wish it i do he's an enemy to our house when she had gone he sat down and wrote in a heavy hand to farfrae thus sir i make request that henceforth you and my stepdaughter be as strangers to each other she on her part has promised to welcome no more addresses from you and i trust therefore you will not attempt to force them upon her m henchard one would almost have supposed henchard to have had policy to see that no better modus vivendi could be arrived at with farfrae than by encouraging him to become his son-in-law but such a scheme for buying over a rival had nothing to recommend it to the mayor's headstrong faculties with all domestic finesse of that kind he was hopelessly at variance loving a man or hating him his diplomacy was as wrong-headed as a buffalo's and his wife had not ventured to suggest the course which she for many reasons would have welcomed gladly meanwhile donald farfrae had opened the gates of commerce on his own account at a spot on durnover hill as far as possible from henchard's stores and with every intention of keeping clear of his former friend and employer's customers there was it seemed to the younger man room for both of them and to spare the town was small but the corn and hay trade was proportionately large and with his native sagacity he saw opportunity for a share of it so determined was he to do nothing which would seem like trade antagonism to the mayor that he refused his first customer a large farmer of good repute because henchard and this man had dealt together within the preceding three months he was once my friend said farfrae and it's not for me to take business from him i am sorry to disappoint you but i cannot hurt the trade of a man who's been so kind to me in spite of this praiseworthy course the scotchman's trade increased whether it were that his northern energy was an overmastering force among the easy-going wessex worthies or whether it was sheer luck the fact remained that whatever he touched he prospered in like jacob in padan aram he would no sooner humbly limit himself to the ring-straked and spotted exceptions of trade than the ring-straked and spotted would multiply and prevail but most probably luck had little to do with it character is fate said novalis and farfrae's character was just the reverse of henchard's who might not inaptly be described as faust has been described as a vehement gloomy being who had quitted the ways of vulgar men without light to guide him on a better way farfrae duly received the request to discontinue attentions to elizabeth jane his acts of that kind had been so slight that the request was almost superfluous yet he had felt a considerable interest in her and after some cogitation he decided that it would be as well to enact no romeo part just then for the young girl's sake no less than his own thus the incipient attachment was stifled down a time came when avoid collision with his former friend as he might farfrae was compelled in sheer self-defence to close with henchard in mortal commercial combat he could no longer parry the fierce attacks of the latter by simple avoidance as soon as their war of prices began everybody was interested and some few guessed the end it was in some degree northern insight matched against southern doggedness the dirk against the cudgel and henchard's weapon was one which if it did not deal ruin at the first or second stroke left him afterwards well nigh at his antagonist's mercy almost every saturday they encountered each other amid the crowd of farmers which thronged about the market-place in the weekly course of their business Donald was always ready and even anxious to say a few friendly words, but the mayor invariably gazed stormfully past him, like one who had endured and lost on his account, and could in no sense forgive the wrong. Nor did Farfrae's snubbed manner of perplexity at all appease him. 
the large farmers corn merchants millers auctioneers and others each had an official stall in the corn market room with their names painted thereon and when to the familiar series of henchard everdeen shiner darton and so on was added one inscribed farfrae in staring new letters henchard was stung into bitterness like bellerophon he wandered away from the crowd cankered in soul from that day donald farfrae's name was seldom mentioned in henchard's house if at breakfast or dinner elizabeth jane's mother inadvertently alluded to her favorite's movements the girl would implore her by a look to be silent and her husband would say what are you too my enemy End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter eighteen there came a shock which had been foreseen for some time by elizabeth as the box passenger foresees the approaching jerk from some channel across the highway her mother was ill too unwell to leave her room henchard who treated her kindly except in moments of irritation sent at once for the richest busiest doctor whom he supposed to be the best bedtime came and they burnt a light all night in a day or two she rallied elizabeth who had been staying up did not appear at breakfast on the second morning and henchard sat down alone he was startled to see a letter for him from jersey in a writing he knew too well and had expected least to behold again he took it up in his hands and looked at it as at a picture a vision a vista of past enactments and then he read it as an unimportant finale to conjecture the writer said that she at length perceived how impossible it would be for any further communications to proceed between them now that his remarriage had taken place that such reunion had been the only straightforward course open to him she was bound to admit on calm reflection therefore she went on i quite forgive you for landing me in such a dilemma remembering that you concealed nothing before our ill-advised acquaintance and that you really did set before me in your grim way the fact of there being a certain risk in intimacy with you slight as it seemed to be after fifteen or sixteen years of silence on your wife's part i thus look upon the whole as a misfortune of mine and not a fault of yours so that michael i must ask you to overlook those letters with which i pestered you day after day in the heat of my feelings they were written whilst i thought your conduct to me cruel but now i know more particulars of the position you were in i see how inconsiderate my reproaches were now you will i am sure perceive that the one condition which will make any future happiness possible for me is that the past connection between our lives be kept secret outside this isle speak of it i know you will not and i can trust you not to write of it one safeguard more remains to be mentioned that no writings of mine or trifling articles belonging to me should be left in your possession through neglect or forgetfulness to this end may i request you to return to me any such you may have particularly the letters written in the first abandonment of feeling for the handsome sum you forwarded to me as a plaster to the wound i heartily thank you i am now on my way to bristol to see my only relative she is rich and i hope will do something for me i shall return through casterbridge and budmouth where i shall take the packet-boat can you meet me with the letters and other trifles i shall be in the coach which changes horses at the antelope hotel at half-past five wednesday evening i shall be wearing a paisley shawl with a red centre and thus may easily be found i should prefer this plan of receiving them to having them sent i remain still yours ever lucetta henchard breathed heavily poor thing better you had not known me upon my heart and soul if ever i should be left in a position to carry out that marriage with thee i ought to do it i ought to do it indeed 
the contingency that he had in his mind was of course the death of mrs henchard as requested he sealed up lucetta's letters and put the parcel aside till the day she had appointed this plan of returning them by hand being apparently a little ruse of the young lady for exchanging a word or two with him on past times he would have preferred not to see her but deeming that there could be no great harm in acquiescing thus far he went at dusk and stood opposite the coach office the evening was chilly and the coach was late henchard crossed over to it while the horses were being changed but there was no lucetta inside or out concluding that something had happened to modify her arrangements he gave the matter up and went home not without a sense of relief meanwhile mrs henchard was weakening visibly she could not go out of doors any more one day after much thinking which seemed to distress her she said she wanted to write something a desk was put upon her bed with pen and paper and at her request she was left alone she remained writing for a short time folded her paper carefully called elizabeth jane to bring a taper and wax and then still refusing assistance sealed up the sheet directed it and locked it in her desk she had directed it in these words mr michael henchard not to be opened till elizabeth jane's wedding day the latter sat up with her mother to the utmost of her strength night after night to learn to take the universe seriously there is no quicker way than to watch to be a waker as the country people call it between the hours at which the last toss-pot went by and the first sparrow shook himself the silence in casterbridge barring the rare sound of the watchman was broken in elizabeth's ear only by the timepiece in the bedroom ticking frantically against the clock on the stairs ticking harder and harder till it seemed to clang like a gong and all this while the subtle-souled girl asking herself why she was born why sitting in a room and blinking at the candle why things around her had taken the shape they wore in preference to every other possible shape why they stared at her so helplessly as if waiting for the touch of some wand that should release them from terrestrial constraint what that chaos called consciousness which spun in her at this moment like a top tended to and began in her eyes fell together she was awake yet she was asleep a word from her mother roused her without preface and as the continuation of a scene already progressing in her mind mrs henchard said you remember the note sent to you and mr farfrae asking you to meet some one in durnover barton and that you thought it was a trick to make fools of you yes it was not to make fools of you it was done to bring you together twas i did it why said elizabeth with a start i wanted you to marry mr farfrae oh mother elizabeth jane bent down her head so much that she looked quite into her own lap but as her mother did not go on she said what reason well i had a reason twill out one day I wish it could have been in my time. But there, nothing is as you wish it. Henchard hates him. Perhaps they'll be friends again, murmured the girl. I don't know. I don't know. After this her mother was silent and dozed, and she spoke on the subject no more. Some little time later on Farfrae was passing Henchard's house on a Sunday morning, when he observed that the blinds were all down. He rang the bell so softly that it only sounded a single full note and a small one, and then he was informed that Mrs. Henchard was dead, just dead, that very hour. At the town pump there were gathered when he passed a few old inhabitants who came there for water whenever they had, as at present, spare time to fetch it, because it was purer from that original fount than from their own wells. Mrs. Cuxham, who had been standing there for an indefinite time with her pitcher, was describing the incidents of Mrs. Henchard's death, 
as she had learnt them from the nurse. "'And she was white as marble stone,' said Mrs. Cuxon. "'And likewise such a thoughtful woman, too. Ah, poor soul, that he minded every little thing that wanted tending. Yes, says she, when I'm gone and my last breath's blowed, look in the top drawer of the chest in the back room by the window, and you'll find all my coffin clothes, a piece of flannel that's to put under me and the little pieces to put under my head, and my new stockings for my feet. They are folded alongside, and all my other things. And there's four-ounce pennies, the heaviest I could find, a tied up in bits of linen for weights, two for my right eye and two for my left, she said. And when you've used em, and my eyes don't open no more, bury the pennies, good souls, and don't ye go spending em, for I shouldn't like it, and open the windows as soon as I am carried out, and make it as cheerful as you can for Elizabeth Jane. Ah, poor heart! Well, and Martha did it, and buried the ounce pennies in the garden. But if you'll believe words, that man, Christopher Coney, went and dug em up, and spent em at the three mariners. Faith, he said, why should death rob life of fourpence? Death's not of such good report that we should respect em to that extent, says he. "'Twas a cannibal deed, deprecated her listeners. "'Gad, then I won't quite hay it,' said Solomon Longways. "'I say it to-day, and tis a Sunday morning, "'and I wouldn't speak wrongfully for a silver sixpence at such a time. "'I don't see new harm in it. "'To respect the dead is sound doxology, "'and I wouldn't sell skeletons, leastwise respectable skeletons, "'to be varnished for anatomies, except I were out of work. "'But money is scarce, and throats get dry. "'Why should death rob life of fourpence?' I say there was no treason in it. Well, poor soul, she's helpless to hinder that or anything now, answered Mother Cuxham, and all her shining keys will be took from her, and her cupboards opened, and little things they didn't wish seen, anybody will see, and her wishes and ways will all be as nothing. End of chapter 18 Chapter Nineteen of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Nineteen. Henchard and Elizabeth sat conversing by the fire. It was three weeks after Mrs. Henchard's funeral. The candles were not lighted, and a restless, acrobatic flame poised on a coal called from the shady walls the smiles of all shapes that could respond the old pier-glass with gilt columns and huge entablature, the picture-frames, sundry knobs and handles, and the brass rosette at the bottom of each ribboned bell-pole on either side of the chimney-piece. "'Elizabeth, do you think much of old times?' said Henchard. "'Yes, sir, often,' she said. "'Who do you put in your pictures of em? "'Mother and father. Nobody else, hardly.' Henchard always looked like one bent on resisting pain when Elizabeth Jane spoke of Richard Newson as father. "'Ah, I am out of all that, am I not?' he said. "'Was Newson a kind father?' "'Yes, sir, very.' Henchard's face settled into an expression of stolid loneliness which gradually modulated into something softer. "'Suppose I had been your real father,' he said. Would you have cared for me as much as you cared for Richard Newson? I can't think it, she said quickly. I can think of no other as my father except my father. Henchard's wife was dissevered from him by death. His friend and helper Farfray by estrangement, Elizabeth Jane by ignorance. It seemed to him that only one of them could possibly be recalled, and that was the girl. His mind began vibrating between the wish to reveal himself to her and the policy of leaving well alone till he could no longer sit still. He walked up and down, and then he came and stood behind her chair, looking down upon the top of her head. He could no longer restrain his impulse. "'What did your mother tell you about me, my history?' he asked. "'That you were related by marriage.' She should have told more, before you knew me. Then my task would not have been such a hard one. 
Elizabeth, it is I who am your father, and not Richard Newson. Shame alone prevented your wretched parents from owning this to you while both of them were alive. The back of Elizabeth's head remained still, and her shoulders did not denote even the movements of breathing. Henchard went on. I'd rather have your scorn, your fear, anything than your ignorance. Tis that I hate. Your mother and I were man and wife when we were young. What you saw was our second marriage. Your mother was too honest. We had thought each other dead, and Newson became her husband. This was the nearest approach Henchard could make to the full truth. As far as he personally was concerned, he would have screened nothing, but he showed a respect for the young girl's sex and years worthy of a better man. When he had gone on to give details which a whole series of slight and unregarded incidents in her past life strangely corroborated, when, in short, she believed his story to be true, she became greatly agitated, and, turning round to the table, flung her face upon it, weeping. "'Don't cry, don't cry,' said Henchard, with vehement pathos. "'I can't bear it. I won't bear it. I am your father. Why should you cry? Am I so dreadful, so hateful to ee? Don't take against me, Elizabeth Jane,' he cried, grasping her wet hand. "'Don't take against me. Though I was a drinking man once and used your mother roughly, I'll be kinder to you than he was. I'll do anything if you will only look upon me as your father.' She tried to stand up and comfort him trustfully, but she could not. She was troubled at his presence, like the brethren at the avowal of Joseph. "'I don't want you to come to me all of a sudden,' said Henchard in jerks and moving like a great tree in a wind. "'No, Elizabeth, I don't. I'll go away and not see you till tomorrow, or when you like, and then I'll show ye papers to prove my words.' There, I am gone, and won't disturb you any more. "'Twas I that chose your name, my daughter. Your mother wanted it, Susan. There, don't forget, twas I gave you your name." He went out at the door and shut her softly in, and she heard him go away into the garden. But he had not done. Before she had moved or in any way recovered from the effect of his disclosure, he reappeared. One word more, Elizabeth, he said. You'll take my surname now, hey? Your mother was against it, but it will be much more pleasant to me. Tis legally yours, you know, but nobody need know that. You shall take it as if by choice. I'll talk to my lawyer. I don't know the law of it exactly. But will you do this? Let me put a few lines into the newspaper that such is to be your name." If it is my name, I must have it, mustn't I? she asked. Well, well, usage is everything in these matters. I wonder why mother didn't wish it. Oh, some whim of the poor souls. Now get a bit of paper and draw up a paragraph, as I shall tell you. But let's have a light. I can see by the firelight, she answered. Yes, I'd rather. Very well. She got a piece of paper and, bending over the fender, wrote at his dictation words which he had evidently got by heart from some advertisement or other, words to the effect that she, the writer, hitherto known as Elizabeth Jane Newson, was going to call herself Elizabeth Jane Henchard forthwith. It was done and fastened up and directed to the office of the Casterbridge Chronicle. Now said Henchard, with the blaze of satisfaction that he always emitted when he had carried his point, though tenderness softened it this time. I'll go upstairs and hunt for some documents that will prove it all to you. But I won't trouble you with them till tomorrow. Good night, my Elizabeth Jane. He was gone before the bewildered girl could realize what it all meant, or adjust her filial sense to the new center of gravity. She was thankful that he had left her to herself for the evening, and sat down over the fire. Here she remained in silence, and wept, not for her mother now, but for the genial sailor Richard Newson, to whom she seemed doing a wrong. Henchard, in the meantime, had gone upstairs. 
papers of a domestic nature he kept in a drawer in his bedroom and this he unlocked before turning them over he leant back and indulged in reposeful thought elizabeth was his at last and she was a girl of such good sense and kind heart that she would be sure to like him he was the kind of man to whom some human object for pouring out his heart upon were it emotive or were it choleric was almost a necessity the craving of his heart for the re-establishment of this tenderest human tie had been great during his wife's lifetime and now he had submitted to its mastery without reluctance and without fear he bent over the drawer again and proceeded in his search among the other papers had been placed the contents of his wife's little desk the keys of which had been handed to him at her request here was the letter addressed to him with the restriction not to be opened till elizabeth jane's wedding day mrs henchard though more patient than her husband had been no practical hand at anything in sealing up the sheet which was folded and tucked in without an envelope in the old-fashioned way she had overlaid the junction with a large mass of wax without the requisite undertouch of the same the seal had cracked and the letter was open henchard had no reason to suppose the restriction one of serious weight and his feeling for his late wife had not been of the nature of deep respect some trifling fancy or other of poor susan's i suppose he said and without curiosity he allowed his eyes to scan the letter my dear michael for the good of all three of us i have kept one thing a secret from you till now i hope you will understand why i think you will though perhaps you may not forgive me but dear michael i have done it for the best i shall be in my grave when you read this and elizabeth jane will have a home don't curse me mike think of how i was situated i can hardly write it but here it is elizabeth jane is not your elizabeth jane the child who was in my arms when you sold me no she died three months after that and this living one is my other husband's i christened her by the same name we had given to the first and she filled up the ache i felt at the other's loss michael i am dying and i might have held my tongue but i could not tell her husband of this or not as you may judge and forgive if you can a woman you once deeply wronged as she forgives you susan henchard her husband regarded the paper as if it were a window-pane through which he saw for miles his lips twitched and he seemed to compress his frame as if to bear better his usual habit was not to consider whether destiny were hard upon him or not the shape of his ideals in cases of affliction being simply a moody i am to suffer i perceive this much scourging then it is for me but now through his passionate head there stormed this thought that the blasting disclosure was what he had deserved his wife's extreme reluctance to have the girl's name altered from newson to henchard was now accounted for fully it furnished another illustration of that honesty in dishonesty which had characterized her in other things he remained unnerved and purposeless for near a couple of hours till he suddenly said ah i wonder if it is true he jumped up in an impulse kicked off his slippers and went with a candle to the door of elizabeth jane's room where he put his ear to the keyhole and listened she was breathing profoundly henchard softly turned the handle entered and shading the light approached the bedside gradually bringing the light from behind a screening curtain he held it in such a manner that it fell slantwise on her face without shining on her eyes he steadfastly regarded her features they were fair his were dark but this was an unimportant preliminary 
in sleep there come to the surface buried genealogical facts ancestral curves dead men's traits which the mobility of daytime animation screens and overwhelms in the present statuesque repose of the young girl's countenance richard newson's was unmistakably reflected he could not endure the sight of her and hastened away misery taught him nothing more than defiant endurance of it his wife was dead and the first impulse for revenge died with the thought that she was beyond him he looked out at the night as at a fiend henchard like all his kind was superstitious and he could not help thinking that the concatenation of events this evening had produced was the scheme of some sinister intelligence bent on punishing him yet they had developed naturally if he had not revealed his past history to elizabeth he would not have searched the drawer for papers and so on the mockery was that he should have no sooner taught a girl to claim the shelter of his paternity than he discovered her to have no kinship with him this ironical sequence of things angered him like an impish trick from a fellow-creature like prester john's his table had been spread and infernal harpies had snatched up the food he went out of the house and moved sullenly onward down the pavement till he came to the bridge at the bottom of the high street here he turned in upon a by-path on the river bank skirting the northeastern limits of the town these precincts embodied the mournful phases of casterbridge life as the south avenues embodied its cheerful moods the whole way along here was sunless even in summer time in spring white frosts lingered here when other places were steaming with warmth while in winter it was the seed field of all the aches rheumatisms and torturing cramps of the year the casterbridge doctors must have pined away for want of sufficient nourishment but for the configuration of the landscape on the northeastern side the river slow noiseless and dark the schwarzwasser of casterbridge ran beneath a low cliff the two together forming a defence which had rendered walls and artificial earthworks on this side unnecessary here were the ruins of a franciscan priory and a mill attached to the same the water of which roared down a back hatch like the voice of desolation above the cliff and behind the river rose a pile of buildings and in the front of the pile a square mass cut into the sky it was like a pedestal lacking its statue this missing feature without which the design remained incomplete was in truth the corpse of a man for the square mass formed the base of the gallows the extensive buildings at the back being the county jail in the meadow where henchard now walked the mob were wont to gather whenever an execution took place and there to the tune of the roaring weir they stood and watched the spectacle the exaggeration which darkness imparted to the glooms of this region impressed henchard more than he had expected the lugubrious harmony of the spot with his domestic situation was too perfect for him impatient of effects scenes and adumbrations it reduced his heart-burning to melancholy and he exclaimed why the deuce did i come here he went on past the cottage in which the old local hangman had lived and died in times before that calling was monopolized all over england by a single gentleman and climbed up by a steep back lane into the town for the sufferings of that night engendered by his bitter disappointment he might well have been pitied he was like one who had half fainted and could neither recover nor complete the swoon in words he could blame his wife but not in his heart and had he obeyed the wise directions outside her letter this pain would have been spared him for long possibly for ever elizabeth jane seeming to show no ambition to quit her safe and secluded maiden courses for the speculative path of matrimony the morning came after this night of unrest and with it the necessity for a plan he was far too self-willed to recede from a position 
especially as it would involve humiliation his daughter he had asserted her to be and his daughter she should always think herself no matter what hypocrisy it involved but he was ill prepared for the first step in this new situation the moment he came into the breakfast-room elizabeth advanced with open confidence to him and took him by the arm i have thought and thought all night of it she said frankly and i see that everything must be as you say and i am going to look upon you as the father that you are and not to call you mr henchard any more it is so plain to me now indeed father it is for of course you would not have done half the things you have done for me and let me have my own way so entirely and bought me presents if i had only been your stepdaughter he mr newson whom my poor mother married by such a strange mistake henchard was glad that he had disguised matters here was very kind oh so kind she spoke with tears in her eyes but that is not the same thing as being one's real father after all now father breakfast is ready she said cheerfully henchard bent and kissed her cheek the moment and the act he had prefigured for weeks with a thrill of pleasure yet it was no less than a miserable insipidity to him now that it had come his reinstation of her mother had been chiefly for the girl's sake and the fruition of the whole scheme was such dust and ashes as this end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter twenty of all the enigmas which ever confronted a girl there can have been seldom one like that which followed henchard's announcement of himself to elizabeth as her father he had done it in an ardor and an agitation which had half carried the point of affection with her yet behold from the next morning onwards his manner was constrained as she had never seen it before the coldness soon broke out into open chiding one grievous failing of elizabeth's was her occasional pretty and picturesque use of dialect words those terrible marks of the beast to the truly genteel it was dinner-time they never met except at meals and she happened to say when he was rising from table wishing to show him something if you'll bide where you be a minute father i'll get it bide where you be he echoed sharply good god are you only fit to carry wash to a pig trough that ye use such words as those she reddened with shame and sadness i meant stay where you are father she said in a low humble voice i ought to have been more careful he made no reply and went out of the room the sharp reprimand was not lost upon her and in time it came to pass that for fay she said succeed that she no longer spoke of dumbledores but of humble bees no longer said of young men and women that they walked together but that they were engaged that she grew to talk of greggles as wild hyacinths that when she had not slept she did not quaintly tell the servants next morning that she had been hagrid but that she had suffered from indigestion these improvements however are somewhat in advance of the story henchard being uncultivated himself was the bitterest critic the fair girl could possibly have had of her own lapses really slight now for she read omnivorously a gratuitous ordeal was in store for her in the matter of her handwriting she was passing the dining-room door one evening and had occasion to go in for something it was not till she had opened the door that she knew the mayor was there in the company of the man with whom he transacted business here elizabeth jane he said looking round at her just write down what i tell you a few words of an agreement for me and this gentleman to sign i am a poor tool with a pen be jowned and so be i said the gentleman she brought forward blotting-book paper and ink and sat down now then an agreement entered into this sixteenth day of october write that first 
She started the pen in an elephantine march across the sheet. It was a splendid, round, bold hand of her own conception, a style that would have stamped a woman as Minerva's own in more recent days. But other ideas reigned then. Henchard's creed was that proper young girls wrote ladies' hand. Nay, he believed that bristling characters were as innate and inseparable a part of refined womanhood as sex itself. Hence, when, instead of scribbling, like the Princess Ida, in such a hand as when a field of corn bows all its ears before the roaring east, Elizabeth Jane produced a line of chain-shot and sandbags, he reddened in angry shame for her, and peremptorily saying, Never mind, I'll finish it, dismissed her there and then. Her considerate disposition became a pitfall to her now. She was, it must be admitted, sometimes provokingly and unnecessarily willing to saddle herself with manual labors. She would go to the kitchen, instead of ringing, not to make Phoebe come up twice. She went down on her knees, shovel in hand, when the cat overturned the coal scuttle. Moreover, she would persistently thank the parlor-maid for everything, till one day, as soon as the girl was gone from the room, Henchard broke out with, Good God, why doesn't leave off thanking that girl as if she were a goddess born? Don't I pay her a dozen pound a year to do things for ye? Elizabeth shrank so visibly at the exclamation that he became sorry a few minutes after, and said that he did not mean to be rough. These domestic exhibitions were the small protruding needle rocks which suggested rather than revealed what was underneath. But his passion had less terror for her than his coldness. The increasing frequency of the latter mood told her the sad news that he disliked her with a growing dislike. The more interesting that her appearance and manners became under the softening influences which she could now command, and in her wisdom did command, the more she seemed to estrange him. Sometimes she caught him looking at her with a lowering invidiousness that she could hardly bear. Not knowing his secret, it was cruel mockery that she should for the first time excite his animosity when she had taken his surname. But the most terrible ordeal was to come. Elizabeth had latterly been accustomed of an afternoon to present a cup of cider or ale and bread and cheese to Nance Mockridge, who worked in the yard wimbling hay-bonds. Nance accepted this offering thankfully at first, afterwards as a matter of course. On a day when Henchard was on the premises he saw his stepdaughter enter the hay-barn on this errand and as there was no clear spot on which to deposit the provisions, she at once set to work arranging two trusses of hay at the table, Mockridge, meanwhile, standing with her hands on her hips, easefully looking at the preparations on her behalf. "'Elizabeth, come here,' said Henchard, and she obeyed. "'Why do you lower yourself so confoundedly?' he said with suppressed passion. "'Haven't I told you all it fifty times, hey?' "'Makin' yourself a drudge for a common workwoman of such a character as hers? "'Why, you'll disgrace me to the dust!' Now these words were uttered loud enough to reach Nance inside the barn door, who fired up immediately at the slur upon her personal character. Coming to the door, she cried, regardless of consequences, "'Come to that, Mr. Henchard, I can let he know she've waited on worse.' "'And she must have had more charity than sense,' said Henchard. Oh, no, she hadn't, t'were not for charity, but for hire, and at a public house in this town. It is not true, cried Henchard indignantly. Just ask her, said Nance, folding her naked arms in such a manner that she could comfortably scratch her elbows. Henchard glanced at Elizabeth Jane, whose complexion, now pink and white from confinement, lost nearly all of the former color. What does this mean? he said to her. Anything or nothing? It is true, said Elizabeth Jane, but it was only, did you do it or didn't you? Where was it? At the Three Mariners, one evening for a little while when we were staying there. Nance glanced triumphantly at Henchard and sailed into the barn, for, assuming that she was to be discharged on the instant, she had resolved to make the most of her victory. 
Henchard, however, said nothing about discharging her. Unduly sensitive on such points by reason of his own past, he had the look of one completely ground down to the last indignity. Elizabeth followed him to the house like a culprit, but when she got inside she could not see him, nor did she see him again that day. Convinced of the scathing damage to his local repute and position that must have been caused by such a fact, though it had never before reached his own ears, Henchard showed a positive distaste for the presence of this girl not his own whenever he encountered her. He mostly dined with the farmers at the market-room of one of the two chief hotels, leaving her in utter solitude. Could he have seen how she made use of those silent hours, he might have found reason to reserve his judgment on her quality. She read and took notes incessantly, mastering facts with painful laboriousness, but never flinching from her self-imposed task. She began the study of Latin, incited by the Roman characteristics of the town she lived in. If I am not well informed it shall be by no fault of my own, she would say to herself through the tears that would occasionally glide down her peachy cheeks when she was fairly baffled by the portentous obscurity of many of these educational works. Thus she lived on, a dumb, deep-feeling, great-eyed creature, construed by not a single contiguous being, quenching with patient fortitude her incipient interest in Farfrae because it seemed to be one-sided, unmaidenly, and unwise. True that for reasons best known to herself she had, since Farfrae's dismissal, shifted her quarters from the back room, affording a view of the yard, which she had occupied with such zest, to a front chamber overlooking the street but as for the young man, whenever he passed the house, he seldom or never turned his head. Winter had almost come, and unsettled weather made her still more dependent upon indoor resources. But there were certain early winter days in Casterbridge, days of firmamental exhaustion which followed angry southwesterly tempests, when, if the sun shone, the air was like velvet. She seized on these days for her periodical visits to the spot where her mother lay buried, the still-used burial ground of the old Roman British city, whose curious feature was this, its continuity as a place of sepulture. Mrs. Henchard's dust, mingled with the dust of women who lay ornamented with glass hairpins and amber necklaces, and men who held in their mouths coins of Hadrian, Posthumus, and the Constantines. Half-past ten in the morning was about her hour for seeking this spot, a time when the town avenues were deserted as the avenues of Karnak. Business had long since passed down them into its daily cells, and leisure had not arrived there. So Elizabeth Jane walked and read, or looked over the edge of the book to think, and thus reached the churchyard. There, approaching her mother's grave, she saw a solitary dark figure in the middle of the gravel walk. This figure, too, was reading, but not from a book, the words which engrossed it being the inscription on Mrs. Henchard's tombstone. The personage was in mourning, like herself, was about her age and size, and might have been her wraith or double, but for the fact that it was a lady much more beautifully dressed than she. Indeed, comparatively indifferent as Elizabeth Jane was to dress, unless for some temporary whim or purpose, her eyes were arrested by the artistic perfection of the lady's appearance. Her gait, too, had a flexuousness about it which seemed to avoid angularity. It was a revelation to Elizabeth that human beings could reach this stage of external development. She had never suspected it. She felt all the freshness and grace to be stolen from herself on the instant by the neighborhood of such a stranger. And this was in face of the fact that Elizabeth could now have been writ handsome, while the young lady was simply pretty. Had she been envious, she might have hated the woman, but she did not do that. She allowed herself the pleasure of feeling fascinated. She wondered where the lady had come from. 
the stumpy and practical walk of honest homeliness which mostly prevailed there the two styles of dress thereabout the simple and the mistaken equally avouched that this figure was no casterbridge woman's even if a book in her hand resembling a guide-book had not also suggested it the stranger presently moved from the tombstone of mrs henchard and vanished behind the corner of the wall elizabeth went to the tomb herself beside it were two footprints distinct in the soil signifying that the lady had stood there a long time she returned homeward musing on what she had seen as she might have mused on a rainbow or the northern lights a rare butterfly or a cameo interesting as things had been out of doors at home it turned out to be one of her bad days henchard whose two years mayoralty was ending had been made aware that he was not to be chosen to fill a vacancy in the list of aldermen and that farfrae was likely to become one of the council this caused the unfortunate discovery that she had played the waiting-maid in the town of which he was mayor to rankle in his mind yet more poisonously he had learnt by personal inquiry at the time that it was to donald farfrae that treacherous upstart that she had thus humiliated herself and though mrs stanage seemed to attach no great importance to the incident the cheerful souls at the three mariners having exhausted its aspects long ago such was henchard's haughty spirit that the simple thrifty deed was regarded as little less than a social catastrophe by him ever since the evening of his wife's arrival with her daughter there had been something in the air which had changed his luck that dinner at the king's arms with his friends had been henchard's austerlitz he had had his successes since but his course had not been upward he was not to be numbered among the aldermen that peerage of burghers as he had expected to be and the consciousness of this soured him to-day well where have you been he said to her with off-hand laconism i've been strolling in the walks and churchyard father till i feel quite leery she clapped her hand to her mouth but too late this was just enough to incense henchard after the other crosses of the day i won't have you talk like that he thundered leery indeed one would think you worked upon a farm one day i learn from you that you lend a hand in public houses then i hear you talk like a clodhopper i'm burned if it goes on this house can't hold us too the only way of getting a single pleasant thought to go to sleep upon after this was by recalling the lady she had seen that day and hoping she might see her again meanwhile henchard was sitting up thinking over his jealous folly in forbidding farfrae to pay his addresses to this girl who did not belong to him when if he had allowed them to go on he might not have been encumbered with her at last he said to himself with satisfaction as he jumped up and went to the writing-table ah he'll think it means peace and a marriage portion not that i don't want my house to be troubled with her and no portion at all he wrote as follows sir on consideration i don't wish to interfere with your courtship of elizabeth jane if you care for her i therefore withdraw my objection excepting in this that the business be not carried on in my house yours m henchard mr farfrae the morrow being fairly fine found elizabeth jane again in the churchyard but while looking for the lady she was startled by the apparition of farfrae who passed outside the gate he glanced up for a moment from a pocket-book in which he appeared to be making figures as he went whether or not he saw her he took no notice and disappeared unduly depressed by a sense of her own superfluity she thought he probably scorned her and quite broken in spirit sat down on a bench she fell into painful thought on her position which ended with her saying quite loud oh i wish i was dead with dear mother behind the bench was a little promenade under the wall where people sometimes walked instead of on the gravel the bench seemed to be touched by something she looked round and a face was bending over her veiled 
but still distinct, the face of the young woman she had seen yesterday. Elizabeth Jane looked confounded for a moment, knowing she had been overheard, though there was pleasure in her confusion. "'Yes, I heard you,' said the lady in a vivacious voice, answering her look. "'What can have happened?' "'I don't, I can't tell you,' said Elizabeth, putting her hand to her face, to hide a quick flush that had come. There was no movement or word for a few seconds. Then the girl felt that the young lady was sitting down beside her. "'I guess how it is with you,' said the latter. "'That was your mother.' She waved her hand towards the tombstone. Elizabeth looked up at her as if inquiring of herself whether there should be confidence. The lady's manner was so desirous, so anxious, that the girl decided there should be confidence. "'It was my mother,' she said. "'My only friend.' "'But your father, Mr. Henchard, he is living.' "'Yes, he is living,' said Elizabeth Jane. "'Is he not kind to you? I've no wish to complain of him. There has been a disagreement.' A little. Perhaps you were to blame, suggested the stranger. I was, in many ways, sighed the meek Elizabeth. I swept up the coals when the servants ought to have done it, and I said I was leery, and he was angry with me. The lady seemed to warm towards her for that reply. Do you know the impression your words give me? she said ingenuously that he is a hot-tempered man, a little proud, perhaps ambitious, but not a bad man. Her anxiety not to condemn Henchard while siding with Elizabeth was curious. Oh, no, certainly not bad, agreed the honest girl, and he has not even been unkind to me till lately, since mother died. But it has been very much to bear while it has lasted. All is owing to my defects, I dare say, and my defects are owing to my history. What is your history? Elizabeth Jane looked wistfully at her questioner. She found that her questioner was looking at her, turned her eyes down, and then seemed compelled to look back again. My history is not gay or attractive, she said, and yet I can tell it if you really want to know. The lady assured her that she did want to know whereupon Elizabeth Jane told the tale of her life, as she understood it, which was in general the true one, except that the sale at the fair had no part therein. Contrary to the girl's expectation, her new friend was not shocked. This cheered her, and it was not till she thought of returning to that home in which she had been treated so roughly of late that her spirits fell. "'I don't know how to return,' she murmured. "'I think of going away.' But what can I do? Where can I go? Perhaps it will be better soon, said her friend gently. So I would not go far. Now, what do you think of this? I shall soon want somebody to live in my house, partly as housekeeper, partly as companion. Would you mind coming to me? But perhaps. Oh, yes, cried Elizabeth, with tears in her eyes. I would indeed, I would do anything to be independent for then perhaps my father might get to love me. But, ah! What? I am no accomplished person, and a companion to you must be that. Oh, not necessarily. Not? But I can't help using rural words sometimes when I don't mean to. Never mind, I shall like to know them. And, oh, I know I shan't do, she cried with a distressful laugh. I accidentally learned to write round hand instead of lady's hand. And, of course, you want someone who can write that. Well, no. What, not necessary to write lady's hand? cried the joyous Elizabeth. Not at all. But where do you live? In Casterbridge, or rather I shall be living here after twelve o'clock to-day. Elizabeth expressed her astonishment. I have been staying at Budmouth for a few days while my house was getting ready. The house I am going into is that one they call High Place Hall, the old stone one looking down the lane to the market. Two or three rooms are fit for occupation, though not all. I sleep there to-night for the first time. Now, will you think over my proposal and meet me here the first fine day next week and say if you are still in the same mind? 
elizabeth her eyes shining at this prospect of a change from an unbearable position joyfully assented and the two parted at the gate of the churchyard End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter twenty one as a maxim glibly repeated from childhood remains practically unmarked till some mature experience enforces it so did this high place hall now for the first time really show itself to elizabeth jane though her ears had heard its name on a hundred occasions her mind dwelt upon nothing else but the stranger and the house and her own chance of living there all the rest of the day in the afternoon she had occasion to pay a few bills in the town and do a little shopping when she learnt that what was a new discovery to herself had become a common topic about the streets high place hall was undergoing repair a lady was coming there to live shortly all the shop people knew it and had already discounted the chance of her being a customer elizabeth jane could however add a capping touch to information so new to her in the bulk the lady she said had arrived that day when the lamps were lighted and it was yet not so dark as to render chimneys attics and roofs invisible elizabeth almost with a lover's feeling thought she would like to look at the outside of high place hall she went up the street in that direction the hall with its grey facade and parapet was the only residence of its sort so near the centre of the town it had in the first place the characteristics of a country mansion birds nests in its chimneys damp nooks where fungi grew and irregularities of surface direct from nature's trowel at night the forms of passengers were patterned by the lamps in black shadows upon the pale walls this evening motes of straw lay around and other signs of the premises having been in that lawless condition which accompanies the entry of a new tenant the house was entirely of stone and formed an example of dignity without great size it was not altogether aristocratic still less consequential yet the old-fashioned stranger instinctively said blood built it and wealth enjoys it however vague his opinions of those accessories might be yet as regards the enjoying it the stranger would have been wrong for until this very evening when the new lady had arrived the house had been empty for a year or two while before that interval its occupancy had been irregular the reason of its unpopularity was soon made manifest some of its rooms overlooked the market-place and such a prospect from such a house was not considered desirable or seemly by its would-be occupiers elizabeth's eyes sought the upper rooms and saw lights there the lady had obviously arrived the impression that this woman of comparatively practised manner had made upon the studious girl's mind was so deep that she enjoyed standing under an opposite archway merely to think that the charming lady was inside the confronting walls and to wonder what she was doing her admiration for the architecture of that front was entirely on account of the inmate it screened though for that matter the architecture deserved admiration or at least study on its own account it was palladian and like most architecture erected since the gothic age was a compilation rather than a design but its reasonableness made it impressive it was not rich but rich enough a timely consciousness of the ultimate vanity of human architecture no less than of other human things had prevented artistic superfluity men had still quite recently been going in and out with parcels and packing-cases rendering the door and hall within like a public thoroughfare elizabeth trotted through the open door in the dusk but becoming alarmed at her own temerity she went quickly out again by another which stood open in the lofty wall of the back court to her surprise she found herself in one of the little used alleys of the town looking round at the door which had given her egress by the light of the solitary lamp fixed in the alley she saw that it was arched and old older even than the house itself 
the door was studded and the keystone of the arch was a mask originally the mask had exhibited a comic leer as could still be discerned but generations of casterbridge boys had thrown stones at the mask aiming at its open mouth and the blows thereon had chipped off the lips and jaws as if they had been eaten away by disease the appearance was so ghastly by the weekly lamp glimmer that she could not bear to look at it the first unpleasant feature of her visit the position of the queer old door and the odd presence of the leering mask suggested one thing above all others as appertaining to the mansion's past history intrigue by the alley it had been possible to come unseen from all sorts of quarters in the town the old playhouse the old bull-stake the old cockpit the pool wherein nameless infants had been used to disappear high place hall could boast of its conveniences undoubtedly she turned to come away in the nearest direction homeward which was down the alley but hearing footsteps approaching in that quarter and having no great wish to be found in such a place at such a time she quickly retreated there being no other way out she stood behind a brick pier till the intruder should have gone his ways had she watched she would have been surprised she would have seen that the pedestrian on coming up made straight for the arched doorway that as he paused with his hand upon the latch the lamplight fell upon the face of henchard but elizabeth jane clung so closely to her nook that she discerned nothing of this henchard passed in as ignorant of her presence as she was ignorant of his identity and disappeared in the darkness elizabeth came out a second time into the alley and made the best of her way home henchard's chiding by begetting in her a nervous fear of doing anything definable as unladylike had operated thus curiously in keeping them unknown to each other at a critical moment much might have resulted from recognition at the least a query on either side in one and the selfsame form what could he or she possibly be doing there henchard whatever his business at the lady's house reached his own home only a few minutes later than elizabeth jane her plan was to broach the question of leaving his roof this evening the events of the day had urged her to the course but its execution depended upon his mood and she anxiously awaited his manner towards her she found that it had changed he showed no further tendency to be angry he showed something worse absolute indifference had taken the place of irritability and his coldness was such that it encouraged her to departure even more than hot temper could have done father have you any objection to my going away she asked going away no none whatever where are you going she thought it undesirable and unnecessary to say anything at present about her destination to one who took so little interest in her he would know that soon enough i have heard of an opportunity of getting more cultivated and finished and being less idle she answered with hesitation a chance of a place in a household where i can have advantages of study and seeing refined life then make the best of it in heaven's name if you can't get cultivated where you are you don't object object i oh no not at all after a pause he said but you won't have enough money for this lively scheme without help you know if you like i should be willing to make you an allowance so that you not be bound to live upon the starvation wages refined folk are likely to pay ye. she thanked him for this offer it had better be done properly he added after a pause a small annuity is what i should like you to have so as to be independent of me and so that i may be independent of you would that please ye certainly then i'll see about it this very day he seemed relieved to get her off his hands by this arrangement and as far as they were concerned the matter was settled she now simply waited to see the lady again the day and the hour came but a drizzling rain fell 
Elizabeth Jane, having now changed her orbit from one of gay independence to laborious self-help, thought the weather good enough for such declined glory as hers, if her friend would only face it, a matter of doubt. She went to the boot-room where her patents had hung ever since her apotheosis, took them down, had their mildewed leathers blacked, and put them on as she had done in old times. Thus mounted, and with cloak and umbrella, she went off to the place of appointment, intending, if the lady were not there, to call at the house. One side of the churchyard, the side towards the weather, was sheltered by an ancient thatched mud wall, whose eaves overhung as much as one or two feet. At the back of the wall was a cornyard with its granary and barns, the place wherein she had met Farfrae many months earlier. Under the projection of the thatch she saw a figure. The young lady had come. Her presence so exceptionally substantiated the girl's utmost hopes that she almost feared her good fortune. Fancies find rooms in the strongest minds. Here, in a churchyard old as civilization, in the worst of weathers, was a strange woman of curious fascinations never seen elsewhere. There might be some devilry about her presence. However, Elizabeth went on to the church tower, on whose summit the rope of a flagstaff rattled in the wind, and thus she came to the wall. The lady had such a cheerful aspect in the drizzle that Elizabeth forgot her fancy. Well, said the lady, a little of the whiteness of her teeth appearing with the word through the black fleece that protected her face, have you decided? Yes, quite, said the other eagerly. Your father is willing? Yes. Then come along. When? Now, as soon as you like. I had a good mind to send to you to come to my house, thinking you might not venture up here in the wind. But as I like getting out of doors, I thought I would come and see first. It was my own thought. That shows we shall agree. Then can you come to-day? My house is so hollow and dismal that I want some living thing there. I think I might be able to, said the girl, reflecting. Voices were borne over to them at that instant on the wind and raindrops from the other side of the wall. There came such words as sacks, quarters, threshing, tailing, next Saturday's market, each sentence being disorganized by the gusts like a face in a cracked mirror. Both the women listened. Who are those? said the lady. One is my father. He rents that yard and barn. The lady seemed to forget the immediate business in listening to the technicalities of the corn trade. At last she said suddenly, Did you tell him where you were going to? No. Oh, how was that? I thought it safer to get away first, as he is so uncertain in his temper. Perhaps you are right. Besides, I have never told you my name. It is Miss Templeman. Are they gone on the other side? No, they have only gone up into the granary. Well, it is getting damp here. I shall expect you to-day, this evening, say, at six. Which way shall I come, ma'am? The front way, round by the gate. There is no other that I have noticed. Elizabeth Jane had been thinking of the door in the alley. Perhaps, as you have not mentioned your destination, you may as well keep silent upon it till you are clear off. Who knows but that he may alter his mind? Elizabeth Jane shook her head. On consideration I don't fear it, she said sadly. He has grown quite cold to me. Very well, six o'clock then. When they had emerged upon the open road and parted, they found enough to do in holding their bowed umbrellas to the wind. Nevertheless, the lady looked in at the cornyard gates as she passed them, and paused on one foot for a moment but nothing was visible there save the ricks and the hump-backed barn cushioned with moss and the granary rising against the church tower behind where the smacking of the rope against the flagstaff still went on now henchard had not the slightest suspicion that elizabeth jane's movement was to be so prompt hence when just before six he reached home and saw a fly at the door from the king's arms and his stepdaughter with all her little bags and boxes getting into it he was taken by surprise 
but you said i might go father she explained through the carriage window said yes but i thought you meant next month or next year odd sees it you take time by the forelock this then is how you be going to treat me for all my trouble about ye oh father how can you speak like that it is unjust of you she said with spirit well well have your own way he replied he entered the house and seeing that all her things had not yet been brought down went up to her room to look on he had never been there since she had occupied it evidences of her care of her endeavours for improvement were visible all around in the form of books sketches maps and little arrangements for tasteful effects henchard had known nothing of these efforts he gazed at them turned suddenly about and came down to the door look here he said in an altered voice he never called her by name now don't he go away from me it may be i've spoken roughly to you but i've been grieved beyond everything by you there's something that caused it by me she said with deep concern what have i done i can't tell you now but if you'll stop and go on living as my daughter i'll tell you all in time but the proposal had come ten minutes too late she was in the fly was already in imagination at the house of the lady whose manner had such charms for her father she said as considerately as she could i think it best for us that i go on now i need not stay long i shall not be far away and if you want me badly i can soon come back again he nodded ever so slightly as a receipt of her decision and no more you are not going far you say what will be your address in case i wish to write to you or am i not to know oh yes certainly it is only in the town high place hall where said henchard his face stilling she repeated the words he neither moved nor spoke and waving her hand to him in utmost friendliness she signified to the flyman to drive up the street End of chapter 21chapter 22 of the mayor of casterbridge by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary chapter 22 we go back for a moment to the preceding night to account for henchard's attitude at the hour when elizabeth jane was contemplating her stealthy reconnoitering excursion to the abode of the lady of her fancy he had been not a little amazed at receiving a letter by hand in lucetta's well-known characters the self-repression the resignation of her previous communication had vanished from her mood she wrote with some of the natural lightness which had marked her in their early acquaintance high place hall my dear mr henchard don't be surprised it is for your good and mine as i hope that i have come to live at casterbridge for how long i cannot tell that depends upon another and he is a man and a merchant and a mayor and one who has the first right to my affections seriously mon ami i am not so light-hearted as i may seem to be from this i have come here in consequence of hearing of the death of your wife whom you used to think of as dead so many years before poor woman she seems to have been a sufferer though uncomplaining and though weak in intellect not an imbecile i am glad you acted fairly by her as soon as i knew she was no more it was brought home to me very forcibly by my conscience that i ought to endeavour to disperse the shade which my etour de riz flung over my name by asking you to carry out your promise to me i hope you are of the same mind and that you will take steps to this end as however i did not know how you were situated or what had happened since our separation i decided to come and establish myself here before communicating with you you probably feel as i do about this i shall be able to see you in a day or two till then farewell yours lucetta p s i was unable to keep my appointment to meet you for a moment or two in passing through casterbridge the other day my plans were altered by a family event 
which it will surprise you to hear of. Henchard had already heard that High Place Hall was being prepared for a tenant. He said with a puzzled air to the first person he encountered, Who is coming to live at the hall? A lady of the name of Templeman, I believe, sir, said his informant. Henchard thought it over. Lucetta is related to her, I suppose, he said to himself. Yes, I must put her in her proper position, undoubtedly. It was by no means with the oppression that would once have accompanied the thought that he regarded the moral necessity now. It was indeed with interest, if not warmth. His bitter disappointment at finding Elizabeth Jane to be none of his, and himself a childless man, had left an emotional void in Henchard that he unconsciously craved to fill. In this frame of mind, though without strong feeling, he had strolled up the alley and into High Place Hall by the postern at which Elizabeth had so nearly encountered him. He had gone on thence into the court and inquired of a man whom he saw unpacking china from a crate if Miss Le Sueur was living there. Miss Le Sueur had been the name under which he had known Lucetta, or Lucette, as she had called herself at that time. The man replied in the negative, that Miss Templeman only had come. Henchard went away, concluding that Lucetta had not as yet settled in. He was in this interested stage of the inquiry when he witnessed Elizabeth Jane's departure the next day. On hearing her announce the address, there suddenly took possession of him the strange thought that Lucetta and Miss Templeman were one and the same person, for he could recall that in her season of intimacy with him the name of the rich relative whom he had deemed somewhat a mythical personage had been given as Templeman. Though he was not a fortune-hunter, the possibility that Lucetta had been sublimed into a lady by means of some munificent testament on the part of this relative lent a charm to her image which it might not otherwise have acquired. He was getting on towards the dead level of middle age, when material things increasingly possess the mind. But Henchard was not left long in suspense. Lucetta was rather addicted to scribbling, as had been shown by the torrent of letters after the fiasco in their marriage arrangements, and hardly had Elizabeth gone away when another note came to the mayor's house from High Place Hall. "'I am in residence,' she said, "'and comfortable, though getting here has been a wearisome undertaking. You probably know what I am going to tell you, or do you not?' My good Aunt Templeman, the banker's widow, whose very existence you used to doubt, much more her affluence, has lately died, and bequeathed some of her property to me. I will not enter into details except to say that I have taken her name as a means of escape from mine and its wrongs. I am now my own mistress, and have chosen to reside in Casterbridge, to be tenant of High Place Hall, that at least you may be put to no trouble if you wish to see me. My first intention was to keep you in ignorance of the changes in my life till you should meet me in the street, but I have thought better of this. You probably are aware of my arrangement with your daughter, and have doubtless laughed at the, what shall I call it, practical joke, in all affection of my getting her to live with me. But my first meeting with her was purely an accident. Do you see, Michael, partly why I have done it? Why, to give you an excuse for coming here, as if to visit her, and thus to form my acquaintance naturally. She is a dear good girl, and she thinks you have treated her with undue severity. You may have done so in your haste, but not deliberately, I am sure. As the result has been to bring her to me, I am not disposed to upbraid you. In haste, yours always, Lucetta. The excitement which these announcements produced in Henchard's gloomy soul was to him most pleasurable. He sat over his dining-table long and dreamily, and by an almost mechanical transfer, the sentiments which had run to waste since his estrangement from Elizabeth Jane and Donald Farfray gathered around Lucetta before they had grown dry. She was plainly in a very coming-on disposition for marriage. 
but what else could a poor woman be who had given her time and her heart to him so thoughtlessly at that former time as to lose her credit by it probably conscience no less than affection had brought her here on the whole he did not blame her the artful little woman he said smiling with reference to lucetta's adroit and pleasant manoeuvre with elizabeth jane to feel that he would like to see lucetta was with henchard to start for her house he put on his hat and went it was between eight and nine o'clock when he reached her door the answer brought him was that miss templeman was engaged for that evening but that she would be happy to see him the next day that's rather like giving herself airs he thought and considering what we but after all she plainly had not expected him and he took the refusal quietly nevertheless he resolved not to go next day these cursed women there's not an inch of straight grain in em he said let us follow the train of mr henchard's thought as if it were a clue-line and view the interior of high place hall on this particular evening on elizabeth jane's arrival she had been phlegmatically asked by an elderly woman to go upstairs and take off her things she replied with great earnestness that she would not think of giving that trouble and on the instant divested herself of her bonnet and cloak in the passage she was then conducted to the first floor on the landing and left to find her way further alone the room disclosed was prettily furnished as a boudoir or small drawing-room and on a sofa with two cylindrical pillows reclined a dark-haired large-eyed pretty woman of unmistakably french extraction on one side or the other she was probably some years older than elizabeth and had a sparkling light in her eye in front of the sofa was a small table with a pack of cards scattered upon it faces upward the attitude had been so full of abandonment that she bounded up like a spring on hearing the door open perceiving that it was elizabeth she lapsed into ease and came across to her with a reckless skip that innate grace only prevented from being boisterous why you are late she said taking hold of elizabeth jane's hands there were so many little things to put up and you seem dead alive and tired let me try to enliven you by some wonderful tricks i have learnt to kill time sit there and don't move she gathered up the pack of cards pulled the table in front of her and began to deal them rapidly telling elizabeth to choose some well have you chosen she asked flinging down the last card no stammered elizabeth arousing herself from a reverie i forgot i was thinking of you and me and how strange it is that i am here miss templeman looked at elizabeth jane with interest and laid down the cards ah never mind she said i'll lie here while you sit by me and we'll talk elizabeth drew up silently to the head of the sofa but with obvious pleasure it could be seen that though in years she was younger than her entertainer in manner and general vision she seemed more of the sage miss templeman deposited herself on the sofa in her former flexuous position and throwing her arm above her brow somewhat in the pose of a well-known conception of titian's talked up at elizabeth jane invertedly across her forehead and arm i must tell you something she said i wonder if you have suspected it i have only been mistress of a large house and fortune a little while oh only a little while murmured elizabeth jane her countenance slightly falling as a girl i lived about in garrison towns and elsewhere with my father till i was quite flighty and unsettled he was an officer in the army i should not have mentioned this had i not thought it best you should know the truth yes yes she looked thoughtfully round the room at the little square piano with brass inlayings at the window curtains at the lamp at the fair and dark kings and queens on the card table and finally at the inverted face of lucetta templeman whose large lustrous eyes had such an odd effect upside down elizabeth's mind ran on acquirements to an almost morbid degree you speak french and italian fluently no doubt she said 
I have not been able to get beyond a wretched bit of Latin yet. Well, for that matter, in my native isle, speaking French does not go for much. It is rather the other way. Where is your native isle? It was with rather more reluctance that Miss Templeman said, Jersey. There they speak French on one side of the street and English on the other, and a mixed tongue in the middle of the road. But it is a long time since I was there. Bath is where my people really belong to, though my ancestors in Jersey were as good as anybody in England. They were the Le Suers, an old family who have done great things in their time. I went back and lived there after my father's death, but I don't value such past matters, and am quite an English person in my feelings and tastes. Lucetta's tongue had for a moment outrun her discretion. She had arrived at Casterbridge as a bath lady, and there were obvious reasons why Jersey should drop out of her life. But Elizabeth had tempted her to make free, and a deliberately formed resolve had been broken. It could not, however, have been broken in safer company. Lucetta's words went no further, and after this day she was so much upon her guard that there appeared no chance of her identification with the young Jersey woman who had been Henchard's dear comrade at a critical time. Not the least amusing of her safeguards was her resolute avoidance of a French word if one by accident came to her tongue more readily than its English equivalent. She shirked it with the suddenness of the weak apostle at the accusation, Thy speech bewrayeth thee. Expectancy sat visibly upon Lucetta the next morning. She dressed herself for Mr. Henchard, and restlessly awaited his call before midday. As he did not come, she waited on through the afternoon. But she did not tell Elizabeth that the person expected was the girl's stepfather. They sat in adjoining windows of the same room in Lucetta's great stone mansion, netting and looking out upon the market, which formed an animated scene. Elizabeth could see the crown of her stepfather's hat among the rest beneath, and was not aware that Lucetta watched the same object with yet intenser interest. He moved about amid the throng, at this point lively as an ant hill, elsewhere more reposeful and broken up by stalls of fruit and vegetables. The farmers, as a rule, preferred the open carrefour for their transactions, despite its inconvenient jostlings and the danger from crossing vehicles, to the gloomy sheltered market-room provided for them. Here they surged on this one day of the week, forming a little world of leggings, switches, and sample-bags, men of extensive stomachs, sloping like mountain-sides, men whose heads in walking swayed as the trees in November gales, who in conversing varied their attitudes much, lowering themselves by spreading their knees and thrusting their hands into the pockets of remote inner jackets. Their faces radiated tropical warmth, for though when at home their countenances varied with the seasons, their market faces all the year round were glowing little fires. All overclothes here were worn as if they were an inconvenience, a hampering necessity. Some men were well dressed, but the majority were careless in that respect, appearing in suits which were historical records of their wearers' deeds, sun-scorchings, and daily struggles for many years past. Yet many carried ruffled checkbooks in their pockets, which regulated at the bank hard by a balance of never less than four figures. In fact, what these gibbous human shapes specially represented was ready money, money insistently ready, not ready next year like a nobleman's, often not merely ready at the bank like a professional man's, but ready in their large plump hands. It happened that to-day there rose in the midst of them all two or three tall apple-trees, standing as if they grew on the spot, till it was perceived that they were held by men from the cider districts who came here to sell them, bringing the clay of their county on their boots. Elizabeth Jane, who had often observed them, said, I wonder if the same trees come every week. What trees? said Lucetta, absorbed in watching for Henchard. Elizabeth replied vaguely, for an incident checked her. 
Behind one of the trees stood Farfrae, briskly discussing a sample bag with a farmer. Henchard had come up, accidentally encountering the young man, whose face seemed to inquire, Do we speak to each other? She saw her stepfather throw a shine into his eye which answered, No. Elizabeth Jane sighed. Are you particularly interested in anybody out there? said Lucetta. Oh, no, said her companion, a quick red shooting over her face. Luckily Farfrae's figure was immediately covered by the apple tree. Lucetta looked hard at her. Quite sure? she said. Oh, yes, said Elizabeth Jane. Again Lucetta looked out. They are all farmers, I suppose, she said. No, there's Mr. Bulge, he's a wine merchant, there's Benjamin Brownlett, a horse dealer, and Kitson, the pig breeder, and Yopper, the auctioneer, besides maltsters and millers and so on. Farfrae stood out quite distinctly now, but she did not mention him. The Saturday afternoon slipped on thus desultorily. The market changed from the sample-showing hour to the idle hour before starting homewards, when tales were told. Henchard had not called on Lucetta, though he had stood so near. He must have been too busy, she thought. He would come on Sunday or Monday. The days came, but not the visitor, though Lucetta repeated her dressing with scrupulous care. She got disheartened. It may at once be declared that Lucetta no longer bore towards Henchard all that warm allegiance which had characterized her in their first acquaintance. The then unfortunate issue of things had chilled pure love considerably. But there remained a conscientious wish to bring about her union with him, now that there was nothing to hinder it, to right her position, which in itself was a happiness to sigh for. With strong social reasons on her side why their marriage should take place, there had ceased to be any worldly reason on his why it should be postponed since she had succeeded to fortune. Tuesday was the great Candlemas fair. At breakfast she said to Elizabeth Jane, quite coolly, I imagine your father may call to see you today. I suppose he stands close by in the marketplace with the rest of the corn dealers? She shook her head. He won't come. Why? He has taken against me, she said in a husky voice. You have quarrelled more deeply than I know of. Elizabeth, wishing to shield the man she believed to be her father from any charge of unnatural dislike, said, Yes. Then where you are is of all places the one he will avoid? Elizabeth nodded sadly. Lucetta looked blank, twitched up her lovely eyebrows and lip, and burst into hysterical sobs. Here was a disaster, her ingenious scheme completely stultified. "'Oh, my dear Miss Templeman, what's the matter?' cried her companion. "'I like your company much,' said Lucetta, as soon as she could speak. "'Yes, yes, and so do I yours,' Elizabeth chimed in soothingly. "'But, but—' She could not finish the sentence, which was, naturally, that if Henchard had such a rooted dislike for the girl as now seemed to be the case— Elizabeth Jane would have to be got rid of, a disagreeable necessity. A provisional resource suggested itself. Miss Henchard, will you go on an errand for me as soon as breakfast is over? Ah, oh, that's very good of you. Will you go and order? Here she enumerated several commissions at sundry shops, which would occupy Elizabeth's time for the next hour or two, at least. And have you ever seen the museum? Elizabeth Jane had not. Then you should do so at once. You can finish the morning by going there. It is an old house in a back street, I forget where, but you'll find out. And there are crowds of interesting things, skeletons, teeth, old pots and pans, ancient boots and shoes, bird's eggs, all charmingly instructive. You'll be sure to stay till you get quite hungry. Elizabeth hastily put on her things and departed. I wonder why she wants to get rid of me today, she said sorrowfully as she went that her absence rather than her services or instruction was in request had been readily apparent to elizabeth jane simple as she seemed and difficult as it was to attribute a motive for the desire 
She had not been gone ten minutes when one of Lucetta's servants was sent to Henchard's with a note. The contents were, briefly, Dear Michael, you will be standing in view of my house to-day for two or three hours in the course of your business, so do please call and see me. I am sadly disappointed that you have not come before, for can I help anxiety about my own equivocal relation to you? Especially now my aunt's fortune has brought me more prominently before society? Your daughter's presence here may be the cause of your neglect, and I have therefore sent her away for the morning. Say you come on business. I shall be quite alone. Lucetta. When the messenger returned, her mistress gave directions that if a gentleman called he was to be admitted at once, and sat down to await results. Sentimentally she did not much care to see him. His delays had wearied her, but it was necessary, and with a sigh she arranged herself picturesquely in the chair first this way then that next so that the light fell over her head next she flung herself on the couch in the sema recta curve which so became her and with her arm over her brow looked towards the door this she decided was the best position after all and thus she remained till a man's step was heard on the stairs whereupon lucetta forgetting her curve for nature was too strong for art as yet jumped up and ran and hid herself behind one of the window-curtains in a freak of timidity. In spite of the waning of passion, the situation was an agitating one. She had not seen Henchard since his supposed temporary parting from her in Jersey. She could hear the servant showing the visitor into the room, shutting the door upon him, and leaving as if to go and look for her mistress. Lucetta flung back the curtain with a nervous greeting. The man before her was not Henchard. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 23 a conjecture that her visitor might be some other person had indeed flashed through Lucetta's mind when she was on the point of bursting out, but it was just too late to recede. He was years younger than the mayor of Casterbridge, fair, fresh, and slenderly handsome. He wore genteel cloth leggings with white buttons, polished boots with infinite lace holes, light cord breeches under a black velveteen coat and waistcoat, and he had a silver-topped switch in his hand. Lucetta blushed, and said with a curious mixture of pout and laugh on her face, Oh, I've made a mistake. The visitor, on the contrary, did not laugh half a wrinkle. But I'm very sorry, he said, in deprecating tones. I came and I inquired for Miss Henchard, and they showed me up here, and in no case would I have caught ye so unmannerly if I had known. I was the unmannerly one, she said. But is it that I have come to the wrong house, madam? said Mr. Farfray, blinking a little in his bewilderment and nervously tapping his legging with his switch. Oh, no, sir, sit down. You must come and sit down now you are here, replied Lucetta kindly to relieve his embarrassment. Miss Henchard will be here directly. Now, this was not strictly true, but that something about the young man, that hyperborean crispness, stringency, and charm, as of a well-braced musical instrument, which had awakened the interest of Henchard, and of Elizabeth Jane, and of the Three Mariners' jovial crew, at sight, made his unexpected presence here attractive to Lucetta. He hesitated, looked at the chair, thought there was no danger in it, though there was and sat down. Farfray's sudden entry was simply the result of Henchard's permission to him to see Elizabeth if he were minded to woo her. At first he had taken no notice of Henchard's brusque letter, but an exceptionally fortunate business transaction put him on good terms with everybody, and revealed to him that he could undeniably marry if he chose. Then who so pleasing, thrifty, and satisfactory in every way as Elizabeth Jane? Apart from her personal recommendations, 
a reconciliation with his former friend henchard would in the natural course of things flow from such a union he therefore forgave the mayor his curtness and this morning on his way to the fair he had called at her house where he learnt that she was staying at miss templeman's a little stimulated at not finding her ready and waiting so fanciful are men he hastened on to high place hall to encounter no elizabeth but its mistress herself the fair to-day seems a large one she said when by natural deviation their eyes sought the busy scene without your numerous fairs and markets keep me interested how many things i think of while i watch from here he seemed in doubt how to answer and the babble without reached them as they sat voices as of wavelets on a looping sea one ever and anon rising above the rest do you look out often he asked yes very often do you look for any one you know why should she have answered as she did i look as at a picture merely but she went on turning pleasantly to him i may do so now i may look for you you are always there are you not ah i don't mean it seriously but it is amusing to look for somebody one knows in a crowd even if one does not want him it takes off the terrible oppressiveness of being surrounded by a throng and having no point of junction with it through a single individual ay maybe you'll be very lonely ma'am nobody knows how lonely but you are rich they say if so i don't know how to enjoy my riches i came to casterbridge thinking i should like to live here but i wonder if i shall where did she come from ma'am the neighbourhood of bath and i from near edinburgh he murmured it's better to stay at home and that's true but a man must live where his money is made it is a great pity but it's always so yet i've done very well this year oh yes he went on with ingenuous enthusiasm you see that man with the drab kerseymere coat i bought largely of him in the autumn when wheat was down and then afterwards when it rose a little i sold off all i had it brought only a small profit to me while the farmers kept theirs expecting higher figures yes though the rats were gnawing the ricks hollow just when i sold the markets went lower and i bought up the corn of those who had been holding back at less price than my first purchases and then cried farfrae impetuously his face alight i sold it a few weeks after when it happened to go up again and so by contenting myself with small profits frequently repeated i soon made five hundred pounds yes bringing down his hand upon the table and quite forgetting where he was while the others by keeping theirs in hand made nothing at all lucetta regarded him with a critical interest he was quite a new type of person to her at last his eye fell upon the ladies and their glances met i now i'm wearying you he exclaimed she said no indeed colouring a shade what then quite otherwise you are most interesting it was now farfrae who showed the modest pink i mean all you scotchmen she added in hasty correction so free from southern extremes we common people are all one way or the other warm or cold passionate or frigid you have both temperatures going on in you at the same time but how do you mean that you were best to explain clearly ma'am you are animated then you are thinking of getting on you are sad the next moment then you are thinking of scotland and friends yes i think of home sometimes he said simply so do i as far as i can but it was an old house where i was born and they pulled it down for improvements so i seem hardly to have any home to think of now lucetta did not add as she might have done that the house was in st helier and not in bath but the mountains and the mists and the rocks they are there and don't they seem like home she shook her head they do to me they do to me he murmured and his mind could be seen flying away northwards 
Whether its origin were national or personal, it was quite true what Lucetta had said, that the curious double strands in Farfrae's thread of life, the commercial and the romantic, were very distinct at times. Like the colors in the variegated chord, those contrasts could be seen intertwisted, yet not mingling. "'You are wishing you were back again,' she said. "'Ah, no, ma'am,' said Farfrae, suddenly recalling himself. The fair without the windows was now raging thick and loud. It was the chief hiring fair of the year, and differed quite from the market of a few days earlier. In substance it was a whitey-brown crowd flecked with white, this being the body of laborers waiting for places. The long bonnets of the women, like wagon tilts, their cotton gowns and checked shawls, mixed with the carter's smock-frocks, for they too entered into the hiring. Among the rest, at the corner of the pavement, stood an old shepherd who attracted the eyes of Lucetta and Farfrae by his stillness. He was evidently a chastened man. The battle of life had been a sharp one with him, for, to begin with, he was a man of small frame. He was now so bowed by hard work and years that approaching from behind a person could hardly see his head. He had planted the stem of his crook in the gutter and was resting upon the bow, which was polished to silver brightness by the long friction of his hands. He had quite forgotten where he was and what he had come for, his eyes being bent on the ground. A little way off negotiations were proceeding which had reference to him, but he did not hear them, and there seemed to be passing through his mind pleasant visions of the hiring successes of his prime when his skill laid open to him any farm for the asking. The negotiations were between a farmer from a distant county and the old man's son. In these there was a difficulty. The farmer would not take the crust without the crumb of the bargain, in other words, the old man without the younger. And the son had a sweetheart on his present farm who stood by waiting the issue with pale lips. I'm sorry to leave ye, Nelly, said the young man with emotion, but you see I can't starve father, and he's out of work at Lady Day. Tis only thirty-five mile. The girl's lips quivered. Thirty-five mile, she murmured. Ah, tis enough. I shall never see ye again. It was indeed a hopeless length of traction for Dan Cupid's magnet, for young men were young men at Casterbridge as elsewhere. Oh, no, no, I never shall, she insisted when he pressed her hand, and she turned her face to Lucetta's wall to hide her weeping. The farmer said he would give the young man half an hour for his answer, and went away, leaving the group sorrowing. Lucetta's eyes, full of tears, met Farfrae's. His, too, to her surprise, were moist at the scene. It is very hard, she said with strong feelings. Lovers ought not to be parted like that. Oh, if I had my wish, I'd let people live and love at their pleasure. Maybe I can manage that they'll not be parted, said Farfrae. I want a young carter, and perhaps I'll take the old man, too. Yes, he'll not be very expensive, and doubtless he will answer my purpose somehow. Oh, you are so good, she cried, delighted. Go and tell them, and let me know if you have succeeded. Farfrae went out, and she saw him speak to the group. The eyes of all brightened. The bargain was soon struck. Farfrae returned to her immediately it was concluded. It is kind-hearted of you indeed, said Lucetta. For my part I have resolved that all my servants shall have lovers if they want them. Do make the same resolve. Farfrae looked more serious, waving his head a half-turn. I must be a little stricter than that, he said. Why? You are a, a thriving woman, and I am a struggling hay and corn merchant. I am a very ambitious woman. Ah, well, I cannot explain. I don't know how to talk to ladies, ambitious or no, and that's true, said Donald with grave regret. I try to be civil to all folk, no more. I see you are as you say, replied she, sensibly getting the upper hand in these exchanges of sentiment. Under this revelation of insight, Farfrae again looked out of the window into the thick of the fair. 
two farmers met and shook hands and being quite near the window their remarks could be heard as others had been have you seen young mr farfrae this morning asked one he promised to meet me here at the stroke of twelve but i've gone athwart and about the fair half a dozen times and never a sign of him though he's mostly a man to his word i quite forgot the engagement murmured farfrae now you must go said she must you not yes he replied but he still remained you had better go she urged you will lose a customer now miss templeman you will make me angry exclaimed farfrae then suppose you don't go but stay a little longer he looked anxiously at the farmer who was seeking him and who just then ominously walked across to where henchard was standing and he looked into the room and at her i like staying but i fear i must go he said business ought not to be neglected ought it not for a single minute it's true i'll come another time if i may ma'am certainly she said what has happened to us to-day is very curious something to think over when we are alone it's like to be oh i don't know that it is commonplace after all no i'll not say that oh no well whatever it has been it is now over and the market calls you to be gone yes yes market business i wish there were no business in the world lucetta almost laughed she would quite have laughed but that there was a little emotion going on in her at the time how you change she said you should not change like this i have never wished such things before said the scotchman with a simple shamed apologetic look for his weakness it is only since coming here and seeing you if that's the case you had better not look at me any longer dear me i feel i have quite demoralized you but look or look not i will see you in my thoughts well i'll go thank you for the pleasure of this visit thank you for staying maybe i'll get into my market mind when i've been out a few minutes he murmured but i don't know i don't know as he went she said eagerly you may hear them speak of me in casterbridge as time goes on if they tell you i'm a coquette which some may because of the incidents of my life don't believe it for i am not i swear i will not he said fervidly thus the two she had enkindled the young man's enthusiasm till he was quite brimming with sentiment while he from merely affording her a new form of idleness had gone on to wake her serious solicitude why was this they could not have told lucetta as a young girl would hardly have looked at a tradesman but her ups and downs capped by her indiscretions with henchard had made her uncritical as to station in her poverty she had met with repulse from the society to which she had belonged and she had no great zest for renewing an attempt upon it now her heart longed for some ark into which it could fly and be at rest rough or smooth she did not care so long as it was warm farfrae was shown out it having entirely escaped him that he had called to see elizabeth lucetta at the window watched him threading the maze of farmers and farmers men she could see by his gait that he was conscious of her eyes and her heart went out to him for his modesty pleaded with her sense of his unfitness that he might be allowed to come again he entered the market-house and she could see him no more three minutes later when she had left the window knocks not of multitude but of strength sounded through the house and the waiting-maid tripped up the mayor she said lucetta had reclined herself and she was looking dreamily through her fingers she did not answer at once and the maid repeated the information with the addition and he's afraid he hasn't much time to spare he says oh then tell him that as i have a headache i won't detain him to-day the message was taken down and she heard the door close lucetta had come to casterbridge to quicken henchard's feelings with regard to her she had quickened them 
and now she was indifferent to the achievement. Her morning view of Elizabeth Jane as a disturbing element changed, and she no longer felt strongly the necessity of getting rid of the girl for her stepfather's sake. When the young girl came in, sweetly unconscious of the turn in the tide, Lucetta went up to her and said, quite sincerely, I'm so glad you've come. You'll live with me a long time, won't you? Elizabeth as a watchdog to keep her father off. What a new idea! Yet it was not unpleasing. Henchard had neglected her all these days, after compromising her indescribably in the past. The least he could have done when he found himself free and herself affluent would have been to respond heartily and promptly to her invitation. Her emotions rose, fell, undulated, filled her with wild surmise at their suddenness. And so passed Lucetta's experiences of that day. End of chapter 23Chapter twenty four of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter twenty four. Poor Elizabeth Jane, little thinking what her malignant star had done to blast the budding attentions she had won from Donald Farfray, was glad to hear Lucetta's words about remaining. For in addition to Lucetta's house being a home, that raking view of the market-place which it afforded had as much attraction for her as for Lucetta. The Carrefour was like the regulation open place in spectacular dramas, where the incidents that occur always happen to bear on the lives of the adjoining residents. Farmers, merchants, dairymen, quacks, hawkers, appeared there from week to week, and disappeared as the afternoon wasted away. It was the node of all orbits. From Saturday to Saturday was as from day to day with the two young women now. In an emotional sense they did not live at all during the intervals. Wherever they might go wandering on other days, on market day they were sure to be at home. Both stole sly glances out of the window at Farfray's shoulders and pole. His face they seldom saw, for either through shyness or not to disturb his mercantile mood, he avoided looking towards their quarters. Thus things went on, till a certain market morning brought a new sensation. Elizabeth and Lucetta were sitting at breakfast when a parcel containing two dresses arrived for the latter from London. She called Elizabeth from her breakfast, and entering her friend's bedroom, Elizabeth saw the gown spread out on the bed, one of a deep cherry color, the other lighter, a glove lying at the end of each sleeve, a bonnet at the top of each neck, and parasols across the gloves, Lucetta standing beside the suggested human figure in an attitude of contemplation. "'I wouldn't think so hard about it,' said Elizabeth, marking the intensity with which Lucetta was alternating the question whether this or that would suit best. "'But settling upon new clothes is so trying,' said Lucetta. "'You are that person,' pointing to one of the arrangements, "'or you are that totally different person,' pointing to the other. "'For the whole of the coming spring, and one of the two, you don't know which, may turn out to be very objectionable.' It was finally decided by Miss Templeman that she would be the cherry-coloured person at all hazards. The dress was pronounced to be a fit, and Lucetta walked with it into the front room, Elizabeth following her. The morning was exceptionally bright for the time of year. The sun fell so flat on the houses and pavement opposite Lucetta's residence that they poured their brightness into her rooms. Suddenly, after a rumbling of wheels, there were added to this steady light a fantastic series of circling irradiations upon the ceiling, and the companions turned to the window. Immediately opposite, a vehicle of strange description had come to a standstill, as if it had been placed there for exhibition. It was the new-fashioned agricultural implement called a horse-drill, till then unknown in its modern shape in this part of the country, where the venerable seed-lip was still used for sowing as in the days of the heptarchy. 
Its arrival created about as much sensation in the corn market as a flying machine would create at Charing Cross. The farmers crowded round it, women drew near it, children crept under and into it. The machine was painted in bright hues of green, yellow, and red, and it resembled as a whole a compound of hornet, grasshopper, and shrimp magnified enormously. Or it might have been likened to an upright musical instrument with the front gone. That was how it struck Lucetta. Why, it is a sort of agricultural piano, she said. It has something to do with corn, said Elizabeth. I wonder who thought of introducing it here. Donald Farfrae was in the minds of both as the innovator, for though not a farmer he was closely leagued with farming operations. And as if in response to their thought, he came up at that moment, looked at the machine, walked round it, and handled it as if he knew something about its make. The two watchers had inwardly started at his coming, and Elizabeth left the window, went to the back of the room, and stood as if absorbed in the panelling of the wall. She hardly knew that she had done this till Lucetta, animated by the conjunction of her new attire with the sight of Farfray, spoke out. Let us go and look at the instrument, whatever it is. Elizabeth Jane's bonnet and shawl were pitchforked on in a moment, and they went out. Among all the agriculturists gathered round, the only appropriate possessor of the new machine seemed to be Lucetta because she alone rivaled it in color. They examined it curiously, observing the rows of trumpet-shaped tubes one within the other, the little scoops like revolving salt spoons which tossed the seed into the upper ends of the tubes that conducted it to the ground, till somebody said, Good morning, Elizabeth Jane. She looked up, and there was her stepfather. His greeting had been somewhat dry and thunderous, and Elizabeth Jane, embarrassed out of her equanimity, stammered at random, This is the lady I live with, father, Miss Templeman. Henchard put his hand to his hat, which he brought down with a great wave till it met his body at the knee. Miss Templeman bowed. I am happy to become acquainted with you, Mr. Henchard, she said. This is a curious machine. Yes, Henchard replied, and he proceeded to explain it, and still more forcibly to ridicule it. Who brought it here? said Lucetta. Oh, don't ask me, ma'am, said Henchard. The thing, why, tis impossible it should act. "'Twas brought here by one of our machinists on the recommendation of a jumped-up jackanapes of a fellow who thinks— his eye caught Elizabeth Jane's imploring face, and he stopped, probably thinking that the suit might be progressing. He turned to go away. Then something seemed to occur which his stepdaughter fancied must really be a hallucination of hers. A murmur apparently came from Henchard's lips, in which she detected the words, You refused to see me, reproachfully addressed to Lucetta. She could not believe that they had been uttered by her stepfather, unless, indeed, they might have been spoken to one of the yellow-gaitered farmers near them. Yet Lucetta seemed silent, and then all thought of the incident was dissipated by the humming of a song, which sounded as though from the interior of the machine. Henchard had by this time vanished into the market-house, and both the women glanced towards the corn-drill. They could see behind it the bent back of a man who was pushing his head into the internal works to master their simple secrets. The hummed song went on. "'Twas on a summer afternoon, a wee before the sun went down, when Kitty wi' a bra new gown came o'er the hills to Gowry. Elizabeth Jane had apprehended the singer in a moment, and looked guilty of she did not know what. Lucetta next recognized him, and, more mistress of herself, said archly, The lass of Gowry, from inside of a seed-drill, what a phenomenon! Satisfied at last with his investigation, the young man stood upright, and met their eyes across the summit. We are looking at the wonderful new drill, Miss Templeman said. But practically it is a stupid thing, is it not? she added, on the strength of Henchard's information. "'Stupid? Oh, no,' said Farfray gravely. 
it will revolutionize sowing hereabout no more sowers flinging their seed about broadcast so that some falls by the wayside and some among thorns and all that each grain will go straight to its intended place and nowhere else whatever then the romance of the sower is gone for good observed elizabeth jane who felt herself at one with farfrae in bible reading at least he that observeth the wind shall not sow so the preacher said but his words will not be to the point any more how things change ay ay it must be so donald admitted his gaze fixing itself on a blank point far away but the machines are already very common in the east and north of england he added apologetically lucetta seemed to be outside this train of sentiment her acquaintance with the scriptures being somewhat limited is the machine yours she asked of farfrae oh no madam said he becoming embarrassed and deferential at the sound of her voice though with elizabeth jane he was quite at his ease no no i merely recommended that it should be got in the silence which followed farfrae appeared only conscious of her to have passed from perception of elizabeth into a brighter sphere of existence than she appertained to lucetta discerning that he was much mixed that day partly in his mercantile mood and partly in his romantic one said gaily to him well don't forsake the machine for us and went indoors with her companion the latter felt that she had been in the way though why was unaccountable to her lucetta explained the matter somewhat by saying when they were again in the sitting-room i had occasion to speak to mr farfrae the other day and so i knew him this morning lucetta was very kind towards elizabeth that day together they saw the market thicken and in course of time thin away with the slow decline of the sun towards the upper end of town its rays taking the street endways and enfilading the long thoroughfare from top to bottom the gigs and vans disappeared one by one till there was not a vehicle in the street the time of the riding world was over the pedestrian world held sway field laborers and their wives and children trooped in from the villages for their weekly shopping and instead of a rattle of wheels and a tramp of horses ruling the sound as earlier there was nothing but the shuffle of many feet all the implements were gone all the farmers all the moneyed class the character of the town's trading had changed from bulk to multiplicity and pence were handled now as pounds had been handled earlier in the day lucetta and elizabeth looked out upon this for though it was night and the street lamps were lighted they had kept their shutters unclosed in the faint blink of the fire they spoke more freely your father was distant with you said lucetta yes and having forgotten the momentary mystery of henchard's seeming speech to lucetta she continued it is because he does not think i am respectable i have tried to be so more than you can imagine but in vain my mother's separation from my father was unfortunate for me you don't know what it is to have shadows like that upon your life lucetta seemed to wince i do not of that kind precisely she said but you may feel a sense of disgrace shame in other ways have you ever had any such feeling said the younger innocently oh no said lucetta quickly i was thinking of what happens sometimes when women get themselves in strange positions in the eyes of the world from no fault of their own it must make them very unhappy afterwards it makes them anxious for might not other women despise them not altogether despise them yet not quite like or respect them lucetta winced again her past was by no means secure from investigation even in casterbridge for one thing henchard had never returned to her the cloud of letters she had written and sent him in her first excitement possibly they were destroyed but she could have wished that they had never been written the rencounter with farfrae and his bearings towards lucetta had made the reflective elizabeth more observant of her brilliant and amiable companion 
A few days afterwards, when her eyes met Lucetta's as the latter was going out, she somehow knew that Miss Templeman was nourishing a hope of seeing the attractive Scotchman. The fact was printed large all over Lucetta's cheeks and eyes, to anyone who could read her as Elizabeth Jane was beginning to do. Lucetta passed on and closed the street door. A seer's spirit took possession of Elizabeth, impelling her to sit down by the fire and divine events, so surely from data already her own, that they could be held as witnessed. She followed Lucetta thus, mentally, saw her encounter Donald somewhere as if by chance, saw him wear his special look when meeting women, with an added intensity because this one was Lucetta. She depicted his impassioned manner, beheld the indecision of both between their loathness to separate and their desire not to be observed, depicted their shaking of hands, how they probably parted with frigidity in their general contour and movements, only in the smaller features showing the spark of passion, thus invisible to all but themselves. This discerning, silent witch had not done thinking of these things when Lucetta came noiselessly behind her and made her start. It was all true, as she had pictured, she could have sworn it. Lucetta had a heightened luminousness in her eye over and above the advanced color of her cheeks. "'You've seen Mr. Farfrae,' said Elizabeth demurely. "'Yes,' said Lucetta. "'How did you know?' She knelt down on the hearth and took her friend's hands excitedly in her own, but after all she did not say when or how she had seen him or what he had said. That night she became restless, in the morning she was feverish, and at breakfast time she told her companion that she had something on her mind, something which concerned a person in whom she was interested much. Elizabeth was earnest to listen and sympathize. This person, a lady, once admired a man much, very much, she said tentatively. Ah, said Elizabeth Jane. They were intimate, rather. He did not think so deeply of her as she did of him. But in an impulsive moment, purely out of reparation, he proposed to make her his wife. She agreed, but there was an unexpected hitch in the proceedings though she had been so far compromised with him that she felt she could never belong to another man, as a pure matter of conscience, even if she should wish to. After that they were much apart, heard nothing of each other for a long time, and she felt her life quite closed up for her. Ah, poor girl! She suffered much on account of him, though I should add that he could not altogether be blamed for what had happened. At last, the obstacle which separated them was providentially removed, and he came to marry her. How delightful! But in the interval she, my poor friend, had seen a man she liked better than him. Now comes the point. Could she in honor dismiss the first? A new man she liked better. That's bad. Yes said Lucetta, looking pained at a boy who was swinging the town pump-handle. It is bad, though you must remember that she was forced into an equivocal position with the first man by an accident, that he was not so well educated or refined as the second, and that she had discovered some qualities in the first that rendered him less desirable as a husband than she had at first thought him to be. I cannot answer, said Elizabeth Jane thoughtfully. It is so difficult. It wants a pope to settle that. You prefer not to, perhaps. Lucetta showed in her appealing tone how much she lent on Elizabeth's judgment. Yes, Miss Templeman, admitted Elizabeth. I would rather not say. Nevertheless, Lucetta seemed relieved by the simple fact of having opened out the situation a little, and was slowly convalescent of her headache. "'Bring me a looking-glass. How do I appear to people?' she said languidly. "'Well, a little worn,' answered Elizabeth, eyeing her as a critic eyes a doubtful painting. 
Fetching the glass, she enabled Lucetta to survey herself in it, which Lucetta anxiously did. "'I wonder if I wear well, as times go,' she observed after a while. "'Yes, fairly.' "'Where am I worst? Under your eyes I notice a little brownness there.' "'Yes, that is my worst place, I know. How many years more do you think I shall last before I get hopelessly plain?' There was something curious in the way in which Elizabeth, though the younger, had come to play the part of experienced sage in these discussions. It may be five years, she said judicially, or with a quiet life as many as ten, with no love you might calculate on ten. Lucetta seemed to reflect on this as on an unalterable impartial verdict. She told Elizabeth Jane no more of the past attachment she had roughly adumbrated as the experiences of a third person, and Elizabeth, who, in spite of her philosophy, was very tender-hearted, sighed that night in bed at the thought that her pretty rich Lucetta did not treat her to the full confidence of names and dates in her confessions. For by the she of Lucetta's story, Elizabeth had not been beguiled. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter 25 the next phase of the supersession of Henchard in Lucetta's heart was an experiment in calling on her performed by Farfray with some apparent trepidation. Conventionally speaking, he conversed with both Miss Templeman and her companion, but, in fact, it was rather that Elizabeth sat invisible in the room. Donald appeared not to see her at all, and answered her wise little remarks with curtly indifferent monosyllables, his looks and faculties hanging on the woman who could boast of a more protean variety in her phases, moods, opinions, and also principles, than could Elizabeth. Lucetta had persisted in dragging her into the circle, but she had remained like an awkward third point which that circle would not touch. Susan Henchard's daughter bore up against the frosty ache of the treatment, as she had borne up under worse things, and contrived as soon as possible to get out of the inharmonious room without being missed. The Scotchman seemed hardly the same Farfray who had danced with her and walked with her in a delicate poise between love and friendship, that period in the history of a love when alone it can be said to be unalloyed with pain. She stoically looked from her bedroom window and contemplated her fate as if it were written on the top of the church tower hard by. Yes, she said at last, bringing her palm down upon the sill with a pat, he is the second man of that story she told me. All this time Henchard's smouldering sentiments towards Lucetta had been fanned into higher and higher inflammation by the circumstances of the case. He was discovering that the young woman for whom he once felt a pitying warmth which had been almost chilled out of him by reflection, was, when now qualified with a slight inaccessibility and a more matured beauty, the very being to make him satisfied with life. Day after day proved to him, by her silence, that it was no use to think of bringing her round by holding aloof, so he gave in and called upon her again, Elizabeth Jane being absent. He crossed the room to her with a heavy tread of some awkwardness, his strong, warm gaze upon her, like the sun beside the moon in comparison with Farfray's modest look, and with something of a hail-fellow bearing, as indeed was not unnatural. But she seemed so transubstantiated by her change of position, and held out her hand to him in such cool friendship, that he became deferential and sat down with a perceptible loss of power. He understood but little of fashion in dress, yet enough to feel himself inadequate in appearance beside her whom he had hitherto been dreaming of as almost his property. She said something very polite about his being good enough to call. This caused him to recover balance. He looked her oddly in the face, losing his awe. 
why of course i have called lucetta he said what does that nonsense mean you know i couldn't have helped myself if i had wished that is if i had any kindness at all i've called to say that i am ready as soon as custom will permit to give you my name in return for your devotion and what you lost by it in thinking too little of yourself and too much of me to say that you can fix the day or month with my full consent whenever in your opinion it would be seemly you know more of these things than i it is full early yet she said evasively yes yes i suppose it is but you know lucetta i felt directly my poor ill-used susan died and when i could not bear the idea of marrying again that after what had happened between us it was my duty not to let any unnecessary delay occur before putting things to rights still i wouldn't call in a hurry because well you can guess how this money you've come into made me feel his voice slowly fell he was conscious that in this room his accents and manner bore a roughness not observable in the street he looked about the room at the novel hangings and ingenious furniture with which she had surrounded herself upon my life i didn't know such furniture as this could be bought in casterbridge he said nor can it be said she nor will it till fifty years more of civilization have passed over the town it took a wagon and four horses to get it here hm it looks as if you were living on capital oh no i am not so much the better but the fact is your setting up like this makes my beaming towards you rather awkward why an answer was not really needed and he did not furnish one well he went on there's nobody in the world i would have wished to see enter into this wealth before you lucetta and nobody i am sure who will become it more he turned to her with congratulatory admiration so fervid that she shrank somewhat notwithstanding that she knew him so well i am greatly obliged to you for all that said she rather with an air of speaking ritual the stint of reciprocal feeling was perceived and henchard showed chagrin at once nobody was more quick to show that than he you may be obliged or not for it though the things i say may not have the polish of what you've lately learnt to expect for the first time in your life they are real my lady lucetta that's rather a rude way of speaking to me pouted lucetta with stormy eyes not at all replied henchard hotly but there there i don't wish to quarrel with ye i come with an honest proposal for silencing your jersey enemies and you ought to be thankful how can you speak so she answered firing quickly knowing that my only crime was the indulging in a foolish girl's passion for you with too little regard for correctness and that i was what i call innocent all the time they called me guilty you ought not to be so cutting i suffered enough at that worrying time when you wrote to tell me of your wife's return and my consequent dismissal and if i am a little independent now surely the privilege is due to me yes it is he said but it is not by what is in this life but by what appears that you are judged and i therefore think you ought to accept me for your own good name's sake what is known in your native jersey may get known here how you keep on about jersey i am english yes yes well what do you say to my proposal for the first time in their acquaintance lucetta had the move and yet she was backward for the present let things be she said with some embarrassment treat me as an acquaintance and i'll treat you as one time will she stopped and he said nothing to fill the gap for a while there being no pressure of half acquaintance to drive them into speech if they were not minded for it that's the way the wind blows is it he said at last grimly nodding an affirmative to his own thoughts a yellow flood of reflected sunlight filled the room for a few instants it was produced by the passing of a load of newly trussed hay from the country in a wagon marked with farfrae's name beside it rode farfrae himself on horseback lucetta's face became as a woman's face becomes when the man she loves rises upon her gaze like an apparition a turn of the eye by henchard a glance from the window and the secret of her inaccessibility would have been revealed 
but henchard in estimating her tone was looking down so plumb straight that he did not note the warm consciousness upon lucetta's face i shouldn't have thought it i shouldn't have thought it of women he said emphatically by and by rising and shaking himself into activity while lucetta was so anxious to divert him from any suspicion of the truth that she asked him to be in no hurry bringing him some apples she insisted upon paring one for him he would not take it no no such is not for me he said dryly and moved to the door at going out he turned his eye upon her you came to live in casterbridge entirely on my account he said yet now you are here you won't have anything to say to my offer he had hardly gone down the staircase when she dropped upon the sofa and jumped up again in a fit of desperation i will love him she cried passionately as for him he's hot-tempered and stern and it would be madness to bind myself to him knowing that i won't be a slave to the past i'll love where i choose yet having decided to break away from henchard one might have supposed her capable of aiming higher than farfrae but lucetta reasoned nothing she feared hard words from the people with whom she had been earlier associated she had no relatives left and with native lightness of heart took kindly to what fate offered elizabeth jane surveying the position of lucetta between her two lovers from the crystalline sphere of a straightforward mind did not fail to perceive that her father as she called him and donald farfrae became more desperately enamoured of her friend every day on farfrae's side it was the unforced passion of youth on henchard's the artificially stimulated coveting of maturer age the pain she experienced from the almost absolute obliviousness to her existence that was shown by the pair of them became at times half dissipated by her sense of its humorousness when lucetta had pricked her finger they were as deeply concerned as if she were dying when she herself had been seriously sick or in danger they uttered a conventional word of sympathy at the news and forgot all about it immediately but as regarded henchard this perception of hers also caused her some filial grief she could not help asking what she had done to be neglected so after the professions of solicitude he had made as regarded farfrae she thought after honest reflection that it was quite natural what was she beside lucetta as one of the meaner beauties of the night when the moon had risen in the skies she had learnt the lesson of renunciation and was as familiar with the wreck of each day's wishes as with the diurnal setting of the sun if her earthly career had taught her few book philosophies it had at least well practised her in this yet her experience had consisted less in a series of pure disappointments than in a series of substitutions continually it had happened that what she had desired had not been granted her and that what had been granted her she had not desired so she viewed with an approach to equanimity the now cancelled days when donald had been her undeclared lover and wondered what unwished-for thing heaven might send her in place of him End of chapter twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Twenty Six. It chanced that on a fine spring morning, Henchard and Farfrae met in the chestnut walk which ran along the south wall of the town. Each had just come out from his early breakfast, and there was not another soul near. Henchard was reading a letter from Lucetta, sent in answer to a note from him in which she made some excuse for not immediately granting him a second interview that he had desired donald had no wish to enter into conversation with his former friend on their present constrained terms neither would he pass him in scowling silence he nodded and henchard did the same they receded from each other several paces when a voice cried farfrae it was henchard's who stood regarding him 
do you remember said henchard as if it were the presence of the thought and not of the man which made him speak do you remember my story of that second woman who suffered for her thoughtless intimacy with me i do said farfrae do you remember my telling ye how it all began and how it ended yes well i have offered to marry her now that i can but she won't marry me now what would you think of her i put it to you well ye owe her nothing more now said farfrae heartily it is true said henchard and went on that he had looked up from a letter to ask his questions completely shut out from farfrae's mind all vision of lucetta as the culprit indeed her present position was so different from that of the young woman of henchard's story as of itself to be sufficient to blind him absolutely to her identity as for henchard he was reassured by farfrae's words and manner against a suspicion which had crossed his mind they were not those of a conscious rival yet that there was rivalry by some one he was firmly persuaded he could feel it in the air around lucetta see it in the turn of her pen there was an antagonistic force in exercise so that when he had tried to hang near her he seemed standing in a refluent current that it was not innate caprice he was more and more certain her windows gleamed as if they did not want him her curtains seemed to hang slyly as if they screened an ousting presence to discover whose presence that was whether really farfrae's after all or another's he exerted himself to the utmost to see her again and at length succeeded at the interview when she offered him tea he made it a point to launch a cautious inquiry if she knew mr farfrae oh yes she knew him she declared she could not help knowing almost everybody in casterbridge living in such a gazebo over the centre and arena of the town pleasant young fellow said henchard yes said lucetta we both know him said kind elizabeth jane to relieve her companion's divined embarrassment there was a knock at the door literally three full knocks and a little one at the end that kind of knock means half and half somebody between gentle and simple said the corn merchant to himself i shouldn't wonder therefore if it is he in a few seconds surely enough donald walked in lucetta was full of little fidgets and flutters which increased henchard's suspicions without affording any special proof of their correctness he was well-nigh ferocious at the sense of the queer situation in which he stood towards this woman one who had reproached him for deserting her when calumniated who had urged claims upon his consideration on that account who had lived waiting for him who at the first decent opportunity had come to ask him to rectify by making her his the false position into which she had placed herself for his sake such she had been and now he sat at her tea-table eager to gain her attention and in his amatory rage feeling the other man present to be a villain just as any young fool of a lover might feel they sat stiffly side by side at the darkening table like some tuscan painting of the two disciples supping at emmaus lucetta forming the third and haloed figure was opposite them elizabeth jane being out of the game and out of the group could observe all from afar like the evangelist who had to write it down that there were long spaces of taciturnity when all exterior circumstances were subdued to the touch of spoons and china the click of a heel on the pavement under the window the passing of a wheelbarrow or cart the whistling of the carter the gush of water into householders buckets at the town pump opposite the exchange of greetings among their neighbors and the rattle of the yokes by which they carried off their evening supply more bread and butter said lucetta to henchard and farfrae equally holding out between them a plateful of long slices henchard took a slice by one end and donald by the other each feeling certain he was the man meant neither let go and the slice came in too oh i am so sorry cried lucetta with a nervous titter farfrae tried to laugh but he was too much in love to see the incident in any but a tragic light 
how ridiculous of all three of them said elizabeth to herself henchard left the house with a ton of conjecture though without a grain of proof that the counter-attraction was farfray and therefore he would not make up his mind yet to elizabeth jane it was plain as the town pump that donald and lucetta were incipient lovers more than once in spite of her care lucetta had been unable to restrain her glance from flitting across into farfray's eyes like a bird to its nest but henchard was constructed upon too large a scale to discern such minutiae as these by an evening light which to him were as the notes of an insect that lie above the compass of the human ear but he was disturbed and the sense of occult rivalry in suitorship was so much superadded to the palpable rivalry of their business lives to the coarse materiality of that rivalry it added an inflaming soul the thus vitalized antagonism took the form of action by henchard sending for jop the manager originally displaced by farfrae's arrival henchard had frequently met this man about the streets observed that his clothing spoke of neediness heard that he lived in mixen lane a back slum of the town the pis aller of casterbridge domiciliation itself almost a proof that a man had reached a stage when he would not stick at trifles jop came after dark by the gates of the store-yard and felt his way through the hay and straw to the office where henchard sat in solitude awaiting him i am again out of a foreman said the corn factor are you in a place not so much as a beggar sir how much do you ask jop named his price which was very moderate when can you come at this hour and moment sir said jop who standing hands pocketed at the street corner till the sun had faded the shoulders of his coat to scarecrow green had regularly watched henchard in the market-place measured him and learned him by virtue of the power which the still man has in his stillness of knowing the busy one better than he knows himself jop too had had a convenient experience he was the only one in casterbridge besides henchard and the close-lipped elizabeth who knew that lucetta came truly from jersey and but proximately from bath i know jersey too sir he said was living there when you used to do business that way oh yes have often seen ye there indeed very good then the thing is settled the testimonials you showed me when you first tried for it are sufficient that characters deteriorated in time of need possibly did not occur to henchard jop said thank you and stood more firmly in the consciousness that at last he officially belonged to that spot now said henchard digging his strong eyes into jop's face one thing is necessary to me as the biggest corn and hay dealer in these parts the scotchman who's taking the town trade so bold into his hands must be cut out do you hear we two can't live side by side that's clear and certain i've seen it all said jop by fair competition i mean of course henchard continued but as hard keen and unflinching as fair rather more so by such a desperate bid against him for the farmer's custom as will grind him into the ground starve him out i've capital mind ye and i can do it i'm all that way of thinking said the new foreman jop's dislike of farfrae as the man who had once usurped his place while it made him a willing tool made him at the same time commercially as unsafe a colleague as henchard could have chosen i sometimes think he added that he must have some glass that he sees next year in he has such a knack of making everything bring him fortune he's deep beyond all honest men's discerning but we must make him shallower we'll undersell him and overbuy him and so snuff him out they then entered into specific details of the process by which this would be accomplished and parted at a late hour elizabeth jane heard by accident that jop had been engaged by her stepfather she was so fully convinced that he was not the right man for the place 
that at the risk of making henchard angry she expressed her apprehension to him when they met but it was done to no purpose henchard shut up her argument with a sharp rebuff the season's weather seemed to favor their scheme the time was in the years immediately before foreign competition had revolutionized the trade in grain when still as from the earliest ages the wheat quotations from month to month depended entirely upon the home harvest a bad harvest or the prospect of one would double the price of corn in a few weeks and the promise of a good yield would lower it as rapidly prices were like the roads of the period steep in gradient reflecting in their faces the local conditions without engineering levelings or averages the farmer's income was ruled by the wheat crop within his own horizon and the wheat crop by the weather thus in person he became a sort of flesh barometer with feelers always directed to the sky and wind around him the local atmosphere was everything to him the atmospheres of other countries a matter of indifference the people too who were not farmers the rural multitude saw in the god of the weather a more important personage than they do now indeed the feeling of the peasantry in this matter was so intense as to be almost unrealizable in these equable days their impulse was well nigh to prostrate themselves in lamentation before untimely rains and tempests which came as the alastor of those households whose crime it was to be poor after midsummer they watched the weathercocks as men waiting in antechambers watch the lackey sun elated them quiet rain sobered them weeks of watery tempest stupefied them that aspect of the sky which they now regard as disagreeable they then beheld as maleficent it was june and the weather was very unfavorable casterbridge being as it was the bell-board on which all the adjacent hamlets and villages sounded their notes was decidedly dull instead of new articles in the shop windows those that had been rejected in the foregoing summer were brought out again superseded reap-hooks badly shaped rakes shop-worn leggings and time-stiffened water-tights reappeared furbished up as near to new as possible henchard backed by jop read a disastrous garnering and resolved to base his strategy against farfrae upon that reading but before acting he wished what so many have wished that he could know for certain what was at present only strong probability he was superstitious as such headstrong natures often are and he nourished in his mind an idea bearing on the matter an idea he shrank from disclosing even to jop in a lonely hamlet a few miles from the town so lonely that what are called lonely villages were teeming by comparison there lived a man of curious repute as a forecaster or weather prophet the way to his house was crooked and miry even difficult in the present unpropitious season one evening when it was raining so heavily that ivy and laurel resounded like distant musketry and an outdoor man could be excused for shrouding himself to his ears and eyes such a shrouded figure on foot might have been perceived travelling in the direction of the hazel copse which dripped over the prophet's cot the turnpike road became a lane the lane a cart track the cart track a bridle path the bridle path a footway the footway overgrown the solitary walker slipped here and there and stumbled over the natural springes formed by the brambles till at length he reached the house which with its garden was surrounded with a high dense hedge the cottage comparatively a large one had been built of mud by the occupier's own hands and thatched also by himself here he had always lived and here it was assumed he would die he existed on unseen supplies for it was an anomalous thing that while there was hardly a soul in the neighbourhood but affected to laugh at this man's assertions uttering the formula there's nothing in em with full assurance on the surface of their faces very few of them were unbelievers in their secret hearts 
Whenever they consulted him, they did it for a fancy. When they paid him, they said, just a trifle for Christmas or Candlemas, as the case might be. He would have preferred more honesty in his clients and less sham ridicule, but fundamental belief consoled him for superficial irony. As stated, he was enabled to live. People supported him with their backs turned. He was sometimes astonished that men could profess so little and believe so much at his house, when at church they professed so much and believed so little. Behind his back he was called Wido on account of his reputation. To his face, Mr. Fall. The hedge of his garden formed an arch over the entrance, and a door was inserted as in a wall. Outside the door the tall traveller stopped, bandaged his face with a handkerchief as if he were suffering from toothache, and went up the path. The window-shutters were not closed, and he could see the prophet within, preparing his supper. In answer to the knock, Fall came to the door, candle in hand. The visitor stepped back a little from the light, and said, Can I speak to ye? in significant tones. The other's invitation to come in was responded to by the country formula, This will do, thank ye, after which the householder had no alternative but to come out. He placed the candle on the corner of the dresser, took his hat from a nail, and joined the stranger in the porch, shutting the door behind him. "'I have long heard that you can do things of a sort,' began the other, repressing his individuality as much as he could. "'Maybe so, Mr. Henchard,' said the weathercaster. "'Ah, why do you call me that?' asked the visitor with a start. "'Because it's your name.' Feeling you'd come, I've waited for ye, and thinking you might be leery from your walk, I laid two supper-plates. Look ye here. He threw open the door and disclosed the supper-table, at which appeared a second chair, knife and fork, plate and mug, as he had declared. Henchard felt like Saul at his reception by Samuel. He remained in silence for a few moments, then, throwing off the disguise of frigidity which he had hitherto preserved, he said, then I have not come in vain. Now, for instance, can ye charm away warts? Without trouble. Cure the evil. That I've done with consideration if they will wear the toad-bag by night as well as by day. Forecast the weather. With labor and time. Then take this, said Henchard. Tis a crown piece. Now what is the harvest fortnight to be? When can I know? I've worked it out already, and you can know at once. The fact was that five farmers had already been there on the same errand from different parts of the country. By the sun, moon, and stars, by the clouds, the winds, the trees, and grass, the candle flame and swallows, the smell of the herbs, likewise by the cat's eyes, the ravens, the leeches, the spiders, and the dung mixen, the last fortnight in August will be rain and tempest you are not certain of course as one can be in a world where all's unsure twill be more like living in revelations this autumn than in england shall i sketch it out for ye in a scheme oh no no said henchard i don't altogether believe in forecasts come to second thoughts on such but i you don't you don't "'Tis quite understood,' said Wido, without a sound of scorn. "'You have given me a crown because you've won too many. "'But won't you join me at supper now tis waiting and all?' Henchard would gladly have joined, for the savour of the stew had floated from the cottage into the porch with such appetizing distinctness that the meat, the onions, the pepper, and the herbs could be severally recognised by his nose. But as sitting down to hob and knob there would have seemed to mark him too implicitly as the weather-caster's apostle, he declined and went his way. The next Saturday Henchard bought grain to such an enormous extent that there was quite a talk about his purchases among his neighbors, the lawyer, the wine-merchant, and the doctor, also on the next and on all available days. When his granaries were full to choking, all the weathercocks of Casterbridge creaked and set their faces in another direction, as if tired of the southwest. The weather changed. 
the sunlight which had been like tin for weeks assumed the hues of topaz the temperament of the welkin passed from the phlegmatic to the sanguine an excellent harvest was almost a certainty and as a consequence prices rushed down all these transformations lovely to the outsider to the wrong-headed corn-dealer were terrible he was reminded of what he had well known before that a man might gamble upon the square green areas of fields as readily as upon those of a card-room henchard had backed bad weather and apparently lost he had mistaken the turn of the flood for the turn of the ebb his dealings had been so extensive that settlement could not long be postponed and to settle he was obliged to sell off corn that he had bought only a few weeks before at figures higher by many shillings a quarter much of the corn he had never seen it had not even been moved from the ricks in which it lay stacked miles away thus he lost heavily in the blaze of an early august day he met farfrae in the market-place farfrae knew of his dealings though he did not guess their intended bearing on himself and commiserated him for since their exchange of words in the south walk they had been on stiffly speaking terms henchard for the moment appeared to resent the sympathy but he suddenly took a careless turn oh no no nothing serious man he cried with fierce gaiety these things always happen don't they i know it has been said that figures have touched me tight lately but is that anything rare the case is not so bad as folk make out perhaps and dammy a man must be a fool to mind the common hazards of trade but he had to enter the casterbridge bank that day for reasons which had never before sent him there and to sit a long time in the partner's room with a constrained bearing it was rumoured soon after that much real property as well as vast stores of produce which had stood in henchard's name in the town and neighbourhood was actually the possession of his bankers coming down the steps of the bank he encountered job the gloomy transactions just completed within had added fever to the original sting of farfrae's sympathy that morning which henchard fancied might be a satire disguised so that job met with anything but a bland reception the latter was in the act of taking off his hat to wipe his forehead and saying a fine hot day to an acquaintance you can wipe and wipe and say a fine hot day can ye cried henchard in a savage undertone imprisoning job between himself and the bank wall if it hadn't been for your blasted advice it might have been a fine day enough why did you let me go on hey when a word of doubt from you or anybody would have made me think twice for you can never be sure of weather till tis past my advice sir was to do what you thought best a useful fellow and the sooner you help somebody else in that way the better henchard continued his address to jop in similar terms till it ended in jop's dismissal there and then henchard turning upon his heel and leaving him you shall be sorry for this sir sorry as a man can be said jop standing pale and looking after the corn merchant as he disappeared in the crowd of market men hard by End of chapter 26